she's a sporting great, it's Gabby Logan. He's David's mate, it's Robert Webb. And their team captain, Lee Mack. And facing them tonight, he's the joker in the pack, it's Rob Brydon. He's a channel for hack, it's Krishnan Murphy. And their team captain, David Mitchell. But first, please try to convey a convincing impression of complete spontaneity in appreciation of your host, Angus Deaton. Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You? A question to which the answer is, of course I would, this is the BBC. <laughs> If you look up the definition of lie online, it says it's a type of deception in the form of an untruthful statement, which is pretty rich coming from Wikipedia. <laughs> and estimates say that everyone lies on average twice a day, so I guess there must be a fair few people out there who aren't lying at all for Gordon Brown to be able to fit in all of his. <laughs> which brings us not a moment too soon to round one, the domestically titled Home Truths, in which our panellists take it in turns to read out a statement from a card in front of them. That card may contain a familiar truth or a scurrilous lie that we've made up on their behalf and they're now reading for the first time in which case they have about two nanoseconds to come up with a convincing story so no pressure uh, commiserations then to gabby who is uh, first up thank gabby. you angus i have stolen sweets from madonna's dressing room right well i think the, the key is the context there why were you in the madonna complex uh, <laughs> moving from room to room in search of sugar <laughs> It was actually her dressing room at a concert venue. Could you be specific, or were you taken there blindfolded? <laughs> it was at a, a venue in London where she was performing. Could you be even more specific <laughs> than the city? The Brixton Academy. Right. Why were you around the backstage? Did you have a, it was the Brixton Academy? Accidentally, I <laughs> found myself in the um, v v v v VIP party that was apparently right next to Madonna's dressing room. So I was walking out and looked in and saw this dressing room and just wandered in because um, I was intrigued. What were the sweets? The sweets were, um, you know those long red licorice -y things with sugar that are quite, um, uh, quite sour actually when you, when you know, they get the back of your mouth? I find this very hard to believe that the door wasn't manned I'm by... I'm disappointed that you don't find it hard to believe that I would steal. No, I accept that straight away. <laughs> I don't, can't imagine... I mean, even if she asked for sweets, I don't think she'd ask for that sort of red licorice string. David, your verdict. You're the team captain. You have to come to a decision here. I think we're, we're moving towards lie, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. lie. Yeah. OK, lie. you're saying it's a filthy lie. lie. Yeah. Gabby, truth it or lie? It is indeed the truth. Oh. 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 It is true, Gabby did steal sweets from Madonna's dressing room. Seems only fair, Madonna helped herself to a child from Malawi. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, your home truth, if you would. Right. I once simultaneously worked as both the DJ and the newsreader on local radio, using a different accent for each job. <laughs> 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 I really hope this is true. <laughs> What, what were the two accents? When I was a DJ, I used to... I was, I was younger, so I had kind of a higher voice, and I used to kind of talk a little bit like that and say, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> the newsreader, I would talk a bit more like that. So that's um, not the accent, that's, no, that's just, just the tone. That's the tone, yeah, the pitch. Well, if, if you'd let me finish. <laughs> I had a slightly Welsh tone to, to the newsreader, because I am Welsh, and I would sort of give it more of a sort of Anthony Hopkins sort of... Uh, in other news coming in at the moment, there's been a horrific pile-up on the M4 motorway. Ambulances are on their way there right now. I would just do it more slowly, give it a slight more Welsh lilt. Did you ever have any banter between yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never did, no. What's the station again? BBC Radio Wales. Was this a time of great cutbacks at BBC Radio <laughs> Wales? Why couldn't they It's always afford... a time of great cutbacks at Radio <laughs> Wales. They couldn't afford a newsreader. Are they very expensive, Kristen? Newsreaders? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of Krishnan doing that on television as well, just getting a wig on and running over to the weather. <laughs> <laughs> the first time it happened was, was sort of accident. It was when the, the newsreader didn't come in. It was a very early show. It was the 6.30 in the morning to 7.30. And the newsreader, one time, when there was snow, didn't come. And they said, will you read the news? And I did it for a laugh. Did it in a different voice after the jingle, which is not what they, they were saying. And then just kind of stuck with it. Did you read the sport? Uh, no, there was a sports guy called David Cartwright. Interesting they didn't give him the news job. 
We've already established, Gabby, that you are little better than a thief. <laughs> so, <laughs> for you to sit there taking the moral high ground when I stepped in to save a colleague who'd got stuck and couldn't make it in, frankly, is a bit rich. And I expect more support from a team captain than I'm getting at the moment. <laughs> Nothing from this fellow who's sitting here reading my thoughts going, I wonder what he's thinking right now, I can't imagine. <laughs> Where are you, big fella? Because, <laughs> frankly, David, now would be a good time to join in. <laughs> It's, I know it's harder and harder to get impressions on the television, but uh, <laughs> this isn't the place. Um, I'm, totally, I'm totally behind you. I would just like to publicly say how plausible I think everything that you've said is. <laughs> it's exactly what I'd have done in your position. Um, you know. So, Lee, you're going to have to come to a decision what, of the, some sort. I, I thought that was an assured performance, and I, I wish it were true, but I don't think it's true because it's, that would be silly. Yes. <laughs> what do you think, Gabby? I think it's a lie. Robert, you're saying I think it's a lie. Okay, we think that's a lie. They're saying, saying a lie. They are saying it's a lie. In so fact, the truth, please. It's <laughs> a lie. It is a lie. Well done. <laughs> well deduced. Uh, it is a lie. Rob did not simultaneously work as the DJ and the newsreader on local radio. To be a local radio DJ, you have to have enthusiasm, poise, and the belief in your heart of hearts that Slough actually matters. <laughs> uh, next up, it's uh, Robert's turn to astonish us. My nickname at school was Mr. Custard. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, Your initial response. Why were you called Mr. Custard? <laughs> Can I just check? You two didn't go to school together, did you? No, no. it's not quite Carry that on. sick. No. But it was happened because of, because of this. Because, uh, I, firstly, uh, I was very sick once on... Uh, some custard because I was at school <laughs> on uh, some custard on some custard right. well I would <laughs> the custard made me sick but there was some custard left so I suppose yes, yes David <laughs> I was sick on some custard he was sick right. custard on custard <laughs> yes exactly right. Cu custard he mixed. sees custard he sicks custard on it that yes. was the thing that was the Mr. System. Custard that was He'll the custard I was custard. Custard. <laughs> how old were you I was nine ish oh yeah right. how long did it stick how long did it stick? Yes, the, the nickname. Oh. Well, <laughs> it was actually it was relatively you know, every easy. Every person in this room thought you meant the custard. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, for a couple of years, and then I changed school, luckily. So, uh, and then I, did, I cleverly didn't tell the new people. <laughs> I sort of feel that people say children can be very cruel. Mm. And actually, wouldn't they focus more on the whole pukey, vomity element rather than the cuss and call you yeah. Mr. Sick or, or <laughs> Mr. Puke? Mr. But if, Mr. He was, yeah. if he was you as charming so? at school as he is now, then I think they would focus on the custard. That's why I'm now coming around to believing his story. I'm both moved and delighted. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm kind of with you on that it's not quite cruel enough as a nickname. Uh, and... So, therefore, you're thinking... Uh, therefore, I'm thinking lie. I, I would go with that. I'll go, I'll go with the consensus say, and yeah. say lie. OK, team captain is saying it's a lie. So, Robert, time to confess. It's a lie. It is a lie. Well done. <laughs> and so we descend lead balloon-like into round two, the Ring of Truth, where I read out some extraordinary celebrity facts, and the panellists' mission, should they choose to accept it, is to establish the truth or otherwise of that fact. Lee's team have these words of wisdom to enjoy. Some games magnificent, some other not so, uh, not so good. And... Um, you know, omelets, eggs. You haven't got any eggs at the moment. No eggs, no omelets. <laughs> and depends of the quality of the eggs. In the supermarket, you have eggs class one, class two, class three, <laughs> and some are more expensive than others, and some give you better omelets. <laughs> so when, when the class one eggs, you know, are in waitrose and you cannot go there. I like it that, you know, he's launched fearlessly into this extended egg metaphor in a, <laughs> in a second language. And he's a football manager, not the most chatty, eloquent guys usually most of the time. And he start, he's kind of doing it, and then towards the end, he starts to, he starts to slightly smile. And it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, sometimes I even amaze myself. <laughs>
This is great. I mean, you get the sound of those slightly arse-licky sports journalists starting to chuckling along, going, oh, Jose's off on one again. Oh, I love it when he goes off on one. Oh, he's brilliant. What a character. What a boring twat. <laughs> OK, here is the related fact, then. Uh, Jose Mourinho is about to release his own range of air fresheners. <laughs> the tagline for the advert uh, is that Jose's filling your home with a sweet smell of success. And the fragrances include uh, something called Scent Off and the special one. <laughs> Scent Off? They've obviously put a lot of effort into the pun there. Yes. And the second one, they've just said special one. The third one's it. probably stinks like a Norwegian forest. Let's go for a pint. <laughs> Beckham has his own fragrance, mm -hmm. and Sven yeah. had his own pasta That's sauce. body and, fragrance, isn't uh, it, Beckham? Yeah, Alex Ferguson not... drinks toilet duck. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's possible in this game. Uh, so, Lee, any idea? Oh, you're, uh, you're the football expert on this particular panel, so what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Gabby? Yeah, I don't think it's true. I just think it's too random. I mean, air fresheners. <laughs> I... no. Okay, I'm saying it's a They're lie. saying it's not true, and it is, in fact, a lie. <laughs> right, right, well done. There's no shot on that. Yes, uh, Jose Mourinho is not about to release his own uh, range of air freshener. He was thinking about it, but uh, Roman Abramovich had just bought the world supply of air. <laughs> uh, Jose introduced a club dietitian and nutritionist at Chelsea, although Ashley Cole still likes to get stuck into a half time orange, or Cheryl Tweedy, as she's known. <laughs> And now for David's team, with a question about this somewhat surprising agony aunt, with the emphasis very much on agony. You've got no ambition and you don't want to do anything, you might as well just go and lay in a ditch. To be expecting to go from where you are now, which is on the sofa, to halfway up the ladder. No, I don't. And you can't, you've got to begin on the first rung. But I'd rather be on the, the first rung of a ladder that I want to climb than halfway up a ladder I don't. OK, which is this ladder you want to climb? I don't know. Find me up in knots now. I really ain't got a Scooby Doo what you're talking about now. <laughs> what do you want to do? I don't know. So, so what, what ladder do you want to be on? You don't know what ladder you want to be on. Exactly. Until you've tried different ladders, how do you know what ladder you want to be on? You're talking about the window cleaner. The slight flaw in that programme is the message that if you work really hard, you can end up like an insane woman with lopsided tits and a crash helmet hairdo. <laughs> Here is your related fact. Uh, Anne Whittacombe relaxes by listening to an LP of lion and tiger noises from the jungle. <laughs> is that true, David's team? Well, I mean, definitely the possibility exists. I would sort of like to say, in defence of Anne Whittacombe, that the thing that's bad about her is all of her horrible views, not the fact that she's ugly. <laughs> You know, is that the best thing we can say about this, this woman who sort of voted against gay rights and horribly wanted to get into power and make us do horrible things? Mm. This evil person. And the only thing we can find to say about her is she doesn't look great. <laughs> you know, it is a bit like insulting Hitler because you don't like his moustache length, isn't it? Right. Or his hairdo. So, yeah. or, um, or his hairdo, exactly. <laughs> which I David might. didn't want to mention the hairdo. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to help your team, but the key words you want to be looking out for those is the LP bit. I mean, <laughs> I, there's something about the idea of being on an LP and going... <laughs> she, she would have a gramophone. I think that makes... <laughs> 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 I think this is undoubtedly true. Uh, are you going to overrule your teammates? Uh, I'm or not going to. I have them? absolutely no idea. Right. And Rob seems no, I confident. Think I think it's a lie. I so... think it's a lie. You see? That's your current view. I, I, I'm going towards a lie because I think the lion and the tiger bit is the thing that's sort of... Right, if it was right. whales, whale musical... You're, OK, I... Well, wait, I, I think it's true. Think it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with what you think I, now. OK, it's a yes. It's a yes. It's a yes. Say no, say no. Say no. <laughs> I would say lie. Um, he says no, he says lie. You say... It's no, no. lie, it's true. <laughs> Which is the right answer? Yeah. 
and Whittacombe does relax uh, by listening to an LP of lion and tiger noises from the jungle. They drown out the growls her stomach makes when she hasn't eaten for ten minutes. <laughs> There's uh, nothing like hearing the sound of lion's jaws crushing the skull of a screaming wildebeest to send you nodding off. And on track five, side two, she feeds them an asylum seeker. <laughs> uh, which means at the end of this round, uh, well, neither team has the comfort of a lead, both tied together on three points. Our next round is the inadequately titled This Is My. Lee's team will each claim to have a connection with tonight's mystery guest, but only one of them will be telling the truth. It's then up to David's team to spot the saint amongst the sinners. So please welcome this week's special guest person, Viva. <laughs> So, uh, Robert, what's Viva to you? Uh, this is Viva. She is my ex-girlfriend. She dumped me when I got her for Christmas a torch. <laughs> uh, Gabby, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Viva. Yeah, um, this is Viva. Uh, she was my arch rival in rhythmic gymnastics. Uh, and finally, Lee, your relationship with Viva. This is Viva. She tried to teach me to swim when I was 30, but it didn't work. So there you are. A former partner to Robert, a rival gymnast to Gabby, or Lee's unsuccessful swimming coach. Who do you want to start with? What are, what are rhythmic gymnastics? Um, rhythmic gymnasts use ribbons, hoops, balls, clubs, ropes. So not proper gymnastics, then? Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a form of gymnastics which it has uh, its own beauty. <laughs> and and at, what, at what level did you compete? Uh, we competed at international level. And, and you're still friends with her now? Um, yeah, we, we, we know each other, yeah. When did you last see her? Oh, um, a few months ago. Where? Um, just around the corner. Where? Just... What, in the street? Where? Just in... Just in uh, Where? In London. Where? <laughs> at, a, at a gym? Where is... Oh, I've got this. Where we, in we... London? <laughs> Where in London did you see her? I saw her in a, in a restaurant in West London. Which restaurant? <laughs> She's uh, lying. Next. Uh, <laughs> Are you the same age, then? Uh, Viva's actually about a year older than me. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, if you're friends with her, you would know uh, when she's due, because... Is she pregnant? Because I didn't like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you just let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, what, so you, were, you can't swim, Lee? Well, I couldn't swim when I was 30. I mean, how old are you now? I'm 39. 39. Well, I think you can say if she's been trying to teach you to swim for nine years. No, and you she still hasn't can't. been trying to teach me to swim for nine years. She tried to teach me to swim when I was 30 and she failed. Where did you have your lessons? Uh, in my hometown, Southport. I reckon he's lived, he's lived in London for more than nine years. He wouldn't have been in Southport nine years ago. So he How do you no longer have lived in London? Because, of course, you've been on the circuit, you've been around for a long Believe time. Believe it or not, you can live up north and still be on the no, telly. No, you can't. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> We've, we've got this thing that's just come up north called the car, and it's brilliant! <laughs> Why, at age 30, yeah. what was it that made you think, I really ought to learn to swim? It's a good question, and I can answer that very simply. I, I moved to Brighton, and uh, I lived over in a flat that overlooked the sea. So, hang on, so you moved to Brighton and you travelled to Southport to have your swimming lessons? Thank what? you, sir! You're <laughs> done! You're <laughs> done! <laughs> You should be on the bill. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you're finished, can I yeah. continue the story? Yeah. Yes. I don't think there's any point. At the age of 30, I moved to Brighton and I looked at the sea and I thought, oh my God, I'm terrified of the water. I'm moving back to Southport. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you join? Why don't you join Gabby in Liar's Corner? <laughs> <laughs> Rob, when did you go out with...? with... Uh, this was uh, the... What, in 1991, in between my school and university. What kind of torch was it? You... Quite a cheap one. We, uh, we met at Gateway Supermarket, which was my after-school job. Uh, she was putting out a display of cheap uh, plastic torches. And, you thought, and I, thought, I thought it would be a funny joke uh, to give her that for Christmas, and it didn't go down as well as I'd hoped. And who dumped who? Fever jump, dumped me. It was partly to do with 
the torch. Also, it might have been something to do with the fact that I didn't go up to her uh, 18th birthday party because I hated all of her friends. <laughs> Why did you hate all her friends? They were uh, boorish and irritating. Good. What did you learn from the relationship? What did you take um, away? To try and, uh, try and form relationships with people that are based on more than just sex and drinking. It's, it's... <laughs> you say you learned that message in 1991. Well, I, I tried to. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> it's definitely Robert because of the way that Viva is reacting when Robert is speaking. She's kind of going, oh, that idiot. <laughs> So I think Robert is telling the truth. Uh, can I also say that for a pregnant woman, those boots are ill-advised. You say so? <laughs> <laughs> back support, my love. You're ah, making problems for later on. She was a gymnast, on. you see, so she's got very good core strength. Yeah. Gabby, she's, oh, she's a not teacher. a gymnast. <laughs> <laughs> she she might actually, she does, she's not pregnant, it's a buoyancy aid. <laughs> Okay, David's team, we need an answer. So, is this person an no. erstwhile girlfriend from Robert's past? Uh, Gabby's gymnastic opponent or Lee's swimming teacher? I think Robert is telling the truth because when he said that her friends were really boorish, he looked really quite nervous. Yes, about it he did, yes. yes. Okay, I think we're going to say okay. Rob's telling the saying truth. It's Robert. Viva, perhaps you'd like to reveal who you really are? I was Gabby's oh! rival. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to Viva and thank you very much indeed. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are showing all the fighting spirit of the French, caving in as they have 4-3. <laughs> And so we come now happily to our final round, more disturbing insights from our panellists who yet again have no idea what's written on the card they're about to read. Uh, beginning with... <coughs> David. I believe disaster will occur if I don't adhere to my special alarm clock system. <laughs> what is this alarm clock system? <laughs> Well, the system is uh, that I have uh, two alarm clocks, one that plugs in and one on my phone, and I set them both at the same time, because historically I used to be quite a deep sleeper and it was difficult to wake up. One will usually go off first, even though they're for the same mm. time, because the clocks are independent, and I have to turn the other one off before it goes. What uh, kind of disasters do you imagine will occur? Uh, well, I, I, I imagine I might die, basically. <laughs> I imagine I might discover I've got a terminal disease or I imagine whatever thing I'm most worried about. Are you following this? I'm totally confused. You've got two alarm clocks, yeah, one, one of them is plugged in, one of them's on your phone, mm -hmm. and the explanation for why do you do this is because I think I might get a terminal illness. Yeah, is there a big bit that yeah. I've missed out? Yes, there is. Uh, the, all the words I said in between those parts of the story. <laughs> that's, that's what you've missed out. Right. Yeah. So, Lee, do you think there's any truth in this? I think we have to rely on Robert's knowledge of David for this. I think it's true. Yeah, I you think do? It's true. Yes. I've spent many years watching David try to leave the house without unlocking and locking and unlocking and locking the door seven or eight times, and so um, I believe he would have a system for waking up. <laughs> you are team captain. Definitely okay. true. Definitely true. Okay, yeah. we'll go with true. You're saying it's true. Okay, David, reveal all. It is, in fact, true. <laughs> Yes, so David does believe that uh, if he doesn't adhere to his special alarm clock system, some kind of disaster will occur, like someone finding out he's got a special alarm clock system. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of sportsmen are superstitious too. Tim Henman, for example, had a lucky towel that he believed made him win tennis matches. He left it in a hotel room in 1993. <laughs> uh, next. <coughs> Krishnan. I check for monsters before I go to bed <laughs> because I'm afraid of the dark. How can that possibly be true? You read the news. Yeah, but there's lights on when he reads the news. <laughs> <laughs> Has this gone on a long, long time? Well, since I was very young. Does this happen every night? Every night before you go to bed, you check for monsters? It, dep it depends on whether I'm alone. 
Well, it's probably slightly embarrassing if you're not alone to check for monsters. Possibly. <laughs> oh, look, I'm a journalist. I do. I, you know, I travel. I'm, I'm on my own quite a lot. So talk us roughly through. You're in a hotel somewhere away from your wife. It's dark. That much we can pick. I'm in a hotel room. I, I'm on my own, yeah. um, as I as I generally would be in a hotel room, and um, <laughs> I would check yeah. Yeah, in the wardrobe, um, in the, in the ensuite bathroom. Right. Because you never know what's in the shower. Yeah, I think you'd be pretty sure it's a pubic hair on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> the hotels I stay at, anyway, it's a, it's a certainty. Um, Lee, what are you veering towards? Are we saying not true? I, I really don't think Unanimous? it's true. Unanimous? Lie. Yeah. Unanimous, it's a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie, Christian. Tell us the truth. It's 100% true. <laughs> it is absolutely true. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Rob. Ah. You're on. Um, I was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the 48th? I think it was John Humphreys, the uh, <laughs> guy who reads. Who, who made this part? Who was it? Uh... Wales has its own newspaper called The Western Mail. Have we asked him which year this was? Oh, yeah, which year was it? <laughs> it was clearly not in the last ten. It was about... <laughs> <laughs> Listen to you, George Clooney. Um, <laughs> I could take that coming from Robert, who has a certain earthy charm. Right, thank but you. But from a rejected chuckle brother, it's a bit rich. <laughs> so, are you team captain, what are you saying? OK, we think that's a lie. Yeah. OK, they're saying it's a lie. Is it the truth or a lie? It's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> Yep, it's true. Rob was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales and would have finished even higher if he hadn't got cramp in his dialing finger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, <clears throat> Robert. I was voted the 88th sexiest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> By who? Yeah. By, it was the readers of some women's magazine. Which Blind one? and wretched. You would know. <laughs> <laughs> it was new, new look or new, new woman. Where did David finish? I'm not so very not, sure David not, was not, on that not listed, list. unfortunately. <laughs> Generally, Robert is considered the, 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 the better looking one of your uh, outfit. But if it were me, I can I say this not in a gay way, but I <laughs> think that you are easier on the eye than him. <laughs> I think there's something very pleasing, and I, you may notice I've been looking at you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in a gay way, yeah. but in a, in a... I just think he looks lovely. Yeah. I feel a bit weird about this. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, thanks. Well, anyway, if we could drag you back yeah. to um, uh, um, the poll. I think, it's, I, I, think, I think it's true. Robert, the answer? It is true. Yay! It is true. Uh, which uh, hyperactive buzzing sound means that at the end of tonight's contest, it's uh, David's team who've lied their way to victory, having thrashed these teams 7 6. <laughs> so, cheers and applause to our winners, cheers and derision to our losers. Um, we leave you with the thought that, according to Winston Churchill, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on, which suggests that while lies may travel faster, truth has been having a lot more fun. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>
to you. She's a daytime queen. It's Trisha Goddard. He's an American dream. It's Rich Paul. And their team captain, David Mitchell. And facing them tonight, he's Trim and Chisel. It's Ben Shepard. He's Grim and Grizzled. It's Frankie Boyle. And their team captain, Lee Mack. But first, please go crazy or at least slightly demented in appreciation of your host, Angus Dieter. Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the show where lying is not just tolerated but actively encouraged. There are occasions in life when we have to lie, whether we like it or not. After all, we're never going to be able to park that close to Tesco's unless we at least fake a limp. <laughs> and there is a medical condition in which people can't help but lie. It's called being a sun journalist. <laughs> and according to psychologists, you can generally spot liars by the fact they use very few hand or arm gestures, uh, which is why you should never trust any cast member of Riverdance. <laughs> Which brings us to round one, Home Truths, in which our panellists tonight uh, take it in turns to read out a statement about themselves and the other side take it in turns to look intelligent and work out if it's true or not. As yet, the panellists don't know whether what's written on the card is a true statement or an outrageous lie. So speed of thought, or at least avoidance of wide-eyed panic, is preferable. Tricia is first into the fray, so Tricia, your confession, if you would. <clears throat> I'm currently beating Jeremy Kyle five to three at Internet Scrabble. <laughs> <laughs> right, Lee, your thoughts? How did this come about? On the internet. <laughs> <laughs> How did you meet Jeremy Kyle? Not intentionally. Did you meet him when you were out trying to round up guests for both your shows? Just <laughs> <laughs> firing tranquilizer darts into farm foods? <laughs> <laughs> He was trying to avoid doing a lie detector show. <laughs> Would either of your audiences know what a lie detector was? Surely you're just hooking chavs up to toasters. <laughs> Tell us what you really think, Frankie. <laughs> We actually, we get a lot of Scottish guests, Frankie. Oh, I've noticed. I'm expecting you to appear any day now. The minute I start shagging my sister, I will do. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did this come about, then? I have reason to believe I might have been set up. Did he groom you first? Is that what you mean? <laughs> <laughs> we share the same... Or we did in the past. Jeremy Carr's show has some ex-staff working on there. So I. So you set, well, got set up. No, right. Yeah, I think it was a joke. Ha ha. They thought very funny. I think it's unlikely that any men play internet scramble. Maybe it's someone who's seen all the pornography in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, why would you bother? I'm veering towards saying that she's not telling the truth. What do you think, Ben? I think it's a lie. I think it sounds like the plot of the most dull ever romantic comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan as two oh. rival TV presenters. Yes! <laughs> God! It must, it must be a lie, mustn't it? That's a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie, so let's have the truth, Tricia. <gasps> well, you're going to kick yourselves because... A lie. It is a lie. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yes, they are. it is a lie. Trisha is not currently <laughs> beating Jeremy Carr. 5-3 at Internet Scrabble. If she had uh, that much time on her hands, she would be a member of her own audience. <laughs> <laughs> of course, some people think of Jeremy Carr as just being a bully, but it's easy to forget that he's also a twat. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, it's uh, Ben's turn to astound us. Ben, <clears throat> if you would. I've been offered £2,000 by OK Magazine for pictures of my dog's birthday. What's your dog called again? John. 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 <laughs> my dog's named after my grandfather. As a kid, I grew up, my parents had always, always had Jack Russells, but they were, they were called Daisy and Feely, and I hated having to take them for walks, you know, walking your dogs as a teenager, and you've got to shout, Daisy, here, Daisy! And there's a nice-looking girl walking past her dog. You look like a fool. I'm not convinced. You do look a fool. You're allowed to give dogs frivolous names. People don't expect Rover. What a stupid name. You should have called it Andrew. Personally. <laughs> I've, always, I've always liked the idea of giving a dog a human, a human name. name. Incredibly sensible, a crushingly sensible name. Have you given your dog a surname? <laughs> <laughs> you invented a sort of fake national insurance number for your dog. 
Wait, listen, this birthday, what, you, it's birthdays, there are a cake, are there never, other dogs coming? Well, no, because I think, essentially, the idea being that <laughs> I, if I had a, a birthday party for the dog, then yeah. my family would be there and they would get sort of a family shoot as well. Is there to be a cake? Of course. Maybe Made out cake. of chum or something. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a huge, a... horrible, meaty cake. They'll be <laughs> made, out, made out of the hooves of horses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, David, what do you reckon? Um, do you know, it's one of those, like, it could be true or not, couldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can yeah, believe £2,000 is not a lot of money. It's a fortune to Jack Russell's. I don't think dogs are allowed legally to own money. Aren't they? No, there's a terrible fear that the Queen would leave the whole country to one of her corgis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think? I, uh, I, I don't believe him. I don't believe him, but it's so <laughs> stupid, it just could be true. I think... You see, I, no, I, I, I'm, I think it's not true. Okay, we think it's a lie. Say it's a lie, Ben, time to fess up. Well, I'm afraid... It's a lie. It is a lie. Yeah. Well deduced. I totally believed you had a dog called John. I do you didn't. not ha even have a dog called John? No, I don't. Do you have a dog? No. Really? No. Yes. No one would make up a dog name like John. Would you have a dog? I don't, no. If you had a dog, would you give it a, a, a very normal doggy name or would I you give it something I, more individual? I don't know. I haven't... Uh, I, I, I've made a decision it. early on in my life. <laughs> don't think of dog names before you have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get distracted when you're supposed to be doing your tax. I'll tell you what I could usefully yes. do instead. Yes. Think of a name for my first seven dogs. <laughs> um, yes, it is a lie. Uh, ben has not been offered uh, £2,000 by OK Magazine for pictures of his dog's birthday. Perhaps the most uh, famous celebrity dog in the world is Tinkerbell, belonging to Paris Hilton. And I'm sure if she could only speak what incredible stories of showbiz decadence Paris Hilton could tell. <laughs> uh, Frankie, your revelation. I have rated 98% on a psychopath test. <laughs> I don't think this even needs to be discussed. No, described. we don't need to <laughs> what, what is a psychopath test, just out of interest? Don't answer him, just stab him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's kind of is it, do, you have to, do you have to qualify to be a psychopath? Is it that kind of... It's the entrance exam. No, it's, it's just a thing I drifted onto on the internet. Can you recall any of the questions that were asked? I remember one about... Uh, what would I do if I saw a man drowning and in a canal? And what did you say? I just thought, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> Who would administer such a test? There's a, we there's a website of various, you know, tests you can... Testing, oh, yeah. Psychometric the, test uh, things that you can... So it was 98% meaning that 2% of you is actually... Human. Indecent. <laughs> I think to get 100% you'd have had to fill the test in in blood. <laughs> It's very it, difficult on online. Did it change? <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to get 100%. Yeah, and you failed. Which is actually, we've all been thinking for a long time that all this nastiness, Frankie, is just a defence mechanism, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you think in... I want to reach out? No, I, I'm not saying... I, I certainly... <laughs> I'd certainly back off if you did. <laughs> but, I, but I could believe that you filled in the test yeah. and got the 98%. Yeah, I... And so, you're saying... So we say true. true. OK. Yeah. Tell us, is it gospel truth or a confounded it isn't lie? Fact. True. It <laughs> is absolutely true. <laughs> yes, it's true. Frankie has rated 98% on a psychopath test, putting him just ahead of Hitler, Pol Pot and Ceausescu, and just behind Simon Cowell. <laughs> <laughs> And so to our second round, which is known as the Ring of Truth, until such time as we think of something better. Some tidbits of celebrity trivia for our panellists. All they have to do is decide whether it's nothing but the truth or nothing like the truth. Lee's team are up first with a question cunningly linked to this BBC News item. The managers are Swede, now the players are melons. Amrat's a football-mad engineer, but he's also an artist, and he does a mean portrait using the medium of melons. Amazingly, Amrat's only been carving melons since January, but he's already got a cracking portfolio of melons for all occasions. He's a hero of England, isn't he? That's why I put... I make him on, uh, on a melon. And with any bits of melon left over, just put them in the smoothie maker and blend it like Beckham. <laughs> So, the related fact uh, for Lee's team is this. Uh, David Beckham recites the alphabet backwards before every match. It is doubtful that he'd be able to do that. He can't find his mouth in that picture, can he? <laughs> David Beckham couldn't recite the alphabet forwards before every match. <laughs> if you asked him to recite the alphabet backwards, he'd turn round and recite the alphabet. <laughs> 
you say backwards? Are we talking Z Y X backwards, or are we talking? As to... <laughs> I think this is, this is. I can't believe this is. This is obviously confusion with the. Sto I know there is a true story is that uh, Posh Spice actually regurgitates Alphabetti spaghetti before she goes on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And then whatever comes out, they use for the lyrics for the song. <laughs> So your decision on this one, is it uh, truth or a lie? I think it's probably true. I, I, I don't think it's true, but you think it's true, do you? What do you think, Ben? OK, I'm going to go with a lie then, but I think it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true middle-of-the-road GMTV presenter. <laughs> I'm going to go with my team and say it's true. They're saying it's true and I can tell you it is a lie. <laughs> ah. Sadly, David Beckham does not uh, recite the alphabet backwards before every match, although he did begin to recite the alphabet forwards once, which is why we didn't see him play for a year and a half. So, uh, <laughs> to uh, David's team, who have this to ponder. And your name is? Simon Curtis. Your occupation? Administrator. And your chosen subject? Is the films of Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, in two minutes. Which Jim Carrey film is his character's love interest dragged into a car by a father saying, Fiji, we're moving to Fiji? Oh, um, pass. The Grinch lives on which mountain overlooking the town of Whoville with only his dog Max for company and how the Grinch stole Christmas? Pass. In Ace Ventura, pet detective, what's the name of the mental hospital at which Ace gets himself admitted in a search for clues for Snowflake, <laughs> the missing mascot of the Miami Dolphins? Don't know, pass. In Final Dick and Jane, to which position is Dick promoted in Globodyne, the company which is a direct parody of Enron? CEO. Vice President of Communications. For which 1996 film did Jim Carrey sign a $20 million contract, which was a record amount for a comedy actor at the time? The Cable Guy. Correct. What does Stanley Ipkiss transform into after being a matador in the scene in the Coco Bongo Club when he shot at while wearing the mask? <sighs> the film Simon Birch was adapted from the first chapter of which novel by John Irving? Pass. And I'll tell you, it's a prayer for Owen Meany. Eight passes, Simon Curtis, only one point. <laughs> Instead of going, you had eight passes in one... You should have gone, fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> You've wasted our time here! <laughs> the best bit was when he did the general knowledge round and he actually got them all right, apart from that one bloody Jim Carrey <laughs> Uh, so here is the related Jim Carrey fact for David's team. Uh, while filming Me, Myself and Irene, uh, Jim Carrey missed his dog so much he brought him a three-bedroom house near the set. <laughs> I feel sorry for the guy who, who lives next door, who scrimped and saved all his life to buy a nice house. I wonder what the na neighbours are like. Oh, it's a you Dalmatian. See... <laughs> <laughs> you see, those aren't the words of a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, you care for that person who's yeah. scrimped and saved. David, um, your answer. I think it's well, so weird it could be Well, true. it could, but the thing is, that's the trouble with these film stars. They could have done... They could, he could have done weirder things than that, but that doesn't mean it's exactly what someone would make up as well as the, exactly the yes. sort of thing he'd do. Um, I'm, willing, I'm willing to say, though, that he probably did buy a three-bedroom house. I'm saying that he oh. probably did. Um, I, well, I'm very happy to go with the, the team decision. Wrong? I won't kill you. Oh, I, no, it's I him. Have, he's the killer. I haven't him. killed anyone for years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, you're saying it is true? True. OK, and I can tell you that it is absolutely true. Yeah. Well done. Well done to you. Yes. Yes, Jim Carrey did buy his dog a three-bedroom house near the set of his film Me, Myself and Irene, uh, though the dog is now looking to sell up, so he's painting the walls a neutral colour, baking fresh bread and has stopped shitting on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, at the end of that round, a quick check on the score shows that uh, it's David's team who are stepping on the gas, cruising into a lead of 3-2. Our next round goes by the half-baked title of This Is My. Each of David's team will boast a special link to tonight's mystery guest, but only one of them will be telling the truth. Can Lee's team tell the genuine from the fraudulent? Well, there's one sure way to find out, or we could play the game. So, please welcome this week's special guest person, Gareth. <laughs> so, uh, Tricia, what's Gareth to you? Um, this is Gareth, and he came on my show to um, cure his fear of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, scotch eggs. Yeah, right. <laughs> OK. Rich, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Gareth. Uh, this is Gareth, and he... He pimped my ride and uh, turned my car into the ultimate fishing mobile. <laughs> and finally, David, what's your relationship with Gareth? Uh, this is Gareth, and he freed me from a roller coaster when the car got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please let that one be true. Please. So there you are. Uh, Trisha's phobic guest, a uh, car pimper, according to Rich, or a theme park rescuer, if we believe David. Uh, Lee's team, where do you want to start? Oh, definitely Trisha. <laughs> I've seen your show. He, the, you don't have people that come on because they're scared. You might have come on because he had sex with a scotch egg. <laughs> <laughs> scared of a scotch egg. He had a bad experience. How does with the scotch fear manifest itself? He used to sort of um, get panicky and scared when he saw a scotch egg. Surely it's really easy to avoid scotch eggs. <laughs> I mean, well... there's a tiny section of the supermarket. <laughs> that you could easily walk round. Oh, I need to get some Baileys for Christmas. Oh, an egg! <laughs> <laughs> what, if he, what if he loves pork pies? Yeah! Uh, name a supermarket where the pork pies aren't right next to the <laughs> scotch eggs. <Yeah. laughs> and what was your show called, that particular one? It was called, um, Fiancé, Your Fear of Scotch Eggs Will Ruin My Our Wedding Buffet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's insensitive. Now, that again, to, to deliberately order the pyramid of scotch eggs, <laughs> no, that your future husband's terrified of them. If I could uh, steer you towards one of the others. Oh, yes. <laughs> what about the uh, roller coaster? Which roller coaster? David, was it? Well, it was the runaway mine train. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was that a historical train by which mines were accessed had run away with itself <laughs> and that would be scary. Where was it? It was Alton Towers. Alton Towers? And so how did you get stuck? Well, the, the, the train ceased to run away. It... <laughs> <laughs> but it goes through lots of tunnels and in one of the tunnels it suddenly stopped in the dark. Right. right. And they said over the... Uh, there was a speaker and they said, uh, stay where you are, we'll be sending someone and it was... Gareth. I'm honestly struggling with the idea that you went for a day out to Alton Towers. <laughs> were, you, were you presenting a documentary for BBC Four about the horror of modern life? <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was a National Trust home, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> There's absolutely no muskets on display here. <laughs> Well, David, David's not been on a ride and got stuck, has he? No, David's never been on a ride. <laughs> I have. I was on a stag do. <laughs> That's where people like me have to do things that they wouldn't otherwise remotely want to do. <laughs> what about Rich's car, Pimper? Rich, uh, your car was turned right. into a fishing mobile. What, was, what is the car? What was it? What mate? It's not a car, actually. It's a small pickup truck. So how did it turn into a fishing mobile? Well, basically, there's just two big all-weather bucket seats in the back that you can sit on and fish without and swivel. It has a rack for uh, fishing rods and the glove box folds out and you can tie flies on the glove box. Oh, it sounds like he's doing drive-by fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. You have to get out of your truck. So he's not done much pimping, has he? All he's done is took a better pickup truck, stuck some fishing rods in and a bucket. Oh, Don't pimp my ride, it's stick a bucket in my car, is what it should be called. <laughs> Am I right in saying that the phrase pimp my ride means modify my car? Yeah. <laughs> You can either go for the Scotch Egg Fearing guest on Trisha's show, Rich's uh, personal car customizer, or David's roller coaster saviour. Well, look, right. Trisha's thing is just madness, right? <laughs> <laughs> if David had to go on a stag party, he'd insist that it all got changed and they went to Venice. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that makes me think David might be telling the truth is that. Gareth fella though has got the look in his eyes of a man who was at some point is like spinned a waltzer and tried to chat up a 14-year-old girl. The same <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think it can be Scotch Egg Boy because he wouldn't want to come on national television again to reveal he was scared of Scotch Egg. So Lee, please, a decision. I've I don't know why, but I think it's Trisha's telling the truth. No. I do, honestly. Oh, wow. What do you think, Ben? What are you going for? I think it's David. But I think it's Rich. And I think it's Trisha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so simple decision. I'm going to go for Trisha. Lee is saying it's Trisha. Gareth, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to reveal who you really are. I went on Trisha to kill my fear of Scotch eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, was, he was absolutely brilliant. 
So are you cured now, Gareth? I am, yeah. yeah. yeah and the wedding's going ahead? It is, yeah. Congratulations and thanks very much, Hi. Gareth. Thank you. Well Thanks then uh, to Gareth. So uh, Trisha's show did cure Gareth of his fear of Scotch eggs. Scotch eggs were created by a Scottish cardiologists uh, looking for the perfect high-fat snack to fit between heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, while Trisha was working hard on the Scotch egg phobia, Jeremy Kyle reintroduced a mother and daughter after 30 years, <coughs> solved a murder and interviewed Jesus. <laughs> So at the end of that round, it's, uh, well, uh, both sides are still locked together, sharing as they do three points. <laughs> and so to our final quickfire round, featuring more insights into our celebrities' strange worlds, <coughs> this time against the clock, and remember the panellists have no idea what's on the card, a familiar truth or unexpected whopper. And just to confuse the issue even more, there'll also be a few possessions thrown in, which our panellists will attempt to convince you are their own. <coughs> Well, uh, neither team is in the lead, so both need the points uh, starting now. <coughs> David. Possession. You, yes, if you'd like to look at the box beneath you. This is the lock of Steve Davis's hair, which I bought on eBay. True. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely true. You can move on now, Angus. <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> right. Why, why, why did you buy it, David? I'm a fan of snooker and I was a bit <laughs> drunk. And it's like those, wow. the confluence of those two influences. Are you a massive fan of Steve Davis, then? Uh, well, he's very good at snooker. How, how many times did he win the World Championship? Six. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. <laughs> Don't out-bluff me, neither of us know. Yeah. <laughs> he won it six times, Hendry won it seven times. Oh, now that could be true. Let me have a closer look at it. Right. Run over, then. Come on, trot along. There we are. He'll, he'll nick the piece of hair. You watch, he'll nick it. Right, if you really love Steve Davis, this would really worry you. Whey! <laughs> <laughs> Does that worry you, David? <laughs> Whey! <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. Is that worrying you? Does he look worried? He did look I slightly bet. concerned. Yeah. <laughs> Who would make a thing like this? It must be true. But yeah. he did look quite panicky when I threw that up and down. He so, did. I so, would say... I th what do you think, Ben? I think it's true. Let's go for true. I'm going to go for overrule you, if that's OK, and say it's not true, it's a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie. David, the truth, please. It is, of course, a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> yep, it's a lie. Uh, that is not a lock of <laughs> Steve Davis's hair bought uh, on eBay. An interesting fact about Steve Davis is an impossible sentence to finish. <laughs> uh, next, Frankie. <laughs> I have written and published a book of love poems. <laughs> What's it called? Strangled Puppies? <laughs> it's actually untitled. Untitled? Oh, cool. oh, yeah, right. Go on, say one then. Say a poem. I have a policy of never reciting. Come on! Poetry. It's to do with the whole thing is it's about the written word, not the spoken word. They're, you'd have to see them, but they are things that are only would designed you, would to be seen written. Would you be able to give us some of the titles of the individual poems, or would that they also...? Are, they are untitled. It's what, called sorry, untitled. untitled collections of untitled poems. <laughs> when did you publish this? What year? The it year was... was untitled as well. <laughs> <laughs> 2001. Why? Right. Why? <laughs> Why does anyone write poetry? Some of us have uh, love that we want to express. <laughs> <laughs> so, Frank, who would your uh, influences be as a poet? Lots of different female poets. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 What, would, what would the name of one of these female <laughs> poets be? <laughs> An influential one. Yeah, right. and when yeah. did she live? <laughs> <laughs> what style of poetry did you use? I used an aggressive haiku form. No! <laughs> <laughs> nice work. Now, either it's the most exceptional double bluff or it's a lie he literally didn't have the energy to go through with. All right. <laughs> uh, Frankie, tell us the truth. It's in fact... It is a lie. lie. <laughs> well done. Yes, it's a lie. Frankie has not <laughs> written or published a book of love poems. He Gosh. was going to, but when he came to writing it, he remembered he hated everything. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <clears throat> Lee. Possession. Right, if you'd like to look in your box. <laughs> this is the coconut that nearly killed me. 
Is this believable? Um, where, where were you? Under a coconut tree, what do you think? <laughs> In which country? The coconut country of... <laughs> <laughs> Coconutia. <laughs> I was actually, uh, I was actually in uh, Thailand. I was in Thailand on holiday. <laughs> I was stood underneath. <laughs> I was stood underneath the coconut tree, uh, and well, oh, yeah. the oh. coconut fell off the tree, barely missing me. And you brought it home. Yeah. I'm suspicious because you're not allowed to bring fruit and vegetables from foreign countries into. Well, you made the classic mistake, haven't you, Tricia? Because a coconut isn't a fruit or a vegetable. <laughs> it is, in fact, a seed. <laughs> <laughs> it almost hit you. It almost hit, yeah. It, like, went whoosh, past my face, why hit my shoulder, bounced off. On yeah, the floor. why did you decide to keep it? Yeah. <clears throat> because I thought it'd make a nice anecdote. Clearly, I was wrong. <laughs> At the moment of shoulder pain, yes. the moment when your shoulder has been yeah. bruised, possibly shattered by the coconut, yes. you think, I must keep that for anecdotal reasons. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be rude, but this is a coconut. It fell off a tree, hit me on the shoulder, but obviously if it had hit me on the head in the right place, I might have died. It's not as interesting a story as perhaps you think. I might actually elicit the response, if only it had. Right. <laughs> I will throw this coconut at your head now, right? And I will... No, no, hang on, I will. No, I will, I will, no, David. No, no, Stop no, that's talking, not part then. Stop of it. talking. I will throw this coconut at your head and hit you on the shoulder really hard. No, and thanks. I guarantee... Be quite yeah, an they, they, Don't see... push me, David! <laughs> Do not push me! One is insured for that to happen. <laughs> I think I don't think it's I don't think it's true, um, but I'm willing to be overruled. I'm doubtful that if if it did happen, that that would be the actual coconut. Uh, I don't believe it. I think lie. So, truth or lie? It is in fact a lie. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It is a lie, yes, this is not a coconut that uh, nearly killed Lee. Uh, every year, worldwide, some 3,000 people are killed by falling coconuts. Now, if you times that figure by 10, that's 30,000 people every year, which works out at nearly half a million people every 12 months. Spread that out over a year, that's 4.2 billion people killed by coconuts every month. <laughs> a frightening statistic. <laughs> Next. Which upsetting alarm means at the end of the show, it's David's team who have exceeded all expectations, having triumphed over Lee's team 7-5. Okay. <laughs> We leave you with a reminder that, according to George Eliot, falsehood is easy, truth so difficult. But then again, what right has a woman who pretended to be a bloke just to flog a few poxy books got to tell us what's right and what's wrong? <laughs> Good night. <laughs>
Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the show with more fibs than Pinocchio updating Jonathan Aitken's Wikipedia page. <laughs> of course, the most common place to lie is on a CV, and I should know, speaking as NBC's leading weatherman for the past 12 years. <laughs> and people have a tendency to try and appear more intelligent by claiming to have read books they haven't read, or in the case of Jordan, to have written books they haven't read. <laughs> and so, after much thought, consideration and a power planning meeting, it was decided we should start with round one, Home Truths. Our panellists take it in turn to uh, read the card in front of them. This may contain a true fact or a load of nonsense that we've just made up on their behalf. Uh, the other side then sift through the evidence, deduce the real truth and generally try and look like they know what they're doing. Uh, Maureen is the first to stick her head above the parapet, so uh, Maureen, if you would. OK. Surprise us all. Yes, I once worked as part of a circus double act which was called Franco and Tutti. Uh, professionally? Yep. You got paid for it. I did. So, what was the double act called again? Franco and Tutti. And you were? Franco. Can you describe the act? Yeah, I was the ringmaster and she pretended to be all numbers of animals. All numbers of all animals? All numbers? Well, what, like what? Well, she pretended to be an elephant, she pretended to be a prancing horse. Right. right Lee, this line, we're not trying to book the act, we're just trying <laughs> to... <laughs> How old were you? Um, I was 14, she was 12. It was child labour. It was... <laughs> but when I said professional, we did it on stage somewhere up north in the pantomime. Whereabouts we up north? In Hull. You so said that as I'm the expert on the north. <laughs> <laughs> there is a place called Hull. This sounds like it might be true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We won this thing to go on the panto. You won a competition to go to Hull? No, no. <laughs> what was the second prize? No, Death. <laughs> so you weren't paid for it? Yes, we were. You were paid How for it? Well, we were given food. <laughs> <laughs> what what were you given, like, buns when you were an elephant? <laughs> <laughs> what, was the, what was the name of the panto? The panto was just your traditional Cinderella pantomime. And how many and shows... Roy Not that traditional, cos in the well, middle of it, a ringmaster came on <laughs> and a girl dressed as an elephant and then a donkey. No, the old didn't. traditional pantomime of Cinderella. <laughs> In pantomime, Lee, yeah. they, do, they do mess around with the story a bit. They don't just... Not, yeah, they do, but not in traditional pantomime, they don't. <laughs> yes, they do. In the story of Cinderella, oh, I used to there's run... no bloke dressed as a woman. You know, in the, in the fairy tale, pantomime it, itself is already screwing around with the story. <laughs> Are you They're having me... a little bit of a circus bit. It's just a bit of fun. I saw a panto. They had a laser light show. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Richard? I think she's changed her story. She said she was being paid for it initially. It was yeah. professional. But it was a professional show. Yeah, but she might show. be telling the truth, but getting a bit confused. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's Maureen Lippmann. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think, team well, captain? I'm saying it is a lie. Maureen, gospel or garbage? It is, in fact, a lie. It is a lie. <laughs> Uh, yep, it's a lie. Maureen was not uh, part of a circus double act called Franco and Tutti. Uh, a recent report cleared circuses of being cruel to animals, but found them guilty of cruelty to audiences. <laughs> uh, many feel that there's no need to pay £20 to see people falling over each other, throwing knives and wearing ridiculous amounts of makeup when you can just visit Basildon on a Friday night. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jimmy, your turn to shock us all. All oh, right, OK. Um, oh, there you go. Um, I had an interview at MI5 to be a spy. <laughs> Uh, where's MI5, Jimmy? Where's MI5? Yeah. Well, it was, it's on the South Bank now, but that building wasn't finished at the time. So it was a meeting in Millbank. What was it? Like a planning meeting to join MI5? <laughs> like a planning? No, I wasn't going to be... <laughs> I wasn't going to build a new the headquarters. The the building wasn't finished. We're thinking of setting up a big organisation <laughs> of spies. Well, you know... Lots <laughs> of guns and handcuffs <laughs> and, and itching powder. We don't know how we're going to use that, but it's all fun. And we're building a huge, well, crazy building on the South Bank, which is actually <laughs> MI6, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say I'm worried now that you know a bit much about it and you really do seem like a spy, I think, because you're, yeah. you're posh and a tiny bit gay even though you're not. <laughs> well, hang on, David, I'll stop you there. Posh and a little bit gay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? This is like Spartacus. No, I'm posh and a little bit gay. <laughs> you're um, the least posh and a little bit gay of anyone in the world ever, Lee. Yeah. Fuck off, you puff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
right. Um, Jimmy, how, does, how do you get approached? How did you get approached for this uh, I got approached by uh, an English tutor at uh, Cambridge, and this guy, uh, McKendrick, approached me and said, would you be interested? Kendrick? In McKendrick. 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 Or M, for short. <laughs> I thought you meant it was John McCrick approach. Oh, no. <laughs> He'd be a really bad spy. <laughs> I'd say kill him when you get the chance! <laughs> Jimmy, if I'm right about you, you were, a, you were a virgin until you were about 27, as far as I remember. 26. 26. And that was the last series of this show. So Shall we not bring it up again? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the thing. This was your opportunity to pull. Jimmy, how much are we going to be paid for it? Uh, I, I don't think... Could have paid no... in, in sticky buns, Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> sticky bun for every kill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Would you have been sent abroad? Well, don't you start. I'm having enough trouble with them. <laughs> You're not even That's in this. Show. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, your, your, your attitude under interrogation is just a bit churlish, which, as a spy, it really shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> the other interrogator starts asking questions and you go, are you in this? <laughs> <laughs> is this during the Cold War? Yeah, I'm 50. <laughs> <laughs> you might be. Your hair's dyed. So... <laughs> Fashion tips from the tramp. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, girls. Um, was there a practical side to the interview? Did you have to...? <laughs> yeah, I had to fuck a girl in a speedboat. <laughs> <laughs> David Mitchell, uh, what are you thinking as team captain? I think <clears> it's <throat> not true. OK, I, well, I, I'm, I'm torn, but both of my... Teammates think it's not true. You're we'll tending with, towards. We'll go with that. That's a lie. Okay, they're saying it's a lie. Jimmy, is that the truth? It's a lie. Oh. Oh. It's can, I, can, watch, can I just say, that you've made that really hard for yourself. It says I once had an interview at MFI. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well deduced. Uh, it is a complete lie. Uh, Jimmy did not have an interview uh, at MI5 to be a spy. Uh, but these days, to be a successful spy, you need dedication, nerves of steel, and the ability to spot a radioactive teapot in a sushi restaurant. <laughs> and lastly, David Badil, your uh, intriguing information. Uh, I have snogged two of the Spice Girls. <laughs> I don't think you've snogged two girls. <laughs> <laughs> Which two, David? Which two? Scary Spice and Sporty Spice, Mel C and Mel well, B. Well, that's a very... I've put the Spice Girls in order, and no-one starts with those two. <laughs> Was it together at the same time? Or yes, it was. was it? You snogged them both the same at the same time. time. Yeah. That's yeah. Say, I don't like the word snog. What I say is, I went to bed with two of the Spice Girls. As it was, obviously, I just snogged them. But I oh, like to leave what, that Did open. little David let you down? <laughs> 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 I think it's definitely true. No further questions. <laughs> well, it was a bit strange, actually, because, to be honest, I was only really interested in Melanie B, who I'd been having... It was at the Four Seasons Hotel in Los Angeles, and I'd been having a bit of a flirtation with her. Yeah, Basically, yeah. I, I did end up with Melanie B in, in my room, and then Melanie C just kind of turned up. I don't, I don't know why at all. I presume if you want to be my lover, you've got to get with my friend. I don't know. <laughs> right? But right. she did just turn up. And then the, they, I was sort of snogging them, and <laughs> then the phone rang, and it was security. And the security said... We've had a lot of complaints about noise in your room. We're sending someone up to chuck you out. So I chucked them out of my room. What year was this? 1996. And what were you doing Hang in on, Los 96. Angeles? Were they, were they not big in 96? No, just it was early in 1996. So what are you thinking about this one, team? I think it sounds perfectly plausible. I think David Bill may well have, have got off with a Spice Girl. Mm. Richard? I think there's a lot of detail there, and I tend to say I believe that. <laughs> As opposed to I don't believe it. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, who wasn't thinking it? <laughs> I, Team captain. I think, I'm not going to lie, I think you're both wrong. David is a famous person. If he'd have snogged both Mel B and Mel C, it's not the first time he's talked about it, it would have, I would have read that somewhere. I'm going to say that he's lying and overrule you. OK. Well, and... get, get Richard to say it. <laughs> <laughs> get him to say I don't believe it. Go on. Go on, ask him. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. It would be my best thing ever. Please, 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 please. <laughs> Please say, please say. I guess I would like to give my decision by handing it over to, to Richard Wilson. What right. would you... What would you... <laughs> say you... it. <laughs>
Well, I've got a catchphrase as well, which is, I think you're a lying, scruffy bastard. OK. <laughs> David, tell us all. It's true. You have snogged two of the spice bits. Yes. It is true. Yes. In case you didn't catch it, uh, David has snogged uh, two of the Spice Girls. Just three more to go and he gets to keep the set. <laughs> Uh, this, of course, gives David a girl group hit rate of 40%. Uh, impressive, but still slightly behind Lembert Opic, who's currently on 50. <laughs> Our next round is Ring of Truth, which has been described as both simple and subtle. Uh, the people describing it as simple being correct. I dish out celebrity fact. Uh, Lee's team, guess if it's true. Nothing could be more entertaining. After this frighteningly genuine travel guide from NBC. Scotland is the place where the pipes skirl, the men wear kilts, and everybody drinks scotch whiskey and talks with a funny accent. One of their traditions is fighting. Normally friendly, they can, when riled, fight and kill with anything from swords to sidearms. And the only thing certain is, they'll never bite you to death. Scots eat almost all the time, and they prefer something sweet, ice cream or candy or pastries, anything with a high sugar content. They munch constantly. The national characteristic of Scotland is a moving jaw. Could I, could I, could I just say I take that as an insult on behalf of the Scottish nation as balderdash, and I want that man's name. <laughs> well, I think that's Why disgusting. You, this is your chance. Why don't you say... <laughs> nice one. Say it now. No! <laughs> Is there a question to go with that, or are we just agreeing? Because I agree with everything that was said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a question. So, um, that was the uh, NBC show Weekend from 1974. Uh, shortly after recording that film, the narrator actually met a Scotsman, and now he has no teeth. <laughs> Uh, OK, so here is the related fact for Lee's team. After a visit to Scotland, Paris Hilton demanded her PA only ever speak to her with a Scottish accent. Her PA resigned. Is that true, Lee's team? Can I, I don't think... I, I mean, firstly, I don't yeah. think Paris Hilton's got a PA, cos well, I think she probably just... She seems quite down-to-earth to me. She probably just... <laughs> <laughs> she probably just organises some stuff herself, doesn't she? Does it all herself, yeah. <laughs> Uh, wow. Yes, this was something that she said um, after visiting Edinburgh last year. It's a beautiful accent, isn't it? It's amazing kind of pronunciation. But, so she might have kind of... But she's well, a fucking idiot. Why would she? Why would she, yeah, would she... <laughs> <laughs> would she pick she, up And also, it wouldn't make... Because I'm guessing that the purpose of it is to... Because she probably thinks, oh, I've been to Scotland, it sounds very cultural and interesting, I want my PA to speak like But that's only fine if you're not... I mean, the kind of job she's getting, her PA is going, right, you've just had... Playhouse asking if you can get your tits out. Is <laughs> that a good accent? No, it was terrible. Was it? <laughs> um, so, Lee, what are you thinking on this one? Jimmy? I th I, you know, I think an accent is a really sexy and important thing. I think accents are, are like, lovely, and that's sort of, kind of what draws you. I think that might be true. But well, it's just so unlikely it might be true. You think it's true? Yeah. Well, once again, I would like to overrule you. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I'm going to go with the majority this time. We'll say it's true. Should have overruled. It's a lie. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's completely untrue. Paris Hilton's PA did not resign after being ordered to speak uh, with a Scottish accent. Being Paris Hilton's PA it would certainly be a demanding job, what with all the organising and holding the camcorder steady. <laughs> <laughs> Which means at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are cock a hoop, charging ahead 3 1. <laughs> Our next round goes by the Blakely Cattail title of This Is My. Uh, Lee's team will each claim to have a connection with tonight's mystery guest. Davis' team has then analysed the three claims and sought the genuine wheat from the fraudulent chaff. So let's meet uh, this week's special guest person, Della. <laughs> Uh, so, Richard, what is Della to you? Uh, this is Della, and Della and I danced on my dancer size fitness video. <laughs> OK, Lee, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Della? This is Della, uh, the estate agent who accidentally locked me in a house after a viewing. Right. And finally, Jimmy, your relationship this with... This is Della, and she is Della. my chiropodist. Right. So there you have it, a uh, dancer-sized partner to Richard, a forgetful estate agent, if we believe Lee, or a chiropodist uh, to the stars, or at least Jimmy. Um, <laughs> David team. Can I ask Richard something, Richard? The exercise video that you made, did it sell well? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
that's obviously Eliza, because you've never made a, an exercise video. And what, what was it called, this exercise video? Um, <coughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a dance. I don't believe da you made Richard one. Wilson's Learn Dancing video. That's not. <laughs> that's really not that's a snappy title, is it? Do you know what, though? If that had been made, I would be the first <laughs> one to click it. Bye bye. Thought, so catchy. But also, um, I thought it was a dancer size video. Yeah. So, so it's actually using dance to get fit, not learning the foxtrot. No, no, I didn't do foxtrot. We did um, drive, we did uh, boogie woogie. Uh, <laughs> oh, say that last one again. Boogie woogie. Uh, <laughs> And we did a, a whole range of dances. And the idea was what, to get young people interested in dance and get them exercising. Well, you're the perfect man to get yeah. young people interested in dance. <laughs> that was some time ago. Were you in the video with Della, or was it just you, Della was your teacher? No, yeah, no, Della wasn't. A, Della was one of the dancers. And you say it was some time ago that you did this video. It's so, about um, 57. Well, I don't know why we argue at this. It was called the Richard Wilson <laughs> Dance Yourself. <laughs> Obviously, no, it's no, a lie. No, it, was, it wasn't called <laughs> Dance Yourself anything. It was called the Richard Wilson Learn Dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure of the title, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's wrong with your feet, Jimmy? Uh, I pronate. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I, pro I pronate. I've got extraordinarily flat feet. Uh, so I have to wear orthotics and I get kind of weird what? bunions. Speak properly. <laughs> orthotics? Ortho I get, I've got these little builds in my shoes. So I've got these little things that I have to wear in my shoes. Otherwise, my Achilles tendons kind of give out. It's a weird kind of... I've got weird bunions, yeah. Whoa, you know all the chat-up lines, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got some weird bunions, baby. <laughs> What does she do for you? She, she makes those little things for my feet and then she kind of... I get very rough skin because I have to wear these things and then she kind of deals with that. I'm a bit confused by the fact that Della here not only makes your orthotics but also rubs your rough bits. <laughs> as in chiropodist. So, which is she? Well, she's both. She's got a uh, chiropody, uh, I guess, some sort of qualification. There's something on the wall. She was in the Yellow Pages. Right. I'm guessing she's qualified. Mm. And, and is that how you came across her, through the Yellow Pages, or did someone recommend her? I got a recommendation. From? Right. I, all right, I got a recommendation from Simon Cowell off of The X Factor. So you got a recommendation from Simon Cowell? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, we were on... Uh, uh, Simon and I were on holiday together. So you're on holiday with Simon? Not Every with day, him. We, we, we were seat. in the same hotel. We weren't, we weren't arm in arm. Where? Uh, Barbados, Sandy Lane. Well, how often do you have this done with Della? It's maybe once a year. Does it set you back a little bit? <laughs> no, it's not, not too bad. No, I'm doing very well, thanks. Oh, good. <laughs> Della, I have to say, is, is attractive, and I hate to think of her near Jimmy Carl's feet. <laughs> The estate agent possibility. Yes. Take us through being locked into um, the house. I was. It was one of these open days where you show lots of people around at the same time. Someone was showing people around, uh, and then he left as I went to the top floor. Meanwhile, right. Della comes in. There's lots of people been coming and going. The last few go. I'm still up there, looking out the at the vista, and uh, she simply goes, leaving me locked within said premises. Well, how did you get out? Well, I didn't have my mobile phone on me. The phones in the house weren't working because it had been empty for a while. I ended up going out through the uh, V-Lux thing, the window in the attic, opened it, went down onto a flat roof next door, got down and Bob's your uncle. What did you then do in order to get in touch with... Did you, you, there you are. Oh, I used a the... really bizarre technique. <laughs> I went round to a estate agent and said, what the fuck are you doing locking me in? <laughs> so you did, you didn't I didn't buy... end up getting the house. You didn't buy it? Somebody bid higher than me. So, you can either go for uh, Richard's fellow dancer sizer, uh, Lee's careless property agent, uh, or Jimmy's female foot specialist. We're Sorry. not... Um, we're not going... I don't think we're going for Richard's no. dancer size video. <laughs> I don't know. It could be. I hope it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jimmy, that w has definitely got something dodgy in his shoe there, and it, <laughs> you know, as well as his, his foot. <laughs> And Lee's story is quite... He's got, it's quite a full story. He's thought about he's it. given far too, too much, much detail. detail. So, therefore, I think it must be true. I think it's Jimmy. You, you, you're going with, I'll still go with Lee, Lee and you're going with Jimmy. So you decide. I'm going to, I think it's Jimmy. OK, you're saying it's Jimmy. Well, yeah. perhaps Della would like to reveal her own identity. Um, I dance with Richard in his... <laughs> Yes. Oh, anyway, 
Yeah, yes, Stella is indeed Richard's <laughs> video dance partner, and proof, if proof were needed. When they told me you can relieve stress, tension, keep fit, and learn to dance, I thought, I don't believe it. So, if you're in a jump at a party or at home, put on some music and dance away your cares. So, let's dance. <laughs> Congratulations, Adela, and thank you very much for joining us. And so we come to our final round, Quick Fire Lies, more truths and lies, but this time against the clock. Lee's team are currently behind, uh, so have one last chance for redemption, starting with... <coughs> David. Mitchell. <clears throat> I used to buy my gran a chocolate orange every Christmas until I found seven of them in a drawer at her house. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a chilling moment. <laughs> What were you doing rummaging through your Nana's drawers? <laughs> what were you looking for? There's no bras in here. <laughs> no bras in... Oranges. <laughs> I painted a horrible picture there, yeah. David. I can only apologise. I was fetching a packet of cigarettes for my grandfather. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why does your granddad keep his cigarettes in your grandmother's drawer? It was... It, it was... Pardon? <laughs> Sorry, did you? There's a glitch in the Matrix. There was... <laughs> it was in their bedroom. He used to keep his cigarettes in an item of furniture called a tall boy. And uh, I would go and... This was when I was sort of, uh, I don't know, 11 or 12. I would go and fetch them for him so he didn't have to go upstairs. And I found at the back of the drawer these seven chocolate oranges. Aww. They what did you do after the discovery? Confront her. Uh, Shut her. I, I don't... <laughs> uh, no, I didn't do anything. I didn't buy her any more chocolate oranges. Did you not mention it to her? No. Were you devastated? I, I felt a bit bad. Mm. Yeah. Is this sounding convincing? <laughs> I, I don't think it's true at all, because I don't think she'd keep them all lined up neatly in a drawer like some weird psycho horror film. <laughs> You've watched some very tame horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the row of confectionery! <laughs> Of date. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Richard? I say a lie. Jimmy? Oh, I think it's true. Well, I'm going for age and experience and saying that I agree with Richard and say that that is a lie. I'm saying well, it's a lie. That, it is, in fact, a lie. Yay! Yay! <laughs> nice work, Mr. Wilson. Uh, next, <laughs> Lee. I have been attacked by a snake charmer and his snake. <laughs> well, that seems unlikely, because a snake charmer doesn't need to attack you as well as his snake. If he's a snake charmer, he just goes, <laughs> and the snake attacks you. Why would he bother to attack you as well? Snake yeah, when, when, did the, when did the encounter happen? It happened in Morocco. In that was Morocco. so in, sad. In... First country with snakes in it. That yeah. comes to my head. Morocco, it Morocco. happened in Morocco, in North Africa. What kind of snake was this? Did it have a flat-headed cobra or a... Well, I don't remember the name of the snake. Not the name. I don't want to know if it's called <laughs> Betty or something. I don't, I, it's not that I don't remember it. I can picture it clearly now. Describe yeah. the snake. Right. No legs. <laughs> uh, it seemed to be all tail. Yeah. Colour? What colour? I don't remember. It was a sort of greeny colour. Greeny colour Green, snake. A, a grass mean... snake. <laughs> they also have charm, the magnificent grass snake. <laughs> <laughs> Over a foot in length. <laughs> no more yes. fearsome reptile has ever been seen on the dusty streets of Morocco. <laughs> yeah, because what happened was a man no ran at us with a snake, starts hitting us with this snake like that, <laughs> and we all turn to each other and go, Oh, what kind of snake is that? <laughs> When were you in Morocco? What's going on? We went to Morocco, uh, 1989. Who, who's we? we? We, you and... We, us three. Oh, three. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's me and three friends. There's no point in saying who, you won't know who they are. Why did the snake attack you? Because we were uh, taking photographs. You know what, I don't need to know, you know what a photograph is. Richard, we were taking a photograph, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um... <laughs> <laughs> He didn't like you taking your photograph. I thought he didn't like you taking the photograph. He didn't like the fact that we hadn't then volunteered our, some money for that and right. subsequently chased us. Uh, well, this is obviously not true. <laughs> Why? Because it's bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think it's true. I do think it's not true. I think it's not true. I, well, I, I think we're going to go with lie. Lee, tell us the truth. It is, in fact, true. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Uh, David Baddiel. All right, this just says possession on it, which means that there's something here which is mine. Oh, sure. Yes. And this is it. Uh, this is the, the neck brace I wore once just to get an upgrade on a flight. <laughs> Was there anything the matter with your neck at the time? No. And you just wore that to get... Definitely true. I know you. It's bound to be true. <laughs> I can speak for your character. That sounds exactly the kind of thing. I'm amazed you weren't in a wheelchair at the time, frankly. <laughs> so you took it with you for that purpose? Yes. Did it work? Yes. Uh, where was your seat? Was that in club or economy? Uh, it was originally in club, and I got upgraded to first class. Could you just slip it on, just so that yeah, we can see how... I can slip it on. Yeah. Vulnerable you look. How does it look? Hang on, this is the face I did as well. You just look like a vicar. <laughs> Did you keep it on for the entire flight? Uh, yeah, I did, I did. I was too worried. Did you take it off? Seen taking yeah. it off. What did you tell the stewardess was wrong with you? I didn't, she didn't ask what was wrong what with me. What about the person you were sitting next to? Didn't they ask what you'd done? Well, it was a while ago now. I mean, well, I think, the bloke with the plastic ass legs. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with me either, mate. <laughs> <laughs> the, whole of, the whole of first class. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I there was a guy. Where's the toilets, mate? <laughs> I imagine there was a guy. I think, I, I think they did ask, and I think my story was that I'd got very bad whiplash from a car accident. So, Lee, what are you thinking? I are you don't know. I, I see, I would have thought this was a, 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 a lie, but... What do you think, Richard? I think it's a lie. You think it's a lie? I think, I think it's true. I think it sounds true to me. You think it's the truth? I... What do you think, Mr Bedil? <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever actually tried that tactic, have yeah, they? If, uh, David, if you were us, what would you say? Uh, I you... would say it was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Does that help at all, Lee? It's definitely yeah. true. He couldn't have right. thought of a double Because that obviously <laughs> means... Um... <laughs> I think it's a lie. It is a lie. Oh. Yeah. Well done, Mr. Richard. Ah. <laughs> uh, which uh, ill-mannered buzzing means at the end of the show, it's, uh, well, Lee's team, who are tonight's Golden Girls, having outclassed David's team 6-5. <laughs> <laughs> And we leave you with news that, according to research scientists, if a person's eyes move to the left, they're retrieving factual information. If they move to the right, then they're lying. If they move to the left, then the right, then the left, then right, left. The chances are they're watching tennis. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>
<laughs> and euphemisms are a form of lying when you use a more polite term to describe something, like when you give a refined lady directions to the powder room when she needs to fire out a dump. <laughs> which brings us circuitously to round one, home truths, in which we plumb the frightening depths of our panellists' lies as they take it in turns to read out a statement from the card in front of them, which may contain a true fact about themselves or a downright lie they're seeing for the first time. A scenario demanding instant creativity from the panellist, instant cunning from their interrogators, and endless patience from everyone watching. Uh, Michael is first to go over the top, so Michael, if you would. Before any TV appearance, I shadow box in my dressing room. <laughs> what do you wear? Oh. As your shadow, is it fully clothed or in your pants? Or? I mean, when I'm fully dressed, about to burst on the scene. And you do, <laughs> do you take boxing gloves with you, or is it just literally with your sort of hands? I, I don't take any equipment for this thing. It's a, just a little thing between me and the mirror. Really. Have you ever got beat? <laughs> <laughs> do you do it to keep fit, or is it to kind of whoosh yourself up before the show, like a rocky moment? Come on, rrr, I'm Michael Aspel. <laughs> it's. Um, <laughs> It is really, yes, to get the blood, I suppose, flowing towards the brain, that sort of thing. How fired up do you need to be for the Antiques Roadshow? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's worth ten grand! <laughs> How long do you shadow box for? Probably uh, sort of 20 seconds of... So uh, not long, it's just a quick, like... The old one, two and a few uppercuts. Would you mind giving us a quick demonstration? What, standing, or can I do it Standing, standing. How, however you do it in the mirror oh. for 20 seconds. Well, I suppose it's a bit of... That sort of boxing, wasn't it? The sort of boxing you see in the 17th century. That's all. So, Lee, what are you what are you thinking? What do you think? Well, you're a very calm, cool, calculated person. I think you're very, very suave, and I can't imagine you going get out there and kill them, Michael. I see you more as a sort of. We're on in five. I'm busy. I'm playing backgammon. Is that you trying to? I thought yes, I can imagine because he's so cool and calm that he might need to rrr him yeah. himself up. But I think it's a lie. Okay, it's a lie. Yeah, I'm saying it is okay. a lie. Michael, truth or untruth? It is true. Oh. It's God's own truth. <laughs> It is true. Michael does shadow it. box uh, like before every TV appearance like that. Uh, while he boxes, a ghetto blaster at his feet blares out uh, the same hard-pumping track over and over again. Schubert String Quartet number 15 <laughs> in G. <gym. laughs> of course, in a dressing room, it's shadow boxing. In the street, it's mental illness. <laughs> uh, Davina, your home truth, if you would, please. <clears throat> at my wedding, I walked down the aisle to the Big Brother theme tune. <laughs> Oh, really, really, yeah. we've got to hope that this is a lie, cos that would be like, <laughs> like, Possibly... And I've seen some unclassy weddings in my time. <laughs> People arriving in pink carriages with What's horses and giants. What's unclassy about that? The Big Brother... Like, firstly, it's quite quick, the Big Brother team. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> you, it's a quick walk up the aisle, isn't it? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah but the thing, the thing is, it's... I, I like a bit of humour and a bit of comedy, and that's what I was going for. It, it, was made everybody, it made everybody in the church, we all had a bit of a giggle, and then we started the serious music after that. But who chose this music? You or your spouse? Oh, well, me. I mean, my, I had to talk my husband round. It, Into getting married. It, it wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a little bit of that, a little right. bit of cajoling. Marriages are always, there's always a kind of a give and take in this situation. Like, so you had the Big Brother theme tune. Surely then there was a trade-off where... As you turned around and walked out, was it a I don't shaggy bombastic? I don't. What did he? What, <laughs> what did he, he get to pick as the music as he left it? Actually, I have to say, he didn't get to pick anything. It was just me. But you know, he got what he wanted on the wedding night. Oh, a, a nice did night out with his mates. What was that? <laughs> Did you have Marcus Bentley, the Geordie voiceover man, doing the actual <laughs> reading? Oh. Do you, Davina, take this man to be a lawful <laughs> wedding husband? Do you know, if we got remarried, <laughs> I'd do that, definitely, second time. Surely, though, you, need, you needed the morning after and you're waking up and turning to your partner and then he just leans over with day two. <laughs> <laughs> David, are you uh, well, I can, taken I... in by any of this? It's possible. I can see it would be sort of a jokey sort of if you wanted to, you know, have a sort of light-hearted beginning to the whole thing. I can, I can, I can it's possible. What's your instinct, Michael? My instinct, after recoiling, is it's probably true. 
Nara? No, my instinct is that you went for pure princess wedding and that it was string quartet playing. So it's a hung jury here. Yes. I've changed my mind. I don't think she did. Oh, right, it's not a hung jury here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, don't, I think it's a lie. We're, we're going to say lie. Mm, they're saying it's a lie, Davina. It is... a lie. It is a lie. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Yes, it's a lie. Uh, Davina did not have the Big Brother theme tune playing at her wedding ceremony. After the wedding, in a small function room next door, Dermot O'Leary hosted a low-budget follow-up ceremony called Davina's Wedding's Little Wedding. <laughs> Dara's turn to uh, amaze us. I co-own a racehorse with Sir Alex Ferguson. What's the racehorse called? The racehorse called Danger Here. One word put together. Danger Who here. owns it? No, there's a whole, there's a syndicate. There's a load of us in the syndicate. And line. who's training it? Uh, oh God, I, I, no idea. There's you don't know who trains it. I don't know who trains it. You Do you know, know what colour it is? Yes, it's brindle. <laughs> it's what? Brindle. Brindle. brindle? You don't get brindle horses. That's not a colour. That's, That's a, a character in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> brindle dogs, but yeah. not horses. So, um, what races have you seen it uh, racing? I, I saw it in Cheltenham. What did it race in at Cheltenham? What was the race? Oh, God, it was some sponsor thing. It was like a Hennessy thing. Uh, How long ago was that? That was uh, last March. Was it the Cheltenham Gold Cup meeting? No, 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 it was before that. That's slightly later in Cheltenham. What, so, and... what date? What part of March was it? <laughs> Cheltenham, I'm just saying, but it wasn't the Cheltenham Festival. That's when the Cheltenham Festival was on. In it, March? But yeah, it, it's just the week before Paddy's Day in March. Forget uh, the Paddy's Day. This has got nothing to do with it. it I, you asked What when? is the date, the date of the meeting you went it to? It was the 3rd or 4th, uh, 34th of March this year. Right, okay. Do so you need to know the date in case it was like a oh, horse bank holiday? How long? You asked, you asked, no, no, 3rd of March, no, horses won't work that day. It's part of their culture. <laughs> They're all worshipping their horse gods. <laughs> special hay cakes. Maybe. Have you got a horse? I've, I've got no horse, no, but Would I've you got... like a horse? Why, is that what this is about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not about the fact that I want a horse, quite, it's about the fact you that... You want a horse, you're quite a horse guy, and you want a horse, and you're ashamed of saying it, because it makes you sound like a 12-year-old girl. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got an interest in horse racing a bit, obviously. It's sort of an interest. I, originally in Ireland, it was part of a greyhound syndicate, which is, That's like... A bit, was it? But it was too big to race with the greyhounds. Yeah, and... <laughs> Seems reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a donkey in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary somewhere. Does it work like that, where they send you little no, pictures at no, Christmas? <laughs> You're doing good, whereas Dara has an enslaved creature. <laughs> <laughs> the horse doesn't send me a letter every Christmas and go, yeah. thank you very much for the yeah. sugar cubes. <laughs> uh, I, yes, where's, please, where's could where's I your, run less? Where's your My horse? feet hurt <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> a cruel dwarf Dara. hits me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Lee, you're going to have to come to a conclusion. What do you think? Um, I, I think he might be telling the truth. I think he's telling the truth. OK. I think they're both wrong. You're lying. <laughs> I'm going against my team oh, and saying that you're oh, lying. Really? He's, uh, if I'm wrong, i makes I'll... a mockery of the whole team <clears> thing, <throat> doesn't it? It's See, a... he's lying. He's trying to get us to change our mind. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he's lying. Or is he or he's, he's lying. If he was telling the truth, he yes, wouldn't go, have true. another go, Lee, would he? Think again, Lee. Have another go. He's saying it's a lie. It's a black and white lie. It's a brindle lie. It's a... Lie. Uh, the truth of the matter, please. You're lying. <laughs> it is a lie. Oh, oh, it is a lie. <laughs> Good work. Well done, mate. Well done. It's a lie. Dara does not own or co-own a racehorse with anyone. In fact, Dara has far better ways of avoiding tax and laundering his money. <laughs> Despite having nothing to do with any of Sir Alex's horses, Dara does pay towards the upkeep and stable cost of Wayne Rooney and owns Rio Ferdinand's stud rights. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, it's uh, Lee's team who are looking decidedly out of their depth, trailing as they are, 3-1. Our next round is called Ring of Truth, a simple title, simple idea, but still a massive obstacle for our panellists. So, to uh, David's team and a uh, trip down memory lane to 1985. Uh, hello. Suzanne Haywood, hello. Hello. Hi. Hello, Mike, hello, Elton. Hello, hello, how are you? All right, thanks. I what? just want to ask you, Elton, how is married life suiting you? Married life is fine. Uh, it's, uh, we've been married just over a year now and it's flown by, which is a good sign. Uh, and I, I compare it to when I was on tour last year and it really dragged on a long time and, uh, and the marriage seems to have just flown by. So we're really very, very happy, and that's really uh, nice of you to ask. Hello, and Elton. Yeah? Does Renata think you have any bad habits? Oh, lots. Yeah, she's trying to get me to uh, stop doing lots of things, but I won't tell you what they are. <laughs> <laughs> well. 
I do like the fact that, you know, in 1985, we all thought he was straight. Everyone in the nation thought he was straight, but there was one kid that knew the truth <laughs> and just saw casting a rung up super strong and go, yeah, yeah, how's this marriage going out? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, she, have you got any habits that she doesn't like, your wife? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yes, that was Elton John appearing on uh, Saturday Superstore in the days when he was uh, so far inside the closet that he was paying regular visits to Narnia. <laughs> Uh, Elton continued to be happily married right up until he realised that his wife didn't have a penis. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, here is your uh, related fact for David's team. Uh, David Furnish has an Elton tracker sat-nav, so he can uh, see exactly where Elton John is at any time. So that would actually involve there being a, the Elton being tagged in some way? Yeah. Yes, it was developed by David Furnish's brother. Is, who's, Who is he? He's an electrical engineer. Right. You are generally saying that he went up to him with some sort of like, like out of Mission Impossible 3, and to the back of his neck and went pfft, like that. Uh, and now. Or some, like, some kind of swan collar. Um, almost like a bejeweled yeah. anklet. That's all I need. A bejeweled anklet? Yeah. You do this with much more style. <laughs> this isn't the antique well, roadshow now, Michael. <laughs> is this a device that's actually been um, implanted in Elton no. John, or is it just in his Almost, bag? Almost, no, right, it's so a button-sized it. transmitter. It came about as a joke because Elton apparently kept on losing his mobile phone, and so uh, David would never know where he was. They, they strapped him to a table and fired a microchip into his <laughs> ear. <laughs> Still not a solution to the phone-losing problem, though, is it? <laughs> yeah. I know where I am, but it. where's my fucking phone? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just Elton John should just concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> You know you put Elton Tracker in inverted commas. Does that mean if I need to buy one myself, I have to ask for an Elton Tracker? Is that the actual? That's the actual. If name? you're wanting to track Elton John, yes, that would be well, weird. Can we all though, do it? Can we all just go and see where Elton is at any given time? <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, we could all hack into the signal that the button-sized transmitter is sending out, and we'd all know where he is all the time. Last yeah. thing at night, I'd like to be able to turn to it and, and just yeah. the glow, and just to see. There's Elton. There's Elton there. Yeah. <laughs> Home. I think you open a can of worms if you hack into the system as well and have it on while you're in bed because, the, it, like a horror film, one night you would wake up and the chip would be in your house. <laughs> 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 you say Rocket Man five times in the mirror, he turns up. <laughs> so, David, <clears throat> are you thinking this is plausible? I, I do think it's quite plausible, but also, obviously, it might I think, not be. I think it's doable. I don't think it's plausible that they would actually... that he would constantly track Elton John wherever he is. We have to work out whether it's with Elton's agreement, of course. I'd like to think that Elton might knows about it, given that we all now know about it, yeah. clearly. <laughs> I'd hate him to find out watching this show. <laughs> um, so you need to come to a decision. Um, Michael. Yes, it has this kind of whiff of verisimilitude. <laughs> you... <laughs> That's... I think he's saying it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Oh, is that, is that a casting vote? Mm. Um, I, well, I'm going to say, I, I, plausible though it is, I'm going to say I think it's a lie. I'm saying it's a lie, and I can tell you that it is, in fact, a lie. <laughs> Absolutely right, well done. <laughs> yes, David Furnish uh, does not have an Elton tracker sat-nav. Elton and David's relationship is founded upon trust, a trust that Elton set up in the mid-90s so David would never have to work again. <laughs> So, at the end of that round, it's uh, Lee's team who appear to be losing the will to win. Behind us, they are 4-2. <laughs> Our next round is called This Is My, in direct contravention of any known grammar. David's team will each claim to have a unique link to tonight's mystery guest, but two of the panellists are lying. So, it's up to Lee's team to debrief, deduce and decide. So, please welcome this week's special guest person, Lee. <laughs> So, David, what is Lee to you? Uh, this is Lee, and for the past six months, he's been teaching me how to improve my memory. Michael, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Lee? This is Lee, who is my driver, and he has also appeared on episodes of Minder. Uh, and finally, Dara, your relationship with Lee. This is Lee, he's actually my gardener, and he was introduced to me by Andrew Lloyd Webber. So there you are, a uh, well, mental well. coach, according to David, a driver come actor, if we believe Michael, or a Lloyd Webber recommended gardener. 
uh, according to Dara. Lee's team, where would you like to begin? Dara, where do you live? Where do I live? I live in West London. And so how was he introduced to you by Andrew Lloyd Webber? Well, it wasn't like that we were all at a party and uh, <laughs> Webber goes, have you met my gardener, Lee? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, uh, I did Parkinson and, and Andrew Lloyd Webber was on it with Tim Rice once and you're making polite chit-chat in the green room afterwards and I told him where he lived. I said, oh, yeah, I used to live around there. How are you finding it? Yes. And we had a very dull conversation about <laughs> how it, I, like, I, it's, a really, it's kind of grown up the house because it's got a garden. I'm just finding it hard to believe that you, it's a quite exciting time, isn't it? You're on Parkinson, that's quite exciting. Mm. You're meeting Andrew Lloyd Webber, he's yeah. famous, that's quite exciting. At what point do you go, uh, I loved Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> do you know any good gardeners? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just I'm finding that hard to believe, you know. How long's Lee been your driver? Oh, blimey. Um, 18 years. And what 18 car, years. What, what car does he drive? Mercedes. And which seat do you sit on? <laughs> <laughs> I have a funny thing. I like to sit at the back of the car on the left-hand side so I can do a bit of homework. Which you could never do on the right, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then you've got the driver right... Right in front of you. Mm. And you might mm. need to ask him a question about your homework. Does, and it's, does, if he goes like that... It's Brazil. That's fine. <laughs> but you'd ask his head to swivel all the way round and he then wouldn't be concentrating on the road. So he could be telling the truth. Yes. Yeah. What did he play in Minder? Oh, as you can imagine, some kind of heavy. So you've been in the car with him for 18 years. He's the same driver the whole time. You're yeah. not... You're not had, right. So what's his surname? Tippett. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. Uh, that, see, that's how the lying mind works, doesn't it? Driver, tip, make it bigger. <laughs> Tippett! Tip it was either that or honky horn, wasn't it? <laughs> Could you just tell me again what your one was? It was the last six months. He, he, Lee has been teaching me how to improve my memory. OK, how do you do that? Well, I, I go to a monthly one-to-one -one class with, oh. with Lee, and the aim is basically to stop the natural deterioration of the brain. Can you give me an example of the, the kind of techniques he teaches you? Well, it's, it's, it's to, well to try and remember things like, uh, well, like lines for a show up. Uh, essentially you go on a, a, a mental journey and you sort of remember it on the basis of a place that you know very well and so you associate different parts of you know say a speech you're trying to learn with bits that, with objects that are in your kitchen if I said to you seven items you could picture them in a story couldn't you so we've got a dog possibly well, maybe you're have to not drive... maybe you, you know, know. Well, David if you yeah. get to six I'll believe you okay dog duck house <laughs> car circle square triangle can you repeat them back to me, please? Dog, duck, house, car, circle, square, triangle. That was that was, that was incredibly rubbish. easy. <laughs> I didn't have to use any technique at all. You say, can you say the apple is there? <laughs> the apple is there. <laughs> How do you remember it? Do you know what? I've realised I've got a bad memory because I could only remember the names of animals and shapes. <laughs> <laughs> can we have a look at Lee's hands? Uh, yes, you can take yes. a look at it. Yeah. They look like nice hands, he's not gone. Okay, okay well, we need an answer. So, Lee's team is this person uh, David's brain enhancer, uh, Michael's acting chauffeur, or Dara's green fingered can't you see friend? Him in minder? What you, yeah, I can see him. That's the thing about him, isn't it? I he looks both like minder. a driver and someone that used to be in Minder. I think we'll go for. Well, should we go for, for Michael's, Michael's, Michael's driver? Perhaps our guest Lee can tell us who you really are. I'm Michael's driver, and I have appeared in episodes of Minder. Yes, Lee is indeed uh, Michael's driver. Are you only Michael's driver or do you drive other people? No, I drive other people as well. You never told me that. <laughs> <laughs> could, be, could be the end of a beautiful friendship. Congratulations, thank you so much, Lee. Well done. So many thanks to Lee, who was Michael's driver and occasionally appeared in Minder. For those too young to remember Minder, it was uh, Dennis Waterman's stepping stone to Panto. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are literally finding it all beneath them. On top as they are, 4-3.
And so, with a tangible sense of relief, we come to the final round, Quick Fire Lies, where the panellists reveal more dubious facts about themselves, but this time against the clock. On occasion, instead of reading a statement out, they will reveal a possession, which they will claim is in some way linked to their unsavoury lives. Uh, Lee's team are trailing, so now would be the perfect time to start bucking their ideas up, beginning with... <coughs> David. <coughs> My first word was Hoover. <laughs> Well, you? You would, would you pronounce it exactly Hoover, or did you go Hoover? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but my, would your my mother... Sense, my sense of it as a, at the time was that I was saying it absolutely bang on. <laughs> but, you know, my parents were encouraging, I imagine, rather than going, you've mispronounced that and it's a brand name. <laughs> <laughs> well, my children's first word was ashtray. <laughs> Very clearly, just said ashtray. <laughs> Did he kick yeah. his fingers at the same time? You It's mm. <laughs> 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 yeah. so roughly how old were you? Hoover. I, I, don't, I don't know. Must but have been about... the when do people start talking? Well, how do you know the story? Uh, <laughs> your parents well, told you. Well, my parents have told me. But yes. they failed to tell oh, you how old they, you were when you said I don't remember it. doing it. I don't remember. I remember there was a silence and an inability to speak. <laughs> and then suddenly the sense Uber. of a vacuum cleaner came into my head and I knew that I could express it. But he's very intelligent, so I can imagine his mum and dad going, What's that then? What's that? And him going, Well, it's a Hoover, of course. Stupid! It's a bloody Hoover. Uh, um, I don't know. What do you think? So Dana, what do you think? Plausible? Well, my my children' the first words were also dog, cat, cat ball, mama, dada, small. Hoover's mm. quite complex word. Yeah. I am abstaining for the first time. I'm, I'm delegating to to Davina. To, to right, well, I won't take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I'm delegating no, what to do Davina. You think? You're on your own now, love. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be done with it. Let's say it's true. OK, she's saying it's true. David, tell all. <coughs> it is, in fact, true. Yeah. It is true. Yeah. Sensational, yes, wow. it is true. Uh, David's first word was Hoover. He was uh, watching Vanessa Feltz eating at the time. <laughs> uh, next. <coughs> Davina. Uh, possession. Oh, right, if you'd like to look at the box beneath yes. your desk, <clears> open <throat> it and tell us what it contains. Right. These are the wig and glasses I wear if I want to pop to the shops unnoticed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Would you, pop, would you pop mind it on, um, pop it on there. slipping pop it on. into it? Obviously, I'd do it properly, but it's a bit hard to get all my hair. Yeah. In. Do it properly. You know. <laughs> 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 yes. It's Davina. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. Who is that? 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 I mean, you do look less like you than normal, but... It's, it's a lot more casual, lot... dressed down, plain. And it works? <clears throat> it absolutely works, completely. Not anymore, it doesn't. <laughs> I know we have to, like, make a guess, but I'm, I'm, I'm really liking that look, by the way. I think I feel... <laughs> it's actually I like it very much. That's... Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Michael. I would... I would... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Girl. But me, my opinion is worth nothing to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, what are you thinking? I think, you I'm thinking it's quite plausible. Yeah, yes. so am I. Yeah, because, so. yeah, you, you do look very different. But the other side of it is, it's a big, you're really... If somebody discovers who you are, you it's really kind of are exposed yeah. as having put on a silly disguise. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's one short of a deer stalker and a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think? I don't believe a word of it. Yeah. So, yeah, if you got, no, if I think it's a If lie. you got caught doing it once, it would be really embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. Now, I've changed my mind entirely on this. And it's, particularly if somebody discovers you wearing the glasses and the wig, take them off and then don't recognise you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be embarrassing. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. we, I think we're going to go for a lie, then. Lie. lie. Yeah, I think it's They're a lie. all going for a lie, yeah. suddenly. Davina, tell us whether it's the truth or a lie. Well, actually, it is... a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lie. <laughs> mm. Yes. Uh, next, <coughs> Jason. Oh. <coughs> I applied for Mastermind with a specialist subject, Columbo. Who plays Columbo? Peter Falk. Who made Columbo? I was put... Sorry? Who made it? Universal. Hey. 
could be. Could that be. is you, a company that makes things. <laughs> <laughs> what are the years in which William Shatner has appeared in Columbo? Because he, he's appeared more than once. And what years are those episodes? He's been in three episodes. Yeah. 74, 71, probably guess a 78, maybe. You're definitely wrong there, because he's been in one in the sort of m that looks more modern, which I think would be in the early 90s, and the kind of newer ones that are right. less good. In the first one that William Shatner appears in, what is the device by which he... What is the device? If he... you're not telling the truth, let me warn you, you're messing with the wrong one. <laughs> he uses, the apparently in that context futuristic device he uses by which he makes it seem that, uh, that, that, that it's a different time from the time it really is. <sighs> what does he use? What machine? No, I don't know. Right, this is rubbish then. You're, you're not an expert on Columbo. I've only not, watched uh, Columbo a bit. I'm not that an one's been on load. <laughs> and it's I'm not an episode on that recorder. episode. I, I, Sorry? He didn't say he was an expert anyway. He said he applied. Uh, yeah. not, he got I'm rejected not, for knowing I'm fuck on. all. <laughs> David, what are you thinking? OK, we'll go for a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie. Jason, what's uh, the truth of it? Wait. It says Columbia. <laughs> 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 start again, start again. <laughs> Just one more thing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a lie. It is a lie. Uh, it is a lie, yes. Jason did not apply to Mastermind with the specialist subject of Columbo. He was just about to apply, but then Columbo started. <laughs> In episodes of Columbo, you remember the viewer knows all along who the murderer is, rather like with Princess Diana. <laughs> uh, which uh, incessant buzzing means that at the end of tonight's contest, it's David's team who are tonight's prize fighters, having comprehensively outpunched Lee's team seven points to five. <laughs> So, uh, hats off to our winners, bog off to our losers, and uh, we leave you with news that, according to research scientists, habitual liars tend to speak in a dull, flat monotone, which begs the question, just what is Kent Livingstone try to hide? <laughs> Good night. <laughs>
Jimmy Holmes. Jimmy Holmes. James, actually. It was Chris and James. Right. What does he do there? <laughs> <laughs> he sells insurance. <laughs> he does. <laughs> and I'll tell you where he sells it. He sells it in that CN Tower in Montreal. Right. Wow. Yeah. Who was born first? Um, Jimmy was out by two seconds or so before me. Two yeah. seconds? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So what yeah. are the differences between you? Would you look absolutely identical, or...? He's very handsome as well, yeah. <laughs> Is he married? Yes. What's, what's his Eleanor. wife...? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do they have children? Yes. What are they called? I don't know. They live in Canada. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> But do you sort of have that twin thing of, you know, if, if Lee were to punch you in the face, would he, you know, wake up in Canada <laughs> worrying about making his insurance targets, but in fact it would yeah. be because Lee'd hit you? <laughs> <laughs> you must be in constant pain being separated from your twin by thousands of miles and, you know, huge amounts of relative celebrity. Because he's very well known for his insurance work, I believe. <laughs> Apparently, he sits next to a woman in the insurance office that he really doesn't like, called Andrea Turner. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Half true. What would be great is if we all said lie, and then you said, ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> but when you look round, Eamon wasn't there. He just slid round the back. <laughs> <laughs> so, David um, and Co. I think lie. Yeah, lie. clearly it's lie. a lie. Yeah. I, we think it's a lie. They're, they're saying it's a lie. Eamon, reveal the truth. Thank God it's alive. Yeah. It's alive. <laughs> yes, uh, it is a lie. Eamon does not have an identical twin uh, called Jimmy who lives in Canada. Canada is, of course, the home of Celine Dion, Brian Adams and Shania Twain. And to think we wasted our time bombing Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter, your home truth. OK. In an advert starring Pele, my voice was passed off as his voice. The advert about um, it was a uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Was uh, it about football? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it was about a medical uh, uh, thing. <laughs> it wasn't this advert that Pele did for impotence, was it? Yes, it was. Was it? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because he famously did an advert for impotence, didn't he, Pele? What, for people who wanted to be impotent? <laughs> <laughs> How does that work? Tired of being a slave to your cock? Cut <laughs> <laughs> it off and eat it. Like <laughs> Pele. <laughs> <laughs> Why have I never seen this advert? Where did you see this advert? Well, Pele did an advert for, for impotence yeah, about five or six years ago. Did that they? bit is true. Yeah. I mean, that bit is absolutely true. I'm not true. really in the target market, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, I wasn't sitting at home after Coronation Street going, shh, this is for me. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do, like, a, a slogan or something at the end? Or The whole voice was you? It was mostly me, yeah. Why wasn't it Pele? Uh, because he's got a really uh, quite a thick Bristol accent. <laughs> <laughs> what did you have to say? It was something like... Uh, after a football game, uh, the players like to talk to each other about a lot of things, but one thing they don't like to talk about is the election problem. <laughs> so, Lee and team. Well, he does... I, I think he does lots of voice work, doesn't he? That's an do absolute do... lie, Hugh. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did it. I think he did. I thought Pelly's English is not good. I think he's telling the truth. OK, well, then I will go with my team and say that okay, they're saying Peter is, in fact, the voice of impudence. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, tell us all. And you're the voice of impudence. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Hey! Hey! Yeah, it is, it is true. Uh, Peter was the voice of Pele in his advert for male impotence. Companies think carefully about who should endorse their products. If it's men's cosmetics, they get David Beckham. If it's women's fragrance, they get Scarlett Johansson. And if it's frozen sheep's offal in batter, they get Kerry Katona. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Hugh, your fascinating factoid. Kellogg's offered me a job in their development department after I sent them a list of new cereal ideas. <laughs> OK. <laughs> right, what... Um, <laughs> give us a rundown of some of the cereal ideas you sent. I sent them uh, various ideas for uh, 
sugar puffs. The problem with sugar puffs is that they float. <laughs> you can't fill a bowl yeah. with sugar puffs You'll because the sugar puffs. Yeah. So you basically you have a bowl of, of milk, don't you? And the sugar puffs all rise to the top. Are you saying if you fill a bowl with sugar puffs and then yeah, they put all the go... milk on, the buoyancy of the underlying sugar puffs <laughs> uh, forces does, the ones it? on the top out of the bowl? <laughs> no, it doesn't force them out of the bowl, but they float. Just, but, but they float. You can't get much milk in. You can't get as much milk as you want in, or if you put too much milk in, they do go. Zzz. So one of the things was a new, a new heavier. A new heavier sugar puff. Yeah, and it was How a sugar puff. How did you propose to do that? Then? Yeah, you put a raisin in them. <laughs> How would you get the raisin inside? Because like a raisin is like the same size as a sugar puff. How would you get that inside? All sugar puffs are, they're 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 puffed wheat, aren't they? So you get right. a kernel of wheat and you essentially you blow air into it, so it just goes. Pfft. That's right. all it is. It's no good for you. So if at the point that you go. Pfft, you fire a raisin into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it? And they offered so, you a job? They offered me a job uh, developing solutions to problems with, uh, with cereal. What are the problems? The problems have? are that uh, cornflakes go soggy too quickly. And, and what was your yeah, solution? Kind of Lamination. So, <laughs> the look. <laughs> so, it is essentially finding a way of making them a bit more like a frosty, but without covering them in sugar, because there's a health aspect to a cornflake that there isn't to a. So I've always thought that with frosty. cocoa pops, when they first made cocoa pops, they put milk on it, and they thought, "Oh no, all the colours <laughs> running." <laughs> and then someone went, "No, we can turn this to our advantage." Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm believing this. Yeah, me too. You seem to know quite a lot about your cereal. Yes. I, I, yeah, I think we think it's true. Yeah, okay, they're definitely. saying it's true. Q, truth or tripe? It's a lie. Oh! It's a lie. Kellogg's did not offer you a job in their development department. The elusive goal of uh, modern breakfast cereal manufacturing is to try and raise the sugar content above its current level of 115%. <laughs> Our next round is called Ring of Truth, in which I read out some uh, celebrity facts. Our teams decide if they're true or not, and our audience sit there waiting for it all to end. Uh, David's team is uh, the first. Uh, Wayne Rooney and Colleen McLaughlin got engaged in a petrol station. <laughs> is that true? Wayne Rooney yes. is a man <laughs> whose skills are vastly uh, overvalued by our society. He can't even count up to the amount of money he's got. <laughs> and he's going to do a lot of crazy things. <laughs> well, they went out for Chinese, apparently, and then uh, they decided against it. They pulled into a service station. Uh, so got engaged on the forecourt. <laughs> um, and then they went back to Colleen's parents to have corned beef and beans. The, the whole meal plan of the evening seems very vague. <laughs> so they, they were on their way to Chinese and the, mm. the sight of some... Ah. A service station distracted them. But then actually the whole glamour of petrol held them up <laughs> on the forecourt. So then the proposing happens and then they say, actually, let's not go and queue up with trays. Let's, let's go and impose ourselves on a... <laughs> on a very strictly catered corned beef and beans evening, <laughs> meaning that no one has quite enough corned beef and beans. <laughs> it's typical of the thoughtlessness of the youth of today. <laughs> They're neither of them that bright, are they? She's launched a perfume, isn't she? Oh, yes. Called Colleen, and then with a little cross after which I... Maybe a kiss, or maybe because she can't spell her own surname. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure which. Yeah. Kalinex. <laughs> 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 right, if I could interest you in an answer of some sort uh, at some I'm, stage. Uh, you can't really interest me in these people, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I, they will do crazier and more miserable things in their lives than this, so I'm willing to believe it. It definitely has a ring of truth about it. I think it's possible. So, I, I think, should we say true, then? Yeah, 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 yeah. let's say so true. It's true, and I can tell you it is absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, Yes, Wayne Rooney and Colleen McLaughlin did get engaged in a petrol station. Wayne was the perfect gentleman. He got down on one knuckle and made the sign for ring. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, all very romantic. Wayne then hid the ring inside a reheated chicken pasty, and when Colleen threw up, there it was in her lap. <laughs> so, at the end of that round, it's Lee's team who are oozing with confidence, leading as they are 4-2.
Onward into round three then, and the confusingly titled This Is My. Each of Lee's team will claim to have a connection with tonight's mystery guest, but only one is telling the truth. The good news for David's team is they therefore have a 33% chance of success. The bad news is that means failure is the more likely outcome. <laughs> uh, so please welcome tonight's special guest person, Amanda. <laughs> Uh, so, Lee, what is Amanda to you? This is Amanda, and she is a woman who gave my dog mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation after it was run over by a car. <laughs> uh, Eamon, perhaps you'd like to explain <clears throat> your relationship with well, Amanda? Well, as you can see, this is the lovely Amanda, who I know because she was Angelina Jolie's double in Tomb Raider. And finally, Hugh, what's Amanda to you? Um, this is Amanda. We, we came third in last year's Goodwood pantomime horse dash. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the choice. A what? canine <laughs> rescuer, according to Lee, a Hollywood stunt woman, if we believe Eamon, or half a pantomime horse, of which Hugh was the other half. So David's team, your witness, Lee. Where did your dog get into difficulties? You say difficulties. It was hit by a car, so it was... Right. We were on a, like a, a common near my house. And uh, I, I let the dog go in the common. He ran out into the road. I went out to chase after him, obviously, and he ran into the road, hit my car, and... What, well, the car punched him? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was, uh, you know, he was hit, and he was out, and, and luckily Amanda came along and said, uh, <laughs> said uh, Hang on, wait yeah. a minute, please. He was lying there, um, and he, he was motionless, and then Amanda came over and said, uh, you know, can I help you? I said, uh, well, you could have helped by not driving so fast. <laughs> um, and then we got over that a bit, and she said she felt guilty, so I thought, so, you know what it's like, you've killed a dog, the least you can do is stick your lips over his nose and mouth and blow. <laughs> Amanda was driving the car. She drove the car that hit him, yeah. And she got out and the car to out, help. Said, and you oh. kept in touch with the lady who killed your dog? She didn't kill it. Oh, Wait for the end of the story. Did. There's a happy ending. Oh, right. good. That little dog looked at me, looked up like that. <laughs> After a few minutes of blowing, she was like that. She was using the nostrils, playing it like a recorder. <laughs> and, uh, all right, that bit's not true. Right? <laughs> so, uh, and at first, nothing, just the cheeks were be bellowing like that. <laughs> I said, harder, Amanda, harder. And one big old my <laughs> And I saw his little ribs, because he was a greyhound, so you could spot every little bit of windy movement. Yeah. Just, just rise gently. All right. And then there was a cough and a splutter. That was mainly her. Disgusting breath. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then the dog just looked up at me and said, um, you know. Said, I've Hello, almost... now I can speak. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, he said, he, this, well, you know, this I... lady has I... blown her soul into me. <laughs> <laughs> You're wise now. <laughs> and then the dog got in the car and drove off. <laughs> <laughs> what was the make of car? Uh, it was a Dalmatian. Oh, car. Um, <laughs> it was a grey car, I remember that, because I remember yeah. thinking, that's ironic. My dog's black and white. Get, combine that and you I got a grey car. Greyhound. You said greyhound. It was. Half greyhound, half Dalmatian. Want <laughs> <laughs> to try cross examining any others? Uh, Sorry. Goodwood pantomime horse dash. Those, I haven't heard those words together before. <laughs> well, it's, essentially, it is a pantomime horse race. And is that an annual event? Yeah. <laughs> and it's at uh, Goodwood. <laughs> How did you and Amanda end up in the same horse? Because Amanda is a friend of my wife, and it was therefore safe for me to be with Amanda. Who was front? Who was back? I was back. <laughs> <laughs> Were you Bookie's favourite to win? I'm not sure there was much betting on it, to be honest. Who did um, win? Damon Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was in a car, that yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> hey, Eamon, how do you know Amanda if she's Angelina Jolie's body Just double? So I have this thing for Angelina Jolie. Not being able to get close to Angelina, didn't return my calls, my letters, anything. Um, I read about... Amanda uh, being Angelina's <laughs> stunt double. Where did you read about this? Oh, everywhere. It was well publicised. I mean, I remember, I remember, yeah. <laughs> it made five minutes on my Saturday morning Five Live radio programme. It was very good, very good interview to be able to talk and meet up with the woman that would be the nearest I would get to Angelina Jolie. So what kind of stunts did she do then? 
Well, she jumps a lot. She, she <laughs> As a matter of fact, if you watch closely, in Tomb Raider 2, Amanda jumps from an aeroplane and lands in a jeep as Angelina Jolie. So, yes, that's what she does. <laughs> <laughs> what's her surname? Kemp. Hugh, what's her surname? Robertson. <laughs> Robertson. Lee. D don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> Where does Amanda live? Amanda lives in Oxford. Uh, what's funny about that? I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, actually, I grew up in Oxford, so that it does exist. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so, David's team, is this woman uh, Lee's dog's lifesaver, uh, Eamon's movie star stunt double, or Hugh's other half uh, in the pantomime horse? I, th I have to say, I, at the moment, oh. what are you thinking at the moment? I would say, having studied uh, Hugh's uh, techniques over the evening, that I think he's telling the truth. And he was trying a sextuple bluff. <laughs> <laughs> what number bluff is the truth? <laughs> Infinity bluff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's either Hugh or, or oh, Eamon. Eamon. What, you're um, dissing Lee altogether? I, well, yes, I'm right. afraid <laughs> I am. If it turns out that's true, then, you know, it's an odder world than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking Eamon. Right. <laughs> well, I'm going to go. He's with, always yeah, right. Yes. Well, I'm going to go with Peter, and I, I th and I also think I think it's Hugh. I think it's Hugh. Hugh's pantomime horse. Okay. Him. Well, perhaps uh, Amanda would like to reveal her true identity. I was Angelina Jolie's oh! stunt double in Two Made Two. Oh! <laughs> 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 you know what the best thing is? Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good work, team. Yeah. Angelina, of course, uh, recently got an Oscar from Cambodia, along with a Darren, two Michaels and a David. <laughs> uh, all of which means, at the end of that round, it's David's team who are praying for a miracle. Behind us, they are 5-2. Our final round is quick fire lies, in which all sense of calm is abandoned in favour of some rapid fire lying against the clock. As always, our panellists don't know what's written on the cards, and David's team are seriously faltering, so now would be the perfect time to reverse that trend, starting with <coughs> David. <sighs> I used to be a tour guide for a hat museum. <laughs> <laughs> Where? <laughs> Where? In Abingdon. Why did they need a tour guide <laughs> in a hat museum? You were sort of the tour guide stroke person there. Yeah. How long was the tour? You, you could you'd probably get a good sense of the place in about... I mean, a very good sense of the place in about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you remember anything at all that you used to say about any of the hats? No. Or a type of hat? No. You yeah. can't remember the name of one hat in a, and you were the tour guide in a hat museum? <laughs> they had a sort of bowler hat now, <laughs> top hat. <laughs> And then they had huge feathery hats. Just by bizarre coincidence, there's someone at the front row with a sort of bowler hat. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just pass the hat to David so he can give us a rough description and history of the bowler hat? Thank you very much. Yeah, Could you um, give us a rough idea of how you used to do this tour with that hat? No, Tell no, that's hats well, on a plane. Well, what I would do is I would hold this hat up and then sort of twirl it like... Hey, that. that's good. <laughs> uh, what kind of people went to the hat museum? Oh, losers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's an ounce of truth about this story. No, I don't. He did it. Yeah. You don't believe him, do you? Just... I do. So, Lee. It's true. Eamon thinks it's true, but this time I'm going to go with Hugh. You're saying it's untrue. It's David, tell us the truth. True. Uh, it is, in fact, a lie. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> good! Good! <laughs> good. <laughs> yes. It's a lie. David has never been a tour guide for a hat museum. Uh, if you can't imagine what a hat museum is like, then think of a glove museum with half as many exhibits. Uh, <laughs> next, <laughs> Olivia. I once pulled a boy by pretending to be French. <laughs> when you say pretending to be French, do you mean with the look, the accent, or the language, or all three? It was dark. Right. Um, I like the way you changed the question to <laughs> how light was it in the room. Right. <laughs> I'll, t I'll make my own questions up. Uh, <laughs> strawberry, that's my favourite jelly. <laughs> Do you speak French? Oui. <laughs> <laughs> and what was his yeah. name? What was it Johnny. 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 What was Johnny's surname? Garlic. Um, Johnny, Johnny Garlic. Garlic. <laughs> <laughs> what about 
a bizarre coincidence with the French that was. Over there. You, know, <laughs> you didn't think to say, Garlic. hello, I am French, what is your name? Johnny Garlic. I can't think of anything to say now. <laughs> There's no connection. <laughs> <laughs> what point did he work out that you weren't French? The next day when I told him I wasn't French. <laughs> oh, you, the next morning, you mean? No, 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 it wasn't like that. I mean, he was at the same beach the next day. Where, where was this? In... by the sea. You missed out the middle so word. In what in, by the in sea? In Cornwall by the sea. And were you... <laughs> that was the place called Cornwall, Cornwall by... Cornwall on sea. <laughs> where, where in Cornwall? Where in Cornwall? Yes, where in Cornwall? It's oh. right by the sea. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your opening line? What was your chat up line? Hello. <laughs> what was the second one? Hello again. <laughs> Do you want to see the Madonna with the big boobies? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, so you I, think tend, I tend to believe it's not. You don't think it's no, true? Think it's <laughs> what do you nonsense. think, Eamon? I think she looks French, yeah. and therefore I think she's double bluffing. I think it's true. You think it's true? You think it's a lie? OK, we'll say it's true, shall yeah. we? OK, Olivia, are you lying through your teeth? It's a true love. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, it is true. Olivia did uh, once pull a boy by pretending to be French. Pretending to be French seemed to be working until she blew her cover when she went to the toilet and then washed her hands. <laughs> <laughs> Next, <clears throat> Hugh. At school, I had a fight with Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen. <laughs> Who do you think won? <laughs> <That's the laughs> <one I'm> <laughs> yeah. I won. What, what school what? was this? This was, uh, this was at school in London. Ah. You don't want to say what school. Well, it was at my school. Yeah. school. <laughs> Actually, it was in a rugby match. Did he play rugby? He did play rugby. Crikey. But he played for another school, and we had a fight when I was playing on one team and he was playing on the other team. The thing is, I didn't know he was Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen because he... Well, he, I knew he was called Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen <laughs> because he only later became Lawrence Llewellyn yeah. Bowen. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, so, David, you're going to have to come to a decision as to whether uh, Hugh is telling the truth or not. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think it sounds plausible, but I think it sounds too plausible. Oh. So I think... I think he's lying. So plausible, uh, it's untrue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the only thing is, Lawrence Lennon, I've never met him, but he's, is he not quite slight? He's very tall. Is he's he very, very tall? big, man. But you're on the other team. You could say anyone. Ronnie Corbett, huge man. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie Corbett Ronnie, is a huge man. Only, That's very, an optical illusion. He's about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, six, it's only because Ronnie Barker was the largest man who ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> but we nice. think it's true. They're saying it's true. OK, Hugh. True or lie? Lie. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm sure that. Uh, yes, it is a lie. Uh, Hugh did not have a fight with Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen at school. Uh, Hugh wasn't at school in early yeah. Renaissance Britain when Lawrence grew up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, Lawrence is, however, an expert in self-defence. He finds it handy when people see what he's done to their houses. <laughs> Which, in polite interruption, means that at the end of our final round, it's uh, Lee's team who are tonight's happy bunnies, having run away with it 8 6. Mm -hmm. Just give it. Just give it. We leave you with the news that people are more likely to lie to you in emails than when talking to you face to face, which rather suggests that the Nigerian brigadier Mutubu Onkamawi, who is due to be transferring $84 million into my bank account any day now, may not be a man of his word. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>
propping up the bar, it's Danny Baker! And their team captain, David Mitchell! But first, ignore local planning permission and raise the roof for your host, Angus Deaton! Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the show in which our guests are called upon to lie and deceive deliberately despite none of them having the necessary political or journalistic training. In some ways, uh, lies are like Take That. They come in all shapes and sizes, but like Take That, they can also come back and haunt us years later. <laughs> and lying is the number one reason that relationships fail, that and putting a delicate wool wash on at 60 degrees. And it has been known for suspected liars to have to prove their innocence by carrying a red-hot iron bar in their bare hands for nine paces. But enough about round two. Let's concentrate on our first round home truths in which panellists read out a statement from the cards in front of them and the opposing team seek to establish whether it's the truth or a filthy lie. As ever, they'd like me to point out they've no idea what's written on the cards at this moment, by which I think they mean don't blame them if they cock it up. <laughs> Anton has been chosen as the first to boldly go. I recently helped Bruce Forsyth hang a picture in his bathroom. <laughs> what, what was it a picture of? It was uh, a picture of everybody in uh, this year's series of Strictly Come Dancing. So all the contestants, all the pros, uh, all the judges, and Bruce and Tess. Did you do the adjustments and he was just stood behind going, Hiya. <laughs> <laughs> the producers of, of the show had this and they asked me if I would drop it round. So I took it along and I hung it in his bathroom for it, then we popped off and had a round of golf. What's Bruce Forsyth's bathroom actually like? Well, quite large, really. I mean, it's not dissimilar to this area here. It's... Well, the whole... It's... Angus Deacon yeah. sitting on the toilet! <laughs> <laughs> the thing about all bathrooms, I mean, well, all the bathrooms I've been in, there is actually... There's never usually a big space for a picture, is there? There used to tend to be, like, lots of mirrors and cabinets, and I'm picturing Brucey having lots of cabinets full of... lotions. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly for the barmaid, you know what I mean? Exactly. So... Just, just varnish. What's <laughs> I can't listen to this any longer. <laughs> this is Bruce Forsyth you're talking about. This is whereabouts is the house? Just give us the rough area. We don't want another street or the number. Well, it's uh, over by uh, Wentworth. By Wentworth, is it? The golf club. Okay. Is, it, is it tastefully furnished? It's beautifully furnished. Well, it bloody it? sounds tacky to me, what you've described so far. <laughs> He's got a picture of himself in the bathroom going... <laughs> <laughs> Lee's team. What do you think, Michael? To kill him! <laughs> 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 Turn into Caligula! It was straight! <laughs> um, well, I, I, what do you think, Russell? I, th I think it's a lie. I, I suspect it's a lie. I think Russell. it's a lie. a lie. Yeah. They're all unanimously saying lie, so, Anton, reveal all. Well, alas, it's a lie. Ah. It is a lie. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm fine. Yeah. Yep, it is a lie. Uh, Anton did not help Bruce Forsyth hang a picture in his bathroom. Bruce only has one picture in his house, and that's a painting in the loft that remains youthful whilst Bruce gets older and older. <laughs> uh, so, Russell, your astounding fact, please. I was Argos Nationwide Employee of the Year 1997. <laughs> a few people applauding. Congratulations, yeah. Russell. <laughs> and how long were you an employee of Argos? I was there for three years. How old were you at the time? I was 17 in 1997. Right. Uh -huh. so what, what do you think you were particularly good at? Why do you think you won the award? Uh, just going, yes, I'll get that for you, and getting it. <laughs> <laughs> you were national employee. Apparently there was, there was yeah. It so was... there must have been some sort of, with a rounds and a final, I mean, how, how did they, how did they analyse that your, your performance was so much better than, than the, your uh, was, Do you know how they do it? It was an Argos factor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Cowell going, you're rubbish! <laughs> What's, what's sad about it is that each store puts forward their kind of young employee of the year and then yeah. they have a mystery shopper come round and you, you sort of know the time period they're going to arrive. So you're kind of on your toes, you know, making but sure... Again, just, right. just there, yeah. just one yeah. like customer. So were you at school for some of that? It was a college. Yeah, oh, right, so it was like a part-time job. For yeah. Some, yeah. Yeah. So the employee of the year was part-time. Part -time. <laughs> 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 on the basis good. that he's not there long enough to oh. do as many fuck-ups as anybody else. <laughs> 
I have to say, the thing that I, I wasn't buying it at all, but the sending a mystery shop around <laughs> that <laughs> actually seems that seems like quite a plausible system. It seems plausible. Yeah, but, it, but you, um, you seem quite pleased with that yourself. So you think it's a lie? I'm suspecting it's a lie. Well, I'm going to go with my team and You're say it's a lie. It's a lie. Okay, it's Russell. Lie. It's a lie. <laughs> Yep, it's a lie. Russell did not win Argos Nationwide Employee of the Year, 1997. <laughs> uh, strangely, the one thing they don't sell in Argos is really short pens. <laughs> uh, Michael, you're next up. I used to share a house with Sue Lawley. All right. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, where, where, what, what period of your career was this? Oh, very early on. Very right. Early on. You were just housemates. You weren't in a relationship. That's a rather intrusive question, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, you don't have to answer it. Well, no, but no, no, but no, it would no, be... no. I think the answer would interest people. Well, I... <laughs> particularly if it's I yes. Need... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I need to clarify this. We were in the same house, but not in the same relationship. Right. Okay. I was frightened to death of her, actually. And were you, were you the only two? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, there were several other people. Other newsreaders. <laughs> uh... Trevor McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Every time the chime went to ten o'clock, they all looked up. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and where was this? Uh, it was um, in Cardiff. And the house number? Uh, I can't remember, I'm afraid. Oh. Do you remember all your house oh. I'm trying to be honest here. I think the phrase, I'm trying to be honest here, could be overused in this game. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we, uh, but, um, <laughs> so why were you and Sue Lawley both based in Cardiff? We were both trainee reporters on the same newspaper. Uh, which newspaper? It was the South Wales, South Wales Echo. Can I ask, if we produce Sue now, and we're not going to, and we said, what is the one big story that both of you would say, yeah, yeah. classic night, what would it have been? No, actually, I seem to remember that, um, uh, that somebody caught a sturgeon. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Somebody caught a sturgeon in the Bristol yeah. Channel. Whoever it was gave it to the newspaper, uh, and, uh, and Sue cooked it for dinner at the house. And we all How had a dinner not? party eating this sturgeon. Well, why did you well, get it? Well, we were it? working on the newspaper, you see, and whoever wanted publicity or so. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Come on. Well, what? it's sturgeon night. I mean, I remember <laughs> the details of every sturgeon-based anecdote in my armoury. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, yes. I, I don't thinking? know. It was the door number thing that threw me. Knowing this story <laughs> might be in the offing. <laughs> well, what do you think? Well, I tell you, a year and a half of Sue Lawley and nothing went on. You, you, you well, can't believe you that. I can't believe it, I'm afraid. You think yeah. she'd have jumped him at some stage? Uh, something's <laughs> <about it. laughs> Yeah, I'll. I'll, I'll yeah. yeah I'm so we, <laughs> we, think, we think it's a lie. They're saying it is a lie. Michael, time to come clean. It's all true. <laughs> it's all <absolutely> true. <laughs> nice work. Yes, it was, uh, it was true. Uh, wow. Michael did uh, once share a house with Sue Lawley. Uh, they used to sit down together to watch 9 o'clock news and if there was a long pause at the top of the show, one of them would realise they were in the wrong place. <laughs> and so, with all the vitality of a taxidermist display cabinet, we come to round two, Ring of Truth. It's my job to furnish the panellists with some celebrity facts and it's their job to establish whether or not those facts are true. First, those dreaded words, it's Alan Titchmarsh. <laughs> Wonderful thing to be a healthy grown up busy busy bee. Toy with the tulips, tasting every type, building up the honeycomb that looks like tripe. I'd like to be a busy little bee, being just as busy as a bee can be. Fly all round the wild hedge row, stinging Jeffrey Smith upon his parson's nose. Bzz, 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 honeybee, honey, bzz, if you like, don't sting me. Bzz, 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 honeybee, honey, bzz, if you like, but don't sting me. <laughs> Is that a proper program? Yeah. <laughs> it was actually broadcast. Yeah, really. Was, uh, what was for what? Well, it was, yes. it was part of Shit Week. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the related fact: Alan Titchmarsh's waxwork at Madame Two Swords gets kissed so often that it has to have the lipstick washed from its face twice a week. Yeah. But since Alan moved to Scotland, he can only get there once a week, so they don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> um, I don't yeah. believe people rush up and kiss Alan Titchmarsh. Do you reckon he ever just goes there and stands still? <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, the idea that people walk up and kiss the statues rather than have their photo took. However, 
you wouldn't be intimidated by a waxwork of Alan Titchmarsh. I think you mm. would walk up and get matey, probably do that, kiss his cheek. Yes, sir. I think there might be something yeah. in this. I also imagine that the people who want to kiss Alan Titchmarsh <laughs> might wear quite a lot of lipstick. You yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what exactly are you saying? <laughs> I was imagining sort of, you know, powdery old ladies with, you know, <laughs> oh, hideously <I> misapplied. <laughs> <laughs> Reeking of lavender and gin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and mumbling to themselves, busy bee, busy bee, yeah. busy, busy, busy. <laughs> The Queen did say about Alan Titchmarsh, uh, you've given a lot of ladies a lot of pleasure. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> she has got a it... filthy sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm, I think I'm moving towards believing this. I'm moving towards believing, believing. I'm saying yes. I, I'll go with you, cos you are captain. Yes, OK. I, I, it's I, almost I think it's true. Well, we think it's true. They're saying it's true, and I can tell you it is absolutely true. Oh, oh, God, it's true. <laughs> yes, it is true. Uh, Alan Titchmarsh's waxwork figure uh, does have lipstick washed from its face twice a week. Likewise, the Kylie Minogue figure has to be washed twice a week, ironically by Jason Donovan, who works there part-time as a cleaner. <laughs> also, every week, James Blunt's figure has to have the dents beaten out of it. <laughs> And Michael Jackson's waxwork has been melted down and now looks exactly like him. <laughs> so a cursory glance at the score is enough to remind us that it's Lee's team who seem to be holding all the cards, leading as they do, 4-2. Yes. Our next round goes by the unfinished title of This Is My, in which Lee's team will each claim to have a connection with our mystery guest and David's team take it upon themselves to find out who's telling the truth. Three possibilities, two lies, one truth and no option but to plough on. Uh, this week, no fewer than two guests, so please welcome tonight's uh, special guest people, Chris and Jill. <laughs> So, Russell, what are Chris and Jill to you? Uh, this is Chris and Jill. I interviewed them on my radio show uh, because they claimed that they were abducted by aliens. <laughs> Michael, perhaps you'd like to tell us how you know Chris and Jill. This is Chris and um, J uh, Jill, who are... <laughs> <laughs> who are um, fellow members of the Guildford Walking and Dining Club. And finally, Lee, your relationship with Chris and Jill. This is Chris and Jill. They once helped me dispose of a dead body after I killed a man in a car park. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, just trying to add a bit of spice to proceedings. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is Chris and Jill, and right. uh, I once slept in their shed for a whole summer. So there you have it, some abducted radio fans, according to Russell, some rambling diners, according to Michael, or Lee's personal shed landlords. David. This absurdity about uh, alien abduction. Well, they claimed it. That's why we interviewed them. What was the story they told you? Um, we read it in the Autumn Gazette and then we interviewed them because apparently they, they met some guy called Zargon, I think. This is about a year ago. And Zargon won... Zargon. He was upset. No, Zargon. 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 <laughs> it's their story, I'm relating it, Joe, should yeah, okay. the And the... It the, may the... be their story, you're relating <laughs> it, but it, but, it, but it may also <laughs> be bullshit you're thinking no, up now. No, so, <laughs> no, no. Zargon no, work at Argon. No, he doesn't. <laughs> But this is where it gets very, very bizarre, because Zargon started asking her what this was, pointing at a wheelie bin, and Jill <laughs> had to explain what a wheelie bin was, which she did very well. And then they woke up, they woke up in a skip the next day. <laughs> where, did he, where did they meet Zargon? I did suggest that maybe they got drunk and woken up at a fancy dress party, yeah. but uh, they, they declined that. Apparently, they went to his ship, which looked that a bit like, and I quote, uh, a Yates's wine lodge, but full of aliens. <laughs> Where were they when the ship abducted them? Just outside Coventry. <laughs> were, were, they, were they in the car? They were briefly in the car before they were sucked out of it. <laughs> so they're driving the car, they get sucked out of their car. Yeah. They're thinking, what the hell's going on? The car is rudderless, carrying on <laughs> the Coventry bypass. So then there they are in the Yates's wine bar with all the other aliens. <laughs> I'm sorry, David, but what part of this story doesn't add up? <laughs> it's their story, and what a story it is. Um, so maybe you'd like to talk to Michael now. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, again, the, these people you know from...? From Guildford. Uh, Chris is the uh, Edmund Hillary of, uh, of the home counties. And, uh, and Jill is the Delia Smith of the outfit. Yeah. And, and it is a, a rambling and dining Walking society. and dining. Guildford, you... walking and dining. Which, which bit of this don't you understand? <laughs> we can go out for a walk and then we go and dine. And you, and you go around someone's house to dine? You don't go to a restaurant? Yes, we do. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what's happened the, the most recent meeting? Where did you walk? 
Whose house did you eat at? What did you have? Um, well, it was uh, actually yesterday. Right. Yep. And where was the walk? Uh, it was it was in Surrey, uh, near near Guildford. It was uh, Leatherhead. Leatherhead. Who was the who was hosting the dinner? Zargon. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not our house, and uh, not Chris or Jill's house, but another uh, couple. Can in you the group. bother to make up the name of two people? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is far too plausible. Yeah, but you haven't, you haven't, you haven't even finished the story yet. Go it's on, a big swingers then? thing and they all get together. <laughs> <laughs> they're not blushing, they're not blushing. What was the shed scenario, Lee? <laughs> it's a thing really... that poor people have in the garden <laughs> to put tools in. <laughs> I know what a shed is. Oh, I see. Sorry. Uh, why were you sleeping in a shed? Well, it's a good question, David. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was... It's when I first came to London and, uh, a friend of mine who lived in London uh, I introduced me to Chris and Jill. I slept in the... In, I rented a room off them, a uh, spare room, and they had renovations done, so I had to leave. And I, I was desperate, and we came up with this ingenious plan where I would sleep in the shed. When you say shed, you mean like a proper one you see in a garden centre, or is this just a... No, this was... It was covers, well, yeah, was. no, it was It wasn't... Uh, it was a proper shed. It wasn't, you know, insulated or, or any of that. It didn't have any electrics, any plumbing or anything. These good people... Uh, don't look like the kind who would tolerate someone living out in the shed. They look like the kind of people who look at each other and go, we can't have that, we can't have that, we'll put him up at our sissies. Yeah, but you say that, they don't let that look deceive you. I mean, because they also once helped me bury a man that I killed in a garden. There is that. I must say, I'm, I'm finding the most plausible story at the moment to be leave. Absolutely. There are definitely people in the world who think they've been abducted by aliens. Mm. Radio stations certainly would get in touch with them and try and sort of yeah. exploit their muddle We had a fantastic Sunday, great Sunday. Um, but I think the story would be less... Uh, Insane. Uh, what sort of, and, and, uh, yeah. it's, it's, their it's their story. Don't mock them. They're good people. They just had a tricky I'm, I weekend. I know. I'm in a situation <laughs> where if it turns out it is your story, I have, by, you know, accident, sort of mocked them. Yeah. And I apologise for that in advance, if that is the case. However, I don't believe aliens exist, and there's no getting around the fact that if that is the story, I, I think, you, you, you know, you are a bit wrong about that. <laughs> All right, we need an answer. So, David's team. Uh, are these people Russell's radio abductees? Are they Michael's rambling dining companions or Lee's shed providers? Anton, what do you reckon? I think I'm going for Lee's shed. Yeah, I think, I think the shed... Because I think yeah, the rambling somehow. society is obviously very plausible, but it's so very plausible. Well, it, yeah, we'll yeah, go with Lee. Lee. Yeah. Right, they're saying it's Lee's. So, uh, well, perhaps Chris and Jill would like to tell us who they really are. We are, in fact, uh, companions of Michael's in walking and dining. Ah. Ah. <laughs> so, congratulations uh, to them. Uh, yes, uh, Chris and Jill are indeed uh, Michael's <laughs> walking and dining friends. Sometimes reading the news just isn't exciting enough. <laughs> So, at the end of that round, uh, well, it appears to be David's team uh, who are struggling to make an impression, trailing as they are, 5-2. Not a moment too soon, we come to the final round, Quick Fire Lies, in which our panellists lie not only through their teeth, but against the clock. Uh, again, they don't know whether they're going to be reading out a true fact about themselves or a made-up lie that they've never seen before. Uh, plus, they may also be suddenly given a possession in this round, which they will have to claim is theirs and may go some way to explaining the general air of panic. Uh, David's team are behind, so need to get even, not mad, starting with <coughs> Lee. My parents had to change my name to Lee because I couldn't pronounce my real name properly. <laughs> what was your real name? Don't, my make, real, don't make him force My real so name, <laughs> my real name, I was actually christened Leo. Now, I know what you're thinking, why can't I pronounce Leo? But I was so... I don't know what it was, but I had a slight speech impediment. Well, and, what, uh, what speech impediment? Speech impediment where you can't say O's. o's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was it, awful. It, Lee could never convey surprise. The thing is... <laughs> I, I had a very... I had a very weird speech impediment. It was, uh, right. I couldn't it's stop. So I used to say, Leo. <laughs> <laughs> and it used to go on for a long time, so they got a bit sick of it. At what age did they, you know, say, oh, he's never going to learn? <laughs> you know, well, he's two, was, he can't even say his name. It was about the age of, about the age of, uh, about four, something like that. They, they, because they used to call me Lee anyway, they used to abbreviate Leo, and they said, you know what, let's just leave it at Lee. Well, why would they do that, though, keep it at Lee? Yeah. And why at the, you're Maybe if we knock team. off a syllable, he'll stop there. I mean, he might have got no. Lee. Lee. <laughs> Which, in a way, is worse. He's even more boring than Leo. <laughs> <laughs> well, P.G. Woodhouse was known as Plum all his life because his name's Pelham. And when he was little, he couldn't say it. So there is precedent. 
And you're quite like P.G. Woodhouse in lots of other ways. <laughs> 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 well, I can't buy this because I don't think parents would change... Will you? No, I, th say, I oh, think at the age of four they'd go, oh, he'll learn. We wanted to call him Leo. So, uh, uh, I, I think it's a uh, no. We don't believe think? Uh, Alas. Yeah. Uh, alas, um, I think Lee is enough. Yeah, we, <laughs> think, we think it's a lie. It's a unanimous lie. Mm -hmm. Lee, tell us, truth or lie? It's a lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is a lie. Uh, Lee's parents did not change his name because he couldn't pronounce his real name properly. It's difficult uh, when you're stuck with an embarrassing name from your parents, uh, which is why Fifi Trixabel Geldof now refers to herself as Fifi Trixabel Smith. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, <coughs> Michael. Ah. Uh, it says possession here. So open right. your box and tell us what's in it. Ah, here we are. Oh, it's a dead body. <laughs> 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 uh, this is an ashtray that I stole from 10 Downing Street. Ah. <laughs> an audible gasp. Where did you secrete it? I put it in my raincoat pocket, actually, uh, because you, you can get to the cloakroom. Um, you know, during the whole, I, I'd had, a, I have to say, a couple of drinks, and, uh, and I popped it in the. You know, I got a raincoat with quite big pockets. They don't, like... they don't search you when you go out. Is there oh. anything, anything on it that identifies it as Ten Downing Street? Don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Which prime minister were you uh, stealing Tony it from? Uh, Tony Blair. Oh, oh, sure. oh well, who knows? Oh, forget it. Yeah. Who knows how you could have changed history? Shall we go to war, Sherry, or not? I'll have a cigar and think about it. No ashtray! We'll go to war! <laughs> That's what you did. <laughs> That's the consequences. Are, are you proud of what you did? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I do feel very guilty about it. But actually, it <laughs> yes, wasn't... you show it off on television. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would have if you pie-eyed on a bus, just go, psst. <laughs> it's Tony Blair's, and people go, is it, mate? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Is it, have you had it valued? I do like the idea of Michael turning up on the Antique Road show and going, yeah. could you value this, Michael? <laughs> it's a wonderful piece. Where did you get it? I robbed it from 10 Downing Street. <laughs> do you normally nick stuff? <laughs> it was. <laughs> Archbishop Tutu, at the end of your interview, said, my cross, it was here, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> actually, you are dressed quite like a jewel thief. As <laughs> <so>. <laughs> the lights yeah. suddenly go off. What are you thinking, David? What do you think? Well, I'm, I, I think he, I think it's the truth. I don't, I don't I have to say, it doesn't look to me like it's hugely valuable, but I think it's kind of substantial enough that it could have been in 10 Downing Street. Um, uh, David, well, an answer. you think it's true? Well, I think it's true. You think well, it's... I don't think it's true. It's your right, right, so, Michael, I, I think it's a lie. <laughs> He's saying it's a lie. Michael, reveal all. It's a lie. Oh, oh, yeah. It's a lie. Well done, Captain. It's a lie. Michael did not steal an ashtray from 10 Downing Street. He couldn't, as his pockets were too full of the Woolworths pick and mix he'd lifted earlier on. <laughs> uh, next, <laughs> Anton. I was a teenage boxer. Ah. <laughs> but I quit because I had a mouth ulcer. <laughs> where did you box? In Seven Oaks, where I lived. A school or, or no, a, a in a, boxing in a, club? No, in a boxing club. What was the club called? It was called Seven Oaks Boxing Club. <laughs> That's very handy. So, what was. Um, are you a boxing fan then? Yes, I am. Still actually. are, yeah? Yeah. So, what, can you tell me the, the name of a couple of moves? <laughs> there's you, there's that familiar. The, the punch. punch. Yeah, there's that familiar <laughs> thing. <laughs> called the right handed punch. Anton. Hang on, hang on. Anton. The right handed punch, yeah. Anymore? And there's that other one. It's a very nifty move. It's, it's not the left handed, -handed punch, punch, is it? Yeah. <laughs> what was your boxing nickname? I was. Anton the Killer. <laughs> Dubeck. <laughs> Did you at this time have an interest in ballroom dancing? It was about the same time I started ballroom dancing. Wow, the same time? About, I used to do boxing on a Tuesday night and ballroom dancing on a I Wednesday night. I'll tell you what, night. those other boxers must have been quaking in their boots. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, not the ballroom dancer! Yeah, in fairness, they'd never Absolutely. catch it if you started tangoing around the ring. That would be brilliant. <laughs> you just oh. grab hold of them in a clinch and sort of move them oh, round. I'm leading! I'm leading! I'm leading. <laughs> Who are your boxing heroes? Um, my boxing heroes... Wayne Sleep, Rudolf Nureyev, the whole... <laughs> <laughs> you're quite an all-rounder, weren't you? Because you're good at football as well. I was good at football, yeah. I played for the county. And why did you give age. up that? A Veruca? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've just got an image of you now dancing with one of the celebrities, going like that all suave and going, 
I get a lot of mouth ulcers, man. <laughs> when I was a boy, I grew out of it, really. really? I'm all right now, ladies. So, Lee, <laughs> do you believe Anton? I reckon that's true. Well, I think it's true. Yeah. OK, well, well, we'll go with true. OK, they're saying it's true. Anton, gospel or garbage? Anton the killer. Do his true. Ah, it is true. true. <laughs> yes, it is. Next. <clears throat> Danny. I won a jukebox off Viddy Jones in a game of poker. Where did this take place? It was actually within the BBC. I used to do a football show called 606. And Viddy turned up, and if you know Viddy Jones, you end up either hunting, doing uh, that thing with the uh, clay pigeon shooting, That's or right. playing cards with him. And uh, so I fell into a game of cards, and I don't play cards very well, but absolutely thrashed him. I've no idea about poker, let me say that. None. Oh, that's I... handy for this inquisition, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Got that in quick, didn't I you? Don't, no, no, I don't, I don't, I used to call it well, 21. You must remember the hand that you had when you won, you won the, the... Yes, the I do remember the hand that I had, what and was it was it? two queens. What did he have that you beat? I've no idea. I cannot remember that. I'd like to say I could. But the fact is, he said, I'll tell you what I'll play for. You like music, don't you? I've had a jukebox given to me for some promotion he was doing. I don't want it. And uh, so he said, I'll have it. And it became a running joke on the show, if any of you remember it. Oh, I do not. remember. I used to listen to the show a lot and don't remember that running joke. <laughs> <laughs> have you still got it? No, I haven't. A brother-in-law has got it in an arch over at Nun Head. What arch are you it's talking about? It's an arch. About? It's their workplace. In railway arches in London, loads of people work in, within them. Oh, so it's on the railway track above the arch? No, 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 in the arch. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever heard the phrase, it's in the arch. Lee, the, the, one of the advantages of language is you don't have to have heard the whole phrase yeah. recently <laughs> to be able to define its meaning. What type of jukebox is it? It's not a Wurlitzer, it's not a Rockola. Is it an Ami 1959 J Selection 200? Cos that's what I've got. Have you, have you really? Oh, lovely stuff. Yeah, I won it off Paul Gascoigne in a game of Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Lee, is this sounding plausible? I, I think it's true, but I find Danny so charming, I can listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of unessential detail there, isn't it? Don't you think? If it was anybody else, I would say it's definitely a lie. But there's something about Danny Baker which stinks of the truth. <laughs> Michael saying it's a lie, you're saying it's the truth. I'm going to go for uh, age over youth. And uh, I'm going to say that that is, in fact, a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie. Danny, what is the truth? Well, we could get a cab to Nun Head and I couldn't show it to you. It's a lie. Yes, it is a lie. Danny did not win a jukebox off Vinnie Jones in a game of poker. Vinnie must be great at poker, since, as proven by all his films he's been in, his face betrays no emotion whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which uh, joyless buzzing sound means at the end of tonight's show, it's Lee's team, who are this week's demigods, having lorded Yay. over David's team 7-6. So, overnight stardom to our winners, instant obscurity for our losers, and we leave you with a reminder that some of the most common lies that people tell are sex-related. The three most popular being, I'll still respect you, no, I don't fancy your mother, and yes, of course, I've got the keys to those handcuffs. Good night. <laughs>
Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the show that has all the honesty of a GMTV phone-in. Uh, <laughs> these days we sometimes say that lying is being economical with the truth, although being generous with the bullshit is another way of putting it. <laughs> uh, some have built careers on being brutally honest, like Simon Cowell, for example, so likely signs that someone's telling the truth would be if they pull their trousers up to their man breasts and have their <laughs> hair cut by the council. <laughs> Which brings us to our first round, Home Truths, in which one of our panellists reads out a statement about themselves and the other team applies these sort of dubious decision-making skills that's led them to appearing on this show to establish if it's true or not. Remember, as they turn over the card, the panellists have no idea whether they'll be confronted with a familiar home truth or a brand new lie, as Shane will now prove. Oh, Shane, OK. Shock us all. Here we go. I missed a visit from George Michael because I was eating at a harvester. <laughs> right, truth or lie, Lee's team. Mm. Can, can you uh, slightly expand on that story? No, what it was, um, it was about three years ago, and I think it was a, a I think George Michael was going to be paying a visit to Albert Square. I wasn't there because I was having an unlimited salad and a free bread roll. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be confused with Toby Carvery, because you don't get an unlimited salad there. Um, and I missed his visit. Yeah, I honestly thought Toby Carvery was one of the actors in EastEnders. Am I getting confused? They're <laughs> thinking Todd Carty. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was he visiting for? To be honest, I think he was celebrating his 40th birthday. What, by visiting by Albert, Albert Square? Square. <laughs> no, he, he was a big fan of the show. And he was hoping to come and meet uh, Cat and Alfie, of course, and Jesse was there who played Cat, and I wasn't there that day. Did he definitely visit Albert Square? Or was he just like driving around off his face, parked the car? Yeah, exactly. He <laughs> used it with Hampstead. Yeah, yeah. No, he might have been off his face when he made the appointment and then decided that he ought to honour it. Yeah. <laughs> Lee, I'm going to have to push you for an answer. I think he's telling the truth. I can see George Michael getting a you know, big fat spliff, go to Albert Square, him going to Harvester, <laughs> and off we go. Oh. I'm actually surprised you've heard of Harvester Tower, to be honest. I'm just pretending I know what it is. <laughs> But you are the team captain, Lee, so what's your decision? I, I think that could be true, actually, cos uh, Shane's like... In, in the nicest possible <laughs> way, you'd like the kind of bloke that would eat at Harvester. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean that in a nice way. I would, you would, <laughs> David wouldn't, would he? I have been to a Harvester. Yes. Have you, eaten? <laughs> <laughs> you went as an experiment. <laughs> you didn't go for lunch, you sort of went... It'd be like going to the zoo for you, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, I had lunch there. OK. Right. And, you know, Unlimited sorry salad. if that doesn't, you know, conform to your views of me as some kind of... You scientist duke bastard. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I, I think, what do you think, Rhys? I think, well, I think it's true, actually. Well, they're yeah, we all, all saying true. true. We'll go for true. OK, they're saying true. Shane, put us out of our misery. Uh, it is, in fact, true! Yeah! <laughs> well done. Love it. Uh, congratulations, it is true. Uh, Shane did miss a visit from George Michael because he was eating in a harvester. Uh, last year, George Michael was found off his face on drugs, slumped in a car in Hyde Park. It's come to something when exposing yourself in a public toilet was the good old days. <laughs> so, our next revelation, Reese. My bed used to belong to John Nettles. <laughs> from Bergerac. From but that John And Nettles, from uh, right. Midsummer Murder. Where did you get the bed? From John, Nettles. from John Nettles. Oh, no, how? What, did, you, did, you, did, you, did you come round to the house and say, listen, oh, you don't I, know I, me? I but... actually ordered it. I, for fun, I got lots of famous, famous detectives' uh, items from uh, eBay. So I got John Nettles' bed. Yeah. I got uh, Morse's uh, you know, <laughs> foot, foot spa. <laughs> I got, um, got tag, Taggart's death certificate. Didn't get it. No, didn't get it. <laughs> I know this is a lie because. Only yesterday, I was on the on eBay looking for Poirot's tumble dryer, <laughs> and I couldn't find I anyone, it. any detective stuff anywhere. I got him. It's because I got him. Do you sleep? Right. You sleep in, or is it in John Nettles' in... bed? Yeah, uh, I think this one dated from about 1987, when Bergerac, when he was uh, in Jersey. In <laughs> right. Uh -huh. So, he, so is this, um... a, is, this, <laughs> is this a prop bed? So it's not John Nettles' bed. No, no. It's Bergerac's mm. bed. Yes, Bergerac's bed. There so it's slightly wrong. I, I, Nettles has never spent a it's night getting in out it. of it now. Right. right, David, I'm going to have to push you for an answer. It's a lie. It's a lie. They're saying it's a lie, Reese. It is a lie. <laughs> Yes, it's a lie. Reese's bed did not once belong to Bergerac star John Nettles, although his bed has lots in common with Bergerac. It's wooden, it sags in the middle, and no sooner have you got into it, then you start to drop off. <laughs> <laughs> so, our next revelation. Vic, reveal all, if you would. Oh, yes, of course I can. I have patented a device that stops cats jumping on your lap. <laughs> what kind of device? 
Uh, it's a well. Ah. What it is? It's, it's a spring yes. which you attach to your John Dory with a platform on it, <laughs> and if, if cats jump on it, then they immediately spring off. <laughs> so, for instance, if you're I'm watching thinking. TV, listening to the radio, and you don't want a cat on your lap, which is quite often the case, <laughs> the, the platform springs it straight off. How do you paint in something? So if I want to go about painting something I've made... You write... Yeah. You, you send a letter in blood to the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> so what did and when you it gets it? It, a stamp sent back by the winged messenger, you know you're patented. <laughs> What's the name of the product? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, that's actually got a name, to be honest. Is it named Well, then pending? how can you paint it? You yeah. don't need to. It's just said the thing that th throws cats <laughs> off your lap. And when the Queen heard about it, she was on it like a shot. <laughs> <laughs> that's on the, on the device me. or on the... <laughs> <laughs> Does it come in a box? Well, it actually device. hasn't been... To be honest, it hasn't... It's not out been, yet. I, I, sent, I sent it off and it hasn't been patented. Oh, so the bit where you said you patented it. Patented, yes, but pat pending. Oh, it's pending. Okay. I've got a lot of things that are pat pending. My eel tube. <laughs> <laughs> What's an eel tube? Uh, well, an eel tube is... So, it's basically, it's a, a cardboard tube like that that you can... You, so you put the eel down one end <laughs> and the, the amazing thing is... Yeah. It comes out the other end. <laughs> brilliant. And that's, that's the brilliant part. Right. Is that Pat pending? Pat hasn't replied yet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what are you veering towards? What do you think, Tara? I'm okay. going to just say whatever you say. Oh, OK. <laughs> Take all your clothes off. <laughs> well, I think it's a lie. I think it's a lie. It's a lie, do you lie. think? What do you think, Ruth? Terrible lie. A terrible okay, lie. Not even saying it's not just a lie, lie, but it's a terrible lie. Yes. <laughs> Tell us immediately. It's a lie. Yay! It's a terrible lie. It is a terrible lie. Uh, Vic has never patented a device that stops cats jumping on your lap. In fact, there already is a patented device to stop cats jumping on your lap. It's called a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and so, with all the serenity of a beached whale, we move on to round two, the Ring of Truth, in which I liberally throw out top draw celebrity uh, trivia for the panellists to declare if the fact has the whiff of truth or the grim odour of falsehood. Lee's team, some Blue Peter action for you. Think of rabbits, and most people think of carrots. Think of carrots, and most people think of food. Until now, because for one group of children from West Hampstead in London, the common carrot, not to mention the plain old parsnip, has found a new use. And what a turnip for the books it is! No. Yes, yeah, a hark back to the great recorder shortage of 1996. <laughs> to the days when we made our own entertainment, and it was shite. <laughs> uh, incidentally, any viewers wondering about the name of that vegetable, it was Katie Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so unfair, she's delightful. Uh, so here's the fascinating fact then for Lee and co. Uh, Sting has recorded an album uh, using only vegetables for instruments. It's called The Sound of the Ground. <laughs> or has he? So, are we trying to say if it's true or not? Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We're halfway through and you've got the rules. <laughs> um, what are his favourite vegetables that he used? Uh, the xylophone that's was the one. That's, that's not a vegetable, that's an That's not a vegetable, isn't it? Is it? <laughs> Caught you out. <laughs> the xylophone was made out of root vegetables, for example, carrots and parsnips. And you're trying to convince us that if you hit a carrot or a parsnip, it sounds like a xylophone. There are wood xylophones. But it is the kind of thing Sting yeah, wood's a hard, very solid thing. I mean, a carrot's a bit more... Got a bit, got a bit more give in it. <laughs> oh, you love a bit of carrot. <laughs> <laughs> I can believe that if you stick a thing in the end and blow a carrot, it'll make a tune. But I can't believe you can make a xylophone out of root vegetables. Yes, but I can completely believe that someone such as Sting would go and do something so earthy like yeah. that. That's exactly why Sting, a ref any reference to Sting, is fundamentally unfair in a game like this. It's about you lying. Think, yeah. You can believe anything of Sting. Exactly. But Sting was what the kind of person we had Stalin for. <laughs> <laughs> Who also, incidentally, made up his own name. <laughs> but, um, 
so I just sort of feel, I kind of feel, I don't think we need, should, need to engage with Sting. You know, we should say, no, no, no more Sting questions, because it's impossible to judge. Uh, Lee, what is your considered opinion? <laughs> false. Ruth, do you false, think it's false, false or true? You think it's false? Really? Yes, yeah. really. I do think it's kind of true. One true, one false. Which way are you going to go? OK, go, I'm going to say that's true. He's Great. saying it's true and it is indeed a lie. Oh! <laughs> yes, it's a lie. Sting has never recorded an album using only vegetables, but he has released an album that he claimed was a songs that were from the 16th century. Now, these included Standeth's Not So Close To Me and Message In A Flagon. <laughs> <laughs> so, to David's team, who have this to ponder, Al Gore can hypnotise chickens. <laughs> Is this gospel or garbage? Uh, well, I imagine hypnotising chickens is quite easy, as hypnotising animals goes. Because the chickens are quite stupid. You'll probably get them transfixed on, on something <laughs> dangly, shiny bit of metal quite easily. And, and who's to say whether they're really hypnotised? Actually, they look quite vacant, even <laughs> when they're, you know, totally... I mean, in a way, how much can you say that a chicken is ever in full possession of its faculties? <laughs> Rare. Well, at what point, at what point... Would Al Gore, who at one point was on the verge of becoming a world leader, would sit down and go, Hey, honey, guess what I can do? I can hypnotise chickens. <laughs> how, what, what, what do you, how do you find that out? Well, it'd be a bit of fun for him on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you can hypnotise chickens, I've done it, and I've hypnotised cattle as well, with chalk. With draw chalk? A line in front of them, draw a line down, they follow it, and they get, and they get mesmerised, but the, their eyes follow it. And they, they don't know where to go, so they stay there looking at it. Uh, uh, what, is that what? hypnotising or confusing the fuck out of them? <laughs> it's of course it is. He comes from a place where people, you know, spend their lives hypnotising chickens. Uh, David, which way are you tending? I think it's true. No, don't you don't think, think it's true? No, well, I think we go with true. I think. And they're saying it's true, and I can tell you that it is absolutely true. <laughs> yes. Al Gore can hypnotise chickens. Al swings a watch back and forth in front of the chickens and in a slow voice repeats, you are in a field in the countryside, not a tiny box in a factory with your legs broken. <laughs> and when Al Gore lost the 2000 election to George Bush, some said it was because voters wanted a stronger right-wing presence, uh, some said it was because the ballot in Florida was fixed, whereas others said they couldn't vote for a man who spent his time fucking around with chickens. <laughs> So at the end of all that, it's David's team who are standing proud, boasting as they do, four points. Oh! <laughs> and so to our next round, This Is My, which, like Paris Hilton's jail time, is barely a sentence. Each of David's team will claim that they are somehow linked to tonight's mystery guest, but only one of them will be telling the truth. So please welcome this week's special guest person, Richard. Uh, so, Shane, uh, uh, what's Richard to you? Uh, Richard's my... <laughs> he's my uh, cousin and he lives down in Cornwall. And this is the first time he's been out of Cornwall. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Uh, Vic, perhaps you'd like to tell us how you know Richard? Um, Richard's my butcher and I'm his official sausage taster. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And finally, David, your relationship with uh, Richard. This is Richard, and he's illustrating my forthcoming children's book, The Lonely Lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. Uh, Cornish cousin, if we believe Shane, a butcher to the stars, according to Vic, or a children's illustrator of David's oh, book. OK, what part of Cornwall are you from? You uh, can't you're... ask him, he can't talk. Oh, OK. I mean, in the rules of the game, but not because okay. he's from Cornwall. Okay. <laughs> yeah, ask it to Shane. Shane, what part of Cornwall is your friend from? Uh, cousin. He's my cousin. Down near uh, Penzance, Lansdowne, a little place called Larkin Grove. What? And he's your cousin? Yeah. Called ha Richard. Yeah. He's called Richard Ritchie. No, my real name's not Richie. What's, What's your, your real name? name? I'm not telling you. It's all in the book, still available, rags to Richie. <laughs> Presumably, from, from the title, yeah, it must be Rags. Rags to Richard. It's a story. Oh, yeah. It's a fantastic story of changing your name by deed pop. <laughs> <laughs> his real name is, 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 is Megan. It's Richard Megan. That's rubbish. Oh. OK. If he's your cousin from Penzance, what does he do in Cornwall? He likes it. Well, I don't know if he's still doing... He used to have a garage down there and he used to look after cars, but I don't know if he does it anymore, cos I've been down there for a while. This, uh, this book, David, could you just tell us a little bit about The Lonely Lighter? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I no, could. It's... Is it autobiographical? <laughs> 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 
bloody hell. That's a, yes. That's a low blow. Yes, it's about, <laughs> it's about a, a desolate building standing alone is finally demolished. <laughs> David, 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 David no, very bright. So it's a positive. You're very bright, but very lonely. Y so yes, it's quite bright. Yeah. Shining my light pointlessly into the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the only way I get any human company is if I turn the light off and people <laughs> crash onto the rocks below me. Uh, no, and other chat up lines from it's, David. It's, it's, not, it's, uh, it's not that. No, it's, it's about. There's a character uh, in the sketch show I do called uh, Sir Digby Chicken Caesar. <laughs> and we've been commissioned to write a series of sort of, well, a kind of illustrated. Storybooks. What was he doing and in the, the first lighthouse? It's going to be called the Lonely Lighthouse. And he's the illustrator to your book. How many chapters are there in your book? Well, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> right. What, how does it end? Well, as I say, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> how does it begin? He hasn't written it yet. Well, if you haven't written it, he clearly hasn't illustrated it. So no, yes. exactly. No, You're out. Guys, going... so the drawings come first, and then he'll make up the story. No, he's, going to, <laughs> he's going to be illustrated. All these things get arranged no, in no, advance. No, no, I want to move back to the sausages. <laughs> <laughs> the butcher one. Okay. Yes. Vic, could Come you tell us more about the sausages? Yes, this is Richard, and I'm his official sausage tester. He makes the sausages, and I test them out. He, he, you know, in the depths of dark, the darkness of the night, he hangs a bag of sausages on yeah, my... Yeah. Doorknob and I. <laughs> take is this, them is in. this extract from the Lonely Lighthouse? <laughs> Where's his butchers? In my village where I live. Which Where's is what? That? We want to know. Charing in Kent. Okay. And, and he's a local. So it, anyway, I, I test the sausages. Uh, it's a very official, um, you know, position to hold. It was before held by the woman on the hill, <laughs> who died of melancholy. <laughs> What's your favourite? He does a good beef and horseradish. But we're going we're gonna to make zebra sausages and uh, alligator snake sausages. The, bl the, the zebra ones will be black and white. One sausage black, one sausage white. Oh, it's like a Paul McCartney song. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so is this person uh, Shane's Cornish cousin, Vic's sausage provider, or <laughs> David's literary illustrator? Well, I, I, I think Vic... Is uh, talking out of his backside. Really? No, I don't. I, well, okay. well, I think the clue. I mean, it might just be me. Call me old-fashioned. Zebra sausage. I mean, <laughs> no, I, I got I, suspicious. I, I don't know what I, it was. I do. I would go with the corner one personally. Okay. So okay. you're veering towards. I'm veering towards David because he did a e e e. Well, the lighthouse. Yes, because he I. He hasn't even written the book. <laughs> well, I believe David would read a book, write a book about lonely lighthouses. <laughs> Do do I think it's definitely Shane Ritchie's cousin. I do too. Yeah. Okay, Lee, well, you're going to uh, have to well, either I mean, overrule or David, go with. They've overruled me, so I'll say uh, it's Shane's cousin. Okay, you're saying it's Shane's cousin. Richard, perhaps you'd like to tell us who you really are. I am Vic's butcher. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, he is. He's Vic's butcher. <laughs> Richard, sorry, sorry. Do you do zebra sausages? We've spoken about it for the last year, haven't we, Richard? We have. You have to yeah. bear in mind that Vic does lead a very, very strange life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us, Richard. Well done. Great. <laughs> yes, Vic and uh, Richard together make the best sausages in Kent. Uh, one of Vic's duties is to trim off the nasty gristle, veins and cartilage and ensure that they all go into the sausages. <laughs> <laughs> Many people get on well with their sausage tasters. Elton John married his. So... <laughs> Check on the score shows Lee's team are starting to look distinctly inadequate. Behind as they are, 5-2. <laughs> <laughs> and so to the round you've all been waiting for, the last one. In this quick-fire game, both teams have uh, more revelations or rubbish to divulge from the as-yet-unseen cards in front of them. Plus, some of our panellists might be asked about an object which they will claim as a personal possession. The other side must then declare the veracity of that claim and also say whether it's true or not. Uh, David's team are what's known in the business as winning, so Lee's team need all the points they can get starting now. David. <laughs> possession. Yes. Ooh. Yes. Uh, right. Ooh. OK, this box contains the only gift I've ever been sent by a fan. <laughs> What is it? What is it? It's some socks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, some, it's some socks with various slogans. What are the slogans? What are the slogans? The slogans are fast cars, birds, 
footy, which I believe is short for football. <laughs> <laughs> beers and curries. <laughs> so, but as do you they can tell, the sent by someone who knows me too. very, very well, mm, yeah. <laughs> that's my whole thing. Sort of thing. Right. <laughs> did you get a letter with it? Yes. What did it say? Uh, Die. <laughs> <laughs> Do not. <laughs> yes. It was a, just a nice, I like your work. Man or woman? Letter. Woman. Did you write back to her and thank her? I didn't, no. You didn't thank her? God, you're so ungrateful. Why, would you write back to a fan? Yeah, I, Why well, I answer all mine. Do you? Do you? Well, you... somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you never wear these? Yeah. Um, well, because they've got um, yes, but fast surely... cars, birds, footy, beers and carriers yeah, but written on them. Surely... And I, I favour socks which have nothing written but on them. But surely the irony could have been fabulous. Where did you get them? Yeah. I think about two years ago. But you do, you end up using, I don't care who you are, you, you, always would, you always need a pair of socks. Two years on, you do need them. Do you know what, really... actually, all my socks seem to have sinisterly worn out at the same time. <laughs> all of them. And now you've got any socks left. Well, <laughs> there you go. That's the yours. Help. That's definitely you, a lie. You can have birds and footy. I'll I, wear them all. I want curries. Shame us. <laughs> actually, I do actually, you do actually like, like curries. <laughs> so, what do you think, Lee? It's a lie, isn't it? Well, I think it's definitely a lie. Okay, lie, lie. Okay, lie. they all say it's a lie. It is, David. in fact, true. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's true. Those socks are the only gift David has ever been sent by a fan. When women threw knickers at Tom Jones, he'd wipe the sweat from his chest and throw them back. David, however, booked a walking holiday in the Cotswolds. <laughs> Next. <coughs> Tara. What? <laughs> <laughs> OK, Ian. Yeah, are you there? Yep, sorry Good. about that. OK. Yep. And Q Tara. I have been shopping in Sainsbury's wearing nothing but a trench coat. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you just want to. See that long it. pause after she said it, where we all went. <laughs> Why did you do this thing? Because um, it was just like a joke with a friend. It was just a silly girl thing we just decided to do about ten did years ago. Did you have ago. any shoes on? Yeah. I mean, I had a trench coat on. It's not like completely offensive. I wasn't going out like Jodie Marsh. <laughs> of course not. No. Um, Is that rude? I mean, quite frankly, I'm. Half the time I go down to the local place in my pyjamas and just buy something, so I can't really so see the big deal. You go to the shop in your pyjamas? <laughs> yeah. Don't say it like it's normal. <laughs> I did it actually today. I put a coat on over the me nighty and go down the shop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's getting worse. You wear a nighty. Yeah. I do, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, this is all uh, fascinating. We um, think this is true. David, do you believe? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is true, okay. yes. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Obviously. Um, next. <coughs> Lee. I once had a full body search at Miami airport after making a joke about Ronald Reagan. <coughs> Firstly, what was the joke? Well, I think joke's an exaggeration. It was more of a comment. Oh, did you say? Oh, a, yeah. I said, I think he's a bit of a, a warmonger, and instead of searching me, you should search your own country for <laughs> more nuclear weapons than Reagan's admitting to. Now, I'd like to point out that I was very drunk after a long flight and right. thought that would arouse at least a tickly smile from the big butch moustached, rubber-gloved lunatic <laughs> that stood before me. But no. How long's the flight? <laughs> Sorry? How long's the flight? Oh, now, you talk to a man who'd had two bottles of scotch. I would say, uh, we, we stopped, actually, halfway. Where'd two minutes. <laughs> halfway? <laughs> <in the Atlantic. laughs> halfway. 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 Halfway at the Ascension Islands, because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually stopped. Uh, I stopped, when I say halfway, I was on a round-the-world trip. <laughs> oh. So where were you flying from? Where were you flying I from? was <laughs> flying from Moscow to Miami. <laughs> I stopped... <laughs> I stopped half... This is true. I stopped halfway in London. I'm saying roughly halfway. After about yeah. four or five hours, I stopped in London. I was doing a short round-the-world trip for about... A short, short trip, trip round the world. I mean, I mean, I mean, interplanetary to Manchester. It's all relative. If you go from Moscow to Miami and you're going round the world, but you, relatively, you went Moscow, it's a short London, trip. London, it's shorter than going round the world. That's the whole trip. I was it's part a... of going round the world. It is. It is. Well, many people's round-the-world trip is... Well, yeah, literally, I went round... I went London to London. I was never... <laughs> went round the world. I sat went there watching movies. I went 
from Moscow to London. And then yeah. London, we Miami. We refuelled, and then I went from London to Miami. To Miami, yes. At which point, I drunk lots of scotch, got off my face, got off the plane at Miami, and a big, butch, mustachioed American stuck his fingers up my rectum. <laughs> now, which part, which part of that story doesn't sound convincing? <laughs> Right. Lie, lie, lie. Right. Lie. 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 him. Tell us. It's a lie. It's not a lie. Yes. Can I just say to the makers of this program that how the hell, after making a joke about Ronald Reagan, I'm supposed to write that on the spot, am I? It was a great gag, though, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. what a brilliant killer that was. Ronald Reagan's got more <laughs> nuclear weapons than he lets on to. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here all weekend to join the chicken. <laughs> It is a lie. It was a lie. Uh, Lee did not get uh, a full body search at customs after mocking Ronald Reagan. He got it after requesting one when booking the tickets. Uh, next. <coughs> Shane. Um, female admirers used to send me timetables showing when their husbands would be out. Did you, did you ever pay them a visit? <laughs> um, funny enough, some of them, yes. And when was this? This was it when I was um, in the early 90s when I was doing a soap powder campaign. Uh, oh, the, the, the doorstep yes. challenge. The doorstep oh, the challenge. Doorstep yeah. challenge. Oh, yeah. And uh, what happened? I'd turn up at a, a hotel and the, the word would go around if I was in that particular town. Someone would slip a note on the door and it'd say, listen, just to let you know, uh, my husband won't be in at this particular time and I'd love to see you on your own. Yeah, so that's not Did... really a sort of sexual thing. You just want some free powder. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think, Richard? It's a lie, it's a lie, because I've read Rags to Richie about seven times, and that, that would have been a story in it, and I, that wasn't in the book. You've oh. not read the book! I have, seven times. Have you? Shut it's up. the only book I've read, that and The Hungry Caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And there are more holes in your book. <laughs> that's a good point. OK, yes. I would, we'll, we're going to say that's a true story. No, 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 we're not. It's that's all on lie. you, it's a, saying, it's a lie, it's a lie. They're saying it's a lie. OK, it's Shane. in fact true. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it's true. Uh, Shane did receive timetables from admirers telling him uh, when their husbands would be out. It worked like clockwork. 7.01, arrive at the house. 7.03, begin sex. 7.04, post-coital cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which nasty buzzing noise means at the end of the show, it's David's team who have proved themselves to be better people, having annihilated Lee's team 10-3. And we leave you with the results of a recent survey which shows that journalists are the profession that tells most lies. This teaches us two things. Firstly, not to believe everything you read in the paper. And secondly, that estate agents must have even lied on that survey. <laughs> Good night. Who's who? It's Lauren Laverne. He hasn't a clue. It's Graham Garden. And their team captain, Lee Mack. But first, repeatedly bash your manual extremities together for your host, Angus Deaton. Good evening and welcome to Would I Lie to You, the only show where you have to spot which of our panellists are cheats, fibbers and downright liars. Uh, one in five people tell lies in the workplace, though if you work at a call centre, that figure rises to near a five in five. <laughs> uh, Two-thirds of all CVs contain lies, most often about age. For example, Jerry Halliwell's CV states she was born in the 20th century. <laughs> And there is a machine that can distinguish between uh, truth and lies. It's called a wife. 
<laughs> Which brings us hurtling into round one, Home Truths, where our panellists read out statements from the cards in front of them. As yet, they don't know what's written on the card, a true fact or a whopper of a lie. Ideally, they need quick wits, a poker face, and in a perfect world, the ability to read. So, with that in mind, Phil, you're up first. In real life, my next-door neighbour is called Ian Beale. <laughs> ah. Your next-door neighbour's called Ian Beale? Yes. Right. Where do you live? In Gospel Oak. Right. Which is in North London. So it's North London. I live in North London. The Beals of North London. Yes. yes. There are four Beals. Yes? Yes. Who are the others? There's Mrs Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Bill and Ian Bill. <laughs> And is he as wonderfully interesting as the character Ian Beale? Well, he's quite good fun. I drink with him sometimes. He's a postman. And he's always in the pub by 12 o'clock in Gospel Oak, the Old Oak. I've been in the Old Oak. Uh, have you been in the Old Oak? Yeah, but I didn't buy a drink there. I left You him ran away, yes, didn't you? It's quite... Uh, I thought, they don't do goat's teeth tartlets here. <laughs> <laughs> no, they drink beer. That's what they do. <laughs> So, how did you find out about Ian Beale? Well, I met him in the pub. <laughs> right. And he said, oh, look, oh, hey, you're in EastEnders and I'm Ian Beale. Oh, right, but he never, he never bothered shouting over the fence this when he saw you in the garden. No, I didn't know he lived next door to me. Shane McGowan lived there before he did. So, this, this bloke followed the strict etiquette of shouting over the fence to people only if he moved in before them? No, no. <laughs> I'm not saying that, am I? I'm saying he told me in the pub. Does the person that live on the other side of Ian Beale, does he talk to him? Over the Ooh, fence? Sylvester McCoy. No. <laughs> <laughs> the real Sylvester McCoy or something? The real Sylvester McCoy. Lives next door but one? Yes. Do you know, suddenly, for the first time, I'm starting to believe him. Really? Well, anyone that was lying wouldn't make life harder by going, you I think... know, I'll stay. I live next door to the old Doctor Who as well. That'll help. <laughs> I can't oh. imagine a postman buying Shane McGowan's house, is all. I can't, go... I can't imagine that. Are we saying it's a lie? Yeah. I think it's a lie. I think it's a lie. I think that it's a lie as well. Okay, they're saying. That you're lying, Phil. Truth or untruth? Lie. Hey! It's a lie. <laughs> yep, it is a lie. Uh, Phil's next door neighbour is not called Ian Beale. EastEnders, if you remember, once brought Dirty Den back from the dead, and they've recently done the same thing with Bobby Davro. <laughs> uh, so, Graham, your turn to astound. I have five pigs, all named after my favourite newsreaders. <laughs> I wonder what the question's going to be here. At, 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 at this point, we have to ask you which five news so readers. We, can't we guess them? Can't we guess them? No, we can't. Yeah, yeah, please, can we guess them? <laughs> you've, like you've, like guess you've got absolutely Ryan no Hanrahan. idea. Ryan <laughs> you... Trevor McDonald. You... This is just... <laughs> this is suicide. Max are you, are you <laughs> working for them? Sorry. <laughs> this is the opportunity <laughs> where Graham has to rattle off five news readers no, and I you've know. just handed no, him four on a plate. No, 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 you idiot. No, you're right. <laughs> Shall we give him more time? All right. Would you like a pen and paper, Graham? Maybe we should all leave the room. <laughs> and they can work on an essay about it. <laughs> can I ask? Can I ask? No, you can't. Garden. Silence. <laughs> what are the name of the five newsreaders, please, Graham? What was the first one you said? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, right. he said Trevor McDonald, and that is one of the one of the pigs is called Trevor McDonald. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. One which you probably wouldn't have guessed is called Jackie Bird because she's a BBC Scotland oh. newsreader. All right. Do you live in Scotland? Uh, no, but it just looks like a Scottish pig. <laughs> <laughs> First one I had uh, was uh, called Robert Dougal. Do you remember him? <laughs> We're going way back. Quite, quite an old pig, then. <laughs> Angela, obviously. She was before your time, probably. Sad. Okay. And my uh, newest piglet is Natasha. Ah. After? After Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you keep these pigs? Well, they're my pigs. I don't actually have a, a piggery at home, but there's a farm nearby which, which keeps them in the yard, and I go and visit them, and they take care of most of the feeding and stuff, but I go and feed them sometimes. And what do you feed them? Scraps. That's, <laughs> that's the name of my uh, dog. Um... <laughs> <laughs> or at least it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you met any of the five newsreaders that you've named your pigs after? I've met Trevor McDonald and Angela Rippon. Have you, have you said to them, I have a pig named after you? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> do, do you think this is all adding up? Phil, what do you think? It's um, a lie. 
I think it's a lie. I think it's true, but obviously the majority rules. But I will yeah. never let it go if I'm proved right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's disarmingly honest. Um, so you've effectively well, think, got to make a decision. I think you, we're going to say it's a lie. OK, they're saying it's a lie, Graham. What's the truth? Shameful. It's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is a lie. Graham does not have five pigs uh, all named after his favourite newsreaders. Uh, many newsreaders end their broadcast with an amusing and finally story, as nothing takes the edge off the murder, starvation and war in the world like a monkey riding a horse. <laughs> and lastly, Michael, your turn in the confessional. Oh, I should say, now that I know the rules, I'm going to be all over this. <laughs> I recall that there are, like, tells, aren't there? People have tells, mm -hmm. like when you wink or flare your nostrils or look away, so I'm going to be doing all of them, just in case. <laughs> like when we had Harry Redknapp on the show, isn't it? <laughs> For two weeks, I drove a car that could only turn left. <laughs> when you say you drove for two weeks, you mean you, you couldn't stop? It just went on and on, <laughs> turning left? Uh, no. I wouldn't like to be the sat-nav in that car. Turn right. <laughs> turn right! <laughs> Will you turn right? <laughs> Why, why could it only turn left? It was hit. Uh, my yeah. wife had an accident in it, so you couldn't turn the wheel right. You had to only go left. Why right. couldn't you turn the wheel right? Because the, the, the metal of the car... Hey, hang on, it's Michael, Michael. Don't get so technical with me. <laughs> the metal of the car, yeah? Can you be more specific? What bit of the metal of the car? The metal bit. <laughs> um, it was the front bit over the wheel was bent into the wheel so you could no longer turn the right. wheel to the right. So at no point in the two weeks you were driving and there was only one way to go, which was a sharp right? Um, at one point, yes. You're at the corner of a road, sharp yes. right, you're at that yeah. corner, yes. you realise you can't turn right. Yes. Tell me what happens next. You go left, 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 left and you left. You can't, you're on a sharp bend to the right, there's no left. I wouldn't have been there because I pre-planned my journey. <laughs> it's very frustrating when you've got to be there and you realise the only way to get there is to go left, left, <laughs> left, left, and left again. That's why it must be very annoying to be a ballroom dancer. Because <laughs> you've just got to get there, and you've got to go round and round <laughs> and round. And it'd be quite simple just to go plunk. <laughs> Graham, what do you think? I think he's lying. <laughs> Lauren? I think uh, probably lying. We all think as a team that not only is it a lie, Ooh. it's a pretty bad lie. <laughs> In fact, a lie that you should be ashamed of and you should leave the show immediately. <laughs> it's just That's... over there on your right. You might have to go through there, through there, <laughs> through there. <laughs> well, how do you like I'm... this? It's true! Get over yourself! <laughs> <laughs> It is true. Uh, Michael did drive a car that could only turn left for a whole two weeks. Uh, it would have been less, but unfortunately the AA sent out a van that could only turn right. <laughs> uh, when it was eventually diagnosed, it turned out the problem was caused by the nut holding the steering wheel. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> and so, to Ring of Truth, uh, around on the surface quite simple, but in reality even easier. I read out some bizarre statements about celebrities and our teams take turns to decide whether those claims are truth or trash. Uh, David's team are first. Bono once paid British Airways $1,700 to have his favourite trilby flown first class to a oh. concert in Italy. Or did he? Well, I believe that it might cost $1,700 to fly first class on British Airways. Mm. So that I can believe. It was upgraded. What, why? Um, the hat was upgraded. <laughs> it, it was. It was upgraded to fly in the cockpit. That's not first class, the cockpit. No, it was upgraded from first class. To the cockpit. To the cockpit. You see, that's a. Ri I, you see, never buy a first class ticket. You might end up getting upgraded and having to fly the fucking plane. <laughs> <laughs> if he needed it as a prop, then you know it's it's justifiable. No, but it's not justifiable to send it first class. You could put it in the hold, or you can put it in economy. With the scummy hats. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so were they wearing it in the cockpit? I think it was sitting in the cockpit. Because that would freak me out if I was head. waiting for a flight and I looked out the window and there's some <laughs> captain with a trilby on. <laughs> 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 I couldn't be dealing with that. What do you think? You don't... I think yes. Rock and roll, you know. People do things like 
that, you know. I'm leaning on lie. You're leaning on lie, you're leaning true. Yes. I'm gonna go mm. lie. Okay, and I can tell you it is absolutely true. Oh! <laughs> yep, it is true. Bono did once pay $1,700 to have his favourite trilby flown first class to a concert in Italy. In a totally unrelated story, on the same day, British Airways staff set a new world record for wiping their asses on a hat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, every three seconds, Bono does something annoying. <laughs> Uh, Lee's team, you're up next. You may find this slightly strange. Well, I first started reading Bottoms about four years ago at a party. Um, it was a friend's birthday. And because I'm always saying, no, you can read anything. And the guy says, oh, well, read my bottom. And I did do. And uh, made some predictions and they came through. So that was how it started. Your boyfriend, is, is he having problems with his car at the moment? Yeah. Um, he's very enthusiastic about this car as well. It's his happy project, isn't it? His baby, if you like. Do you think I'm on the right career path? I feel your um, management are very impressed with what you've done so far. Cos you've clinched some tricky deals. <laughs> Michael, that wasn't your wife, was it, when she said... You, is your, having is your boyfriend with having car? problems with his car at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here is the uh, related fact, then, for Lee's team. Uh, Mick Hucknall uh, wears trousers called bun boosters, uh, which have a metal lining to add definition to his rear. <laughs> I don't want to be cruel to Mick, but if you've got a face like that, you're not going to worry about your arse, are you, really? <laughs> <laughs> See, I believe that women would have them, because women are quite open about... And proving themselves like that, but blokes are, tend to be a bit more no. coy. But you see, well, they are made for women, the, these jeans. So he's got the arse of a woman when he wears them. <laughs> the moment of truth in the bedroom, you know, assuming that this arse actually pulls somebody, you know, that's going to be a time when, even with the lights off, you know, they're going to be a terrible clang. When <laughs> <it> <laughs> what do we think? I, I can't imagine it. No. Uh, Graham? I think he did. Do you? Mm. Based on what? Just want to put you on the spot. <laughs> I think it's a lie. <laughs> You're saying it's a lie, OK, and I can tell you it is, in fact, a lie. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it is a lie. Mick Hacknell does not wear trousers called bun boosters to add definition to his rear. It must be strange to come from the Manchester music scene that spawned Sean Ryder and Bez and still be known as the ugly one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which means at the end of that round, it's uh, David's team who are sitting prettiest, ahead as they are, 3-2. Our next round is the curiously titled This Is My, in which Lee's team all claim to have a special relationship with our mystery guest. Only one of them is telling the truth, and it's David's team's job to go through the charade of carefully interrogating Lee's team before taking a wild stab in the dark. <laughs> so please welcome this week's special guest person, Roger. <laughs> uh, so, Graham, what is Roger to you? Uh, this is my friend Roger. I presented him with a prize at the Chipping Norton Giant Vegetable Competition. <laughs> uh, Lee, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Roger? This is Roger. Together we ring the bells at the local church. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Lauren, what's your relationship with Roger? Uh, the, obviously, yes, Roger. Hiya. All right. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing because uh, Roger actually removed a tattoo that I had of the Fonz. <laughs> so, there you have it. A vegetable-growing champion, if we believe Graham, a church-going bell ringer, according to Lee, or an expert Fonz tattoo removal surgeon, uh, if we believe Lauren. David's team, where R to begin? Right. Uh, Lee, what's the church? East Molesley Methodist Church. <laughs> what's a bell ringer called? Well, I'm called Lee. He's no, called no, Roger. What's the term? <laughs> we haven't all got the same name. <laughs> that would never work. What's the term for the practice of bell ringing? Campanology. Okay. What? Is that right? Yes. We're expecting that, were you, Mitchell? Yeah. <laughs> Can I just um, ask Roger if, I, if you could just turn around a little bit? I'm going to try to read your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Notice the way he can only turn to the left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a lot from your arse, but yeah. nothing to do with this round. Right. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to go back to the so uh, bell Method ringing. A Methodist church with, that, with a yeah. bell tower. Really? That's unusual, isn't it? <laughs> Are you a practising Methodist? No, or... no, no, I'm, a, I'm an expert. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> How many times have you rung the bells with Roger? How many times have you rung the bells with Roger? Probably about six times, but, but so I've done it about eight or nine times, ten times. What was it about two and a half months ago that said, I need a new hobby? I, I met Roger. I was at a, a, a neighbour's uh, party and uh, we got chatting. I had a few to drink. I started doing what most people do, uh, you know, which is slightly jokingly ribbing him about his hobby. And then he said, well, you should come down sometime and try it. So for a laugh, I did. And it was actually quite a good exercise. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this. David, would you like to interrogate any of the others? Right. Um, yes. Why did you get a tattoo of the Fonz? It was kind of like a sort of late 90s ironic statement. Uh, like, oh, yeah, that'll be funny. Let's go and do it. You know, we're all kind of at a party just being daft. And I was like, yeah, you know, brilliant. Yeah, I'm going to do it. And uh, went off and did it. And then obviously thought, I've got Henry Winkler on my thigh for life. How do you remove a tattoo? With a laser tattoo removal. Is it like I imagine? Is it, is there, is it a helmet and big <laughs> laser guns? What, what's, what, is it, what does it look like? No, no, I mean... Does he like... walk in and go... <laughs> <laughs> It's like, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the person who's doing it does wear, like, glasses, like, protective glasses, but not, like, a big welder's helmet or anything like that. And it's, uh, it's just <laughs> like a pulse. This, this laser technique for removing it, it's quite... Is this quite a sort of surgical, posh, advanced thing? Um, no, I mean, it's, an, it's not posh. I mean, you've got to pay for it, you know. Um, well, I that think doesn't mean... Got... Posh and free aren't oh synonyms. <laughs> Cambridge boy. Um... <laughs> All right, Sunderland girl. <laughs> Graham, can you tell us about the occasion that what was it, the chip, chipping Norton giant vegetable mm -hmm. contest? Yeah. What well, do you want to know about it? And what was Roger's um, well, vegetable? I, I mean, I, I, uh, Roger has won a prize several years running, uh, uh, but not always for the same category. Ah. So I know he did win the biggest cucumber one year, and he might have had the longest leak. <laughs> The year, so, so do you give the prizes every year? I give the prizes out, yeah. yeah. Um. How do you know, Graham, if what? someone brings a sprout and they say this is a really massive sprout, how do you know it's not just a cabbage? <laughs> <laughs> that has to be proof it's been uh, cut off a stalk with other sprouts on it. At the moment, I the think I'm, in, got the, to I'm in the ridiculous lovely. situation where the massive Chipping Norton massive vegetable contest, which initially sounded like the most made-up thing I'd ever heard, <laughs> is the most plausible of the three. Do you, do you live near Chipping Norton? Yes. Yeah. See, that's plausible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Phil, cool. do you have a... I would go Lauren. ...thought Lauren. at all? Lauren. Lauren. Phil has said Lauren, and you think Lauren, do you? I do. Uh, I'll change to Graham, then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lord, well, we need an answer. So, David's team is Roger, uh, Graham's ace vegetable champion, uh, Lee's bell ringing chum, or Lauren's tattoo oh, removal oh, specialist. Oh, I'm going to go with. Uh, I'm going to go with Graham. Well, perhaps Roger would like to reveal his own identity. Well, it's Graham. He presented me with two prizes last year's baseball. <laughs> So Roger has won the Chipping Norton uh, Giant Vegetable Competition. Uh, Roger's cucumbers are grown purely for size at the expense of all taste and texture and are available at all leading supermarkets. <laughs> Roger's longest leak was also up for a prize from the British Innuendo Society, as a result of which they gave him one. So, uh, <laughs> all that means at the end of that round, it's uh, Lee's team who are left licking their wounds behind as they are 4-2. Our final round is, was and always will be quickfire lies in which our panellists are selected rapidly and randomly uh, to lie against the clock, again from a card that they haven't seen before. Time for losers to catch up, for winners to extend their lead and for me to confuse matters further by throwing in occasional possessions uh, which panellists must instantly claim to own. Uh, Lee's team are behind, so need quite frankly to get their act together. Uh, starting <laughs> with <laughs> Lee. For six months I cleaned the windows of the Empire State Building. <laughs> Did you finish? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't finish it. Of course, as we all know, it never finishes. What? It's right. like the fourth road bridge. No, no, it's taller. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so when was this in your life? 19, about 1987. Right, and, and why were you in New York? I was just backpacking around America. And <laughs> you decided, I'll stick here well, for... Well, I wasn't backpacking around going like that and going... <laughs> I got 
the bag and went. Yeah, but why did you stay there for six months? If you're backpacking around, you well, might do I had a, job a good job for a few weeks. Well, because I ran out of money and then uh, I ended up staying in New York. How long would it take you to do a window? It would take roughly... Uh, it would take about an hour, something like that. No, hour per window, no way. I, I feel very much that this is true. Well, I feel very much that it's a lie. 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 They're saying it is a lie, Lee. It is, in fact, a lie. It <laughs> is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's a lie. Uh, Lee did not clean the windows of the Empire State Building for six months, although the hardest part of the job traditionally has been scraping the huge amounts of giant gorilla shit off the side of the building. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <coughs> David. <clears throat> when I was little, I used to dress myself as an 18th century nobleman. <laughs> yeah, he definitely did. <laughs> Look at him. Yes. Why? Yeah. Well, um, fun. <laughs> Can you describe oh, what the costume? Did you wear? Yeah. Well, well um, it, it wasn't perfect. Um, <laughs> I, it basically Surprises. involved tucking my trousers into my sort of knee-length socks <laughs> and uh, tying a true. bit of string <laughs> around <laughs> a small mac to make it more like a kind of a tail mac. coat. I'll be honest with you, I could have wandered into a costume drama and people would have gone, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do when you were dressed up? I had a sword. Ah, right. Um, did you have sword fights? Sort of with the air. <laughs> no shield? No, they didn't, no, it's not that. In the 18th century, no, that's all wrong. Shield? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Lauren? Yeah, totally, it's David, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Brilliant. I think it's true, yeah. I can just see him in his little mat. Lee? I don't know. It's too... too David. Too, too, too obvious, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm reluctant to say yes, but I will go with the team. David? I believe you are telling the truth. OK, David. Uh, well, it is, in fact, true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is true. Uh, David did dress as an 18th century nobleman when he was little. <laughs> The 18th century was a vibrant period, richly populated with impressive historical figures. Voltaire, Dr. Johnson, Russell Brand. <laughs> Next, <laughs> Lauren. <clears throat> I got my head stuck in railings three times in the same week. Recently? <laughs> or...? Uh, no, this is when I was very, very little, quite young. What were you trying to achieve um, through these railings? Well, nothing. I wasn't, like, trying to get to the other side. I'm not a fucking idiot, am I? Well, <laughs> how, long, how long was your head in there? Oh, I didn't, when you're a kid, time flies, doesn't it? It's no, just... quite the reverse. When you're a kid, <laughs> time feels a lot longer. A year when you're, like, True. three is a third of all the time you've known. Uh, well, then, <laughs> well, then, yeah, it yeah. felt like ages. Yeah. <laughs> Did you freak out and scream and cry, or were you sort of calm? I it. think I was, I was kind of, like, stupid enough to do it, but intelligent <laughs> enough to be embarrassed, so I didn't make too much of a fuss. I was just, oh, God. How old were you? Like a kid, like uh, six. <laughs> six. About five, five. Because I don't think I was intelligent enough to be embarrassed when I was five. When, five. Some, when I did something incredibly stupid <laughs> when I was five, I would just happily have cried and shouted and said, <laughs> get me out of this situation, <laughs> ow, ow, <laughs> rather, rather than going, oh, I've actually been rather a fool. <laughs> 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 All right, so, uh, David, what kind of decision are you veering well, towards I'm, at the moment? I, I suppose, well, it's definitely, it's eminently plausible. It is, so, isn't yeah. it? Shall we say true? Um, OK, um, we'll say true. Mm. Yeah. You're saying it's true, OK. Lauren, are you lying through your teeth? OK, it is... True! Yeah. 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 Yes, it is true. Uh, Lauren did get her head stuck in the railings three times in the same week. Still, it made a change from the traditional Sunderland pastimes of dog fighting, badger baiting, and marvelling at electricity. <laughs> uh, next, <coughs> Phil. Possession. Oh, oh, right. You need to look inside your box. Tell us what it contains. <coughs> These are the slippers Sting sent me for my last birthday. <gasps> wow. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Not that cruel, cool, to be honest. <laughs> Believed you up to that moment. <laughs> right. Why did you buy your slippers? Because it, in Quadrophenia I had a scene where I wore some uh, slippers similar to that and... Um, no, you didn't. I know that. Oh, though. yes, I did. What, what scene? In the bedroom. <laughs> you don't say. When he was looking at 
the wall of pictures of girls on the wall and he had a pair of slippers on. Mm. Yeah, I remember the scene you're talking about and you could be right, but I'm like, oh, kicking myself. Sting was in Quadrophenia, wasn't he? Yeah. It? Yeah, and I did this thing. I went to a signing. Right. And we started chatting about the old times and things happened and he's, I got them as a bit of a joke. He must know you pretty well to give you slippers that match your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, eh? What do you call him? Do you call him Gordon or Sting? Sting, you don't call him Gordon. No, you don't. 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 don't call him Gordon, it's no. his name. He won't... <laughs> <laughs> he's decided that names aren't good enough for the likes of him. He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna take a verb. <laughs> <laughs> that means everyone thinks he's good and no one thinks he's a twat. <laughs> Could you do me a favour? Could you just put one of your feet up on the desk next to the slipper and we'll check the size? Oh, yeah. Done oh. oh! They're exactly the right size. It's got to be true, hasn't it? Very... All right, let's go for true. Yeah, true. They're saying it's true. Put us out of our misery. How would he know my size? It's a lie. Oh. <laughs> Good work. That was very well told. Yes, it is a lie. Uh, Sting did not send uh, Phil some slippers for his birthday. Sting doesn't give out birthday presents as his music is a gift. So let's hope he's kept the receipt. <laughs> uh, which uh, nasty buzzing noise means that it's the end of tonight's show and I have to tell you that uh, David's team are this week's masters of their own domain, having spanked Lee's team 9-3. <laughs> <laughs> So, hurrah to our winners, uh, Yabu sucks to our losers, and I leave you with news that according to scientific research, a common indicator that someone's lying is if they start sweating. Uh, it's also an indicator that someone's got the heating up too high, they're grossly overweight, or they're living in a carry-on film and an attractive young lady's just bent over. <laughs> On the best of what I like to you, Debina McCall, Jimmy Carr, Gabby Logan, Richard Wilson, Ben Shepard, Robert Webb, Frankie Boyle, Graham Garden, Lauren Levin, Jason Manford, Russell Howard, and their team captain, Lee Mack. And facing them tonight, Rob Brydon, Michael Aspro, David Medeal, Dara O'Brien, Trisha Gunner, Phil Daniels, Rich Hall, Christian Gorumathy, Danny Baker, Maureen Lippman, Michael McIntyre, and their team captain, David Mitchell. But first, behave like irritating neighbours and make lots of noise for your host, Angus Deaton! Good evening and welcome to this hastily cobbled together, this specially compiled bonus edition of Would I Lie to You? Yes, 30 minutes of largely unbroadcast material deemed too funny to show you the first time round. <laughs> if you have a red button on your handset, it will be of absolutely no use to you for the next half hour. Uh, this is a quiz about lying. Uh, lying by omission is when you knowingly leave some information out, like when the estate agent shows you round in the two minute gap that the Eurostar isn't going through the kitchen. <laughs> and scientists have developed a truth serum that makes people incapable of lying. It's called Six Pints of Lager. <laughs> and so to round one, in which our contestants are given one simple yet frequently insurmountable task, to read a statement from the card in front of them. They never know what's on the card, a true fact or something we made up earlier. Uh, this can lead to panic, nausea and occasional vomiting. Uh, people who expect high-quality fibbing should look away now. Um, 
I was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales. <laughs> Who was the 48th? I think was John Humphreys, the uh, <laughs> guy who reads. Who made this part? Who was Wales it, uh... has its own newspaper called The Western Mail. Have we asked him which year this was? Oh, yeah, which year was it? It was, <laughs> it was clearly not in the last ten. It was about... <laughs> Listen to you, George Clooney. Um, <laughs> I could take that coming from Robert, who has a certain earthy charm. Right, thank but you. But from a rejected chuckle brother, it's a bit rich. <laughs> so, are you team captain, what are you saying? OK, we think that's a lie. Yeah. OK, they're saying it's a lie. It's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> Yep, it's true. Rob was voted the 47th sexiest man in Wales and would have finished even higher if he hadn't got cramp in his dialing finger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next, <coughs> Robert. I was voted the 88th sexiest man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> By who? Yeah. By it was the readers of some women's magazine. Which Blind one? and wretched. You would know. <laughs> Where did David finish? I'm not so very not, sure David not, was not, on that Not listed, list. unfortunately. <laughs> Generally, Robert is considered the, 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 the better-looking one of your uh, outfit. But if it were me, I... Can I say this? I think that you are easier on the eye than him. <laughs> I think there's something very pleasing. And I, you may notice I've been looking at you a lot. <laughs> I just think he looks lovely. A bit weird about this, <laughs> but you know, thanks. Well, anyway, if we could drag you back yeah, to um, uh, um, the poll, I think it's. I, I think I think it's true. Robert, the answer. It is true. Yay! It is true. <laughs> um, I had an interview at MI5 to be a spy. Where's MI5, Jimmy? Where's MI5? Yeah. Well, it was, it's on the South Bank now, but that building wasn't finished at the time. So it was a, a meeting in Millbank. What was it? Like a planning meeting to join MI5? <laughs> like a planning? No, I wasn't going to be... I wasn't <laughs> like going to build like, a new the headquarters. The the building wasn't finished. We're thinking of setting up a big organisation <laughs> of spies. Well, you know... <laughs> Lots of guns and handcuffs <laughs> and itching powder. We don't know how we're going to use that, but it's all fun. And we're building a huge, crazy building on the South Bank, which is actually MI6, but never mind. <laughs> Can I say I'm worried now that you know a bit much about it, and you really do seem like a spy, I no, think, because no, you're, yeah. you're posh and a tiny bit gay, even though you're not. <laughs> Well, hang on, David. Oh, I'll stop you there. A Posh and a little bit gay. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? This is like Spartacus. No, I'm posh and a little bit gay. <laughs> You're um, the least posh and a little bit gay of anyone in the world, ever, Liz. Yeah. Fuck off, you pup. Uh, <laughs> like yeah. Yes, right. The thing is, Jimmy, if I'm right about you, you were, a, you were a virgin until you were about 27, as far as I remember. 26. 26. And that was the last series of this show. So, Shall we not bring it up again? <laughs> the thing. This was your opportunity to pull. Would you have been sent abroad? Well, don't you start. I'm having enough trouble with them. <laughs> Why are you... You're not even That's in this. Show. What are you talking about? <laughs> Jimmy, your, your, your attitude under interrogation is just a bit churlish, which, as a spy, it really shouldn't be, you know. <laughs> the other interrogator starts asking questions and you go, are you in this? <laughs> <laughs> was this during the Cold War? Yeah, I'm 50. <laughs> You might be. Your hair's dyed. So... <laughs> Fashion tips from the tramp. <laughs> now, now, girls. Um, was there a practical side to the interview? Did you have to...? Yeah, I had to fuck a girl in a speedboat. <laughs> <laughs> David Mitchell, uh, what are you thinking as team captain? I think <clears> it's not true. <throat> okay, we'll go with that. That's a lie. Okay, they're saying it's a lie. Jimmy, it's a lie. <laughs> Can I just say, that, you've made that really hard for yourself. It says I once had an interview at MFI. <laughs> <laughs> I have been wearing bronzing powder 
since the age of 12. <laughs> How old are you? 31. 31, no way, yeah. bronzing powder what, wasn't around. What exactly is bronzing powder? Is that the same yeah. as... You mean to make you look suntanned? Suntanned, like this. <laughs> Why do you wear it? Well, you put it on and people go, well, you look, um, well. <laughs> and then, you know, and I noticed that they were saying that. So I thought, well, look, can I ask you a question? Why are we seven in makeup? Well, to, to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, you're in makeup because you want to look good on TV, and I just want to take that into, the, into you know, outside of television. You want to look TV smooth 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, these things must come in specific colours and stuff. What option have you chosen? Deep bronze. <laughs> Heavenly mahogany stuff. I don't know the actual bloody <laughs> name of the colour. Gray, what do you think? Well, if that's deep mahogany bronze, he's been robbed. No, it's <laughs> a lie. It's a lie. Big lie. Big lie. They're saying it's a lie, so, Michael, fact or fable? It is indeed... <laughs> true! <laughs> in the street, they try and change channel. Look at this guy! <laughs> he looks TV good! I saw... <laughs> I mean, I'm very glad... I'm very Don't. glad you're yes. so pleased for the team, but I think in a, in a minute... <laughs> in a minute, you're gonna have to face no. the wider truth of what people now know No, I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Michael has been wearing bronzing powder since the age of 12. Uh, the good thing about bronzing powder is that people can't see that you're embarrassed, no matter how many times they point and shout, there's a grown man wearing bronzing powder. <laughs> and so to Lee's team, who have this rather eerie premonition of impending disaster, for those who are aware of how Rod Hull sadly met his end. Yeah, I've locked up the canteen. Everything's nice and tight. Lock! Well, it never worked anyway, did it? Here, yeah. look, look. It's that underground. It... It's loosened the aerial. Oh, You'll that... have to go on the roof and fix it. No, I'm not going to go. Leave it, come on. You can't leave it. The viewers will have no programme. I wonder what's wrong with it. Oh, it's that bit up there. Has <laughs> that got it? Yes, that's all right. <laughs> Yes, that was uh, Rod and Emu on the programme EBC, and as uh, you'll no doubt be aware, tragedy struck shortly afterwards when Rod was given a second series. <laughs> <laughs> and some uh, 19 years later, of course, Rod Hull did uh, sadly die when fixing an aerial on his roof. Uh, so here's the intriguing Rod and Emu fact. Rod Hull was buried along with his fake arm and the very first Emu. Or was he? Lee? Does, does everybody know that he had a fake arm? Well, he didn't have two. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a real emu. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't really have a neighbour that was a fat green witch, <laughs> either. <laughs> I thought you meant that he had one of his arms wasn't real. How the... <laughs> How did he have to be an emu? I think it would be an odd choice of career for a one-armed man <laughs> to become a ventriloquist. <laughs> uh, so, what are you thinking? Is this truth or tosh? I think it's a lie. Robert, you I think it's a lie. I think that that is, is a lie as well. I'll say lie. Okay, it is in fact a big fat lie. Three. Yes. <laughs> yes, Rod Hull uh, was not buried along with his fake armour and the very first emu. Uh, Rod's not the only performer to have made a living by dragging an erratic and embarrassing old bird around. Richard Maidley is doing very nicely as well. <laughs> so, uh, to David's team, who have this to savour. Please present the meat on trays. Don't tell. Don't tell. Melissa, I don't know what you're trying to do whether you're trying to upset our guests, but right now, I'm starting to get pissed. Now, you send your food. Let's go. Right, dome's off. <laughs> Jen, yes, describe the dish. That's a duck breast. <laughs> you four hell's bitches. I am embarrassed. I don't think I've ever, ever been so embarrassed inside this restaurant in my entire life. Get out my sight. <laughs> so I 
angry in that he's forgotten the word of. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's essentially the way he's been obviously willing to Americanize for the money. So he's actually accidentally said that he's a, a yes. going to get drunk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, and he said, bring the meat. I, I think he was trying to say the meat entrees because that's entrees what the Americans yeah. moronically oh, yes. refer to a main course as. <laughs> but it just sounds like bring on the meat entrees. <laughs> Meat, what meat yeah. on trays? That is the meat. Yeah, a big tray of meat, nine ninety nine. Yeah. And clearly, the thing that he's good at is saying fuck. And they've told him he's not allowed to say it. And he just, all he can say is, I'm embarrassed. Yeah, exactly. uh, Gordon Ramsay, anyway, less than happy about the duck. Of course, normally in Gordon's kitchen, if they shout out duck, it's because he's just thrown a meat cleaver at someone's head. <laughs> Please welcome tonight's special guest person, Gareth. So, uh, Tricia, what's Gareth to you? Um, this is Gareth, and he came on my show to um, cure his fear of... <laughs> <laughs> um, scotch eggs. Yeah, right. <laughs> OK. Rich, perhaps you'd like to explain how you know Gareth. Uh, this is Gareth, and he... He pimped my ride and uh, turned my car into the ultimate fishing mobile. <laughs> and finally, David, what's your relationship with Gareth? Uh, this is Gareth, and he freed me from a roller coaster when the car got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please let that one be true. <laughs> please. So, there you are. Uh, Trisha's phobic guest, a uh, car pimper, according to Rich, or a theme park rescuer, if we believe David. Uh, Lee's team, where do you want to start? Oh, definitely Trisha. <laughs> I've seen your show. He, they, you don't have people that have come on because of the skirt. You might have come on because he had sex with a scotcher. <laughs> <laughs> Scared of a scotcher. He had a bad experience. How does the scotcher? fear manifest itself? He used to sort of, um... Get panicky and scared when he saw Scotch eggs. Surely it's really easy to avoid Scotch eggs. <laughs> I mean, well, there's a tiny section of the supermarket <laughs> that you could easily walk round. Oh, I need to get some Baileys for Christmas. Oh, an egg! <laughs> <laughs> what, if he, what if he loves pork pies? Yeah. Uh, name a supermarket where the pork pies aren't right next to the <laughs> Scotch eggs. <laughs> And what was your show called, that particular one? It was called, um, Fiancé, Your Fear of Scotch Eggs Will Ruin My Our Wedding Buffet. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, well, at least, yeah. That's insensitive. Now, that again, to, to deliberately order the pyramid of Scotch <laughs> eggs, no. But your future no, husband's because... terrified of them. If I could uh, steer you towards one of the other. Oh, yes. <laughs> what about the uh, roller coaster? Which roller coaster? David, was it? Well, it was the runaway mine train. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was that a historical train by which mines were accessed had run away with itself. <laughs> and that would be scary. Where was it? It was Alton <laughs> Towers. Alton Towers? <laughs> and so how did you get stuck? Well, the, the, the train ceased to run away. It... <laughs> But it goes through lots of tunnels, and in one of the tunnels, it suddenly stopped in the dark. Right. right. And they said over the... Uh, there was a speaker, and they said, uh, stay where you are, we'll be sending someone. And it was Gareth. I'm honestly struggling with the idea that you went for a day out to Alton Towers. <laughs> were, you, were you presenting a documentary for BBC Four about the horror of modern life? <laughs> Well, Dave, David's not been on a ride and got stuck, has he? No, David's never been on a ride. <laughs> I have. I was on a stag do. <laughs> That's where people like me have to do things that they wouldn't otherwise remotely want to do. <laughs> what about Rich's carpenter? Rich, uh, your car was turned right. into a fishing mobile. What, was, what is the car? What was it? What mate? It's not a car, actually. It's a small pickup truck. So how did it turn into a fishing mobile? Well, basically, there's just two big all-weather bucket seats in the back that you can sit on and fish without and swivel. It's got a rack for uh, fishing rods, and the glove box folds out, and you can tie flies on the glove box. No, it sounds like he's doing drive-by fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Have to get out of your truck. So he's not done much pimping, has he? All he's done is talk about a pickup truck, stuck some fishing rods in, and a bucket. Okay. <laughs> not pimp my ride, it's stick a bucket in my car, is what it should be called. <laughs> Am I right in saying that the phrase pimp my ride means modify my car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Why>? <laughs>
you can either go for the Scotch Egg Fairing guest on Trisha's show, Rich's uh, personal car customizer, or David's roller coaster savior. Well, look, right. Trisha's thing is just madness. Right? <laughs> if David had to go on a stag party, he'd insist that it all got changed and they went to Venice. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing that makes me think David might be telling the truth is that. Gareth fella, though, has got the look in his eyes of a man who has, at some point in his life, spinned a waltzer and tried to chat up a 14-year-old girl. At the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think he can be Scotch Egg Boy, cos he wouldn't want to come on national television again to reveal he was scared of Scotch Egg. <laughs> so, Lee, please, a decision. I've, I don't know why, but I think it's Trisha's telling the truth. No. I do, honestly. No. Wow. I'm going to go for Trisha. Lee is saying it's Trisha. Gareth, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to reveal who you really are. I went on Trisha to kill my fear of Scotch eggs. <laughs> I got picked on at school because my mum was the dancer in the titles of Tales of the Unexpected. We can remind ourselves of what uh, Russell's mother looked like. <laughs> So your mother was a professional dancer or an actress and... Uh... She was a professional dancer, yeah. What uh, were the other highlights of your mother's dancing career? Um, we never really went into it. So you never... <laughs> Curious like, well, you, You're not going to go age like, Mum, have you done uh, any other dancing yeah, I'd... Uh... <laughs> have you, to be fair, you might have spoken to your mother since the age of eight and discussed her <laughs> career then. Yes. But, I, but I, it's something we don't really... Do. We, you I don't, don't talk about your mother's embarrassing dancing past? Not really, no. You have never asked or bothered to find out what else she did in her career as a dancer? Well, it's clearly a I'm fucking not, lie, not... isn't it? But I've been... <laughs> <laughs> do I get extra points for capitulation? <laughs> I was buying it until, you know, we brought on yeah, board yeah. the world's toughest lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, you know that every job your parents have had... Nobody knows well, what their dad much. does. What are you talking about? What? Nobody knows yeah. what their dad does. <laughs> <laughs> I was basically totally willing to believe the whole Tales of the Unexpected thing. It was just the refusal to, to <laughs> countenance having discussed your mother's dancing career beyond that. It <laughs> seems so implausible. Because, as we now know, nobody knows what their father oh, does. <laughs> Like, you know, in the, you have a vague idea of what your dad does, but you don't know the nitty-gritty. Well, like, go for all your dad's jobs, then, as you know, every one of them. Well... OK, well, he had, didn't have many. He lectured in hotel and restaurant management from 1976 to about a year ago when he retired. You know what? Before <laughs> that... He had one job! <laughs> but the fact is, before that, his dad was the dancer... <laughs> ..of the only <laughs> ..of Tales of the Unexpected. <laughs> right. These are the wig and glasses I wear if I want to pop to the shops unnoticed. <laughs> right. Yeah. Would you, pop, would you pop mind it on, um, it on there. slipping it on. into it? <laughs> Is that the right way round? No, it's the right way round. And, and the glasses? It's Davina. Uh, <laughs> good grief. I know we have to, like, make a guess, but I'm, I'm, I'm really liking that look, by the way. Yeah, I, think, yeah, it's, it's actually, I like it very much. That's... Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Michael. I would... I would... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Girl. But me, my opinion is worth nothing to you. <laughs> but ask them. You look like Ken Barlow's ultimate fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, what are you thinking? I think we're going to go for a lie, then. Lie. lie. Yeah, I think it's They're a all lie. going for a lie, yeah. suddenly. Davina? Tell us whether it's the truth or a lie. It is a lie. <laughs> it is a lie. <clears throat> but can I keep these? Yes. <laughs> this is the coconut that nearly killed me. <laughs> is this believable? Um, where, where were you? Under a coconut tree, what do you think? <laughs> Stood underneath the coconut tree uh, and, well, oh, yeah. the oh. coconut fell off the tree, barely missing me. And you brought it home? Yeah. I'm suspicious because you're not allowed to bring fruit and vegetables from foreign countries into... Well, you've made the classic mistake, haven't you, Tricia? Because a coconut isn't a fruit or a vegetable. <laughs> it is, in fact, a seed.
<laughs> it almost hit you. It almost hit, yeah. It, like, went whoosh, past my face, um, why hit my did, shoulder, bounced off. On yeah, the why did you decide to keep it? Yeah, <clears throat> because I thought it'd make a nice anecdote. Clearly, I was wrong. <laughs> At the moment of shoulder pain, the yes. moment when your shoulder has been yeah. bruised, possibly shattered by the coconut, yes. you think, I must keep that for anecdotal reasons. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to be rude, but this is a coconut. It fell off a tree, hit me on the shoulder, but obviously if it had hit me on the head in the right place, I might have died. It's not as interesting a story as perhaps you think. I might actually elicit the response, if only it had. <laughs> <laughs> I will throw this coconut at your head now, right? And I will, no, no, hang on, I will. No, I will, I will, no. David. I will throw this coconut at your head and hit you on the shoulder really hard. No, and thanks. I guarantee it's yes, quite a chest they, and they... Don't see... push me, David! <laughs> Do not push me! <laughs> no one is insured for that to happen. <laughs> We think it's a lie. Truth or lie? It is, in fact, a lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there we go. I have received fan mail from Angus Deaton. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not actually allowed to take part in this question, unfortunately, because obviously I would be... Uh... When was it? Well, I'm, I've only recently become aware of this, uh, this fact, so I can't tell you exactly when. And how old was Angus when he wrote it to you? Well, anything between sort of seven and six. Oh, I okay. So this 60. is from when. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty-one. <laughs> but thank you. Did this person, whoever it was, tell you roughly what the letter said and what it was in connection with? Yes, it was a capital radio show. A friend of mine was uh, was <laughs> in the Susie Quattro fan club. Right, and got a letter about three years ago. They used to get a newsletter every every month with what Susie Quattro was mm. up to. And he got a newsletter through the post and it said, uh, Dear uh, member, I'm afraid this will be the last newsletter going uh, because there's only me and you left. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> <laughs> lots, of, lots of love, Susie. <laughs> There's I something about Angus which he would be interested be in. The mentor, yeah, I think he's a presenter true. and he's looking for tips. And, look at yeah, his I, face. Look at his look little at tiny face. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true. Michael, did I or didn't I? Believe it or not, it's true. <laughs> that is actually the only fan letter I've ever oh. written. Uh, is, you've only written one fan letter. Yes, the first who was it and only fan letter I, I've written was to Elizabeth Taylor when I was 14. <gasps> Satan, she was the same age. Took a year for a response to come back. But, and then I licked the photograph <laughs> signature and it didn't run. <laughs> but when I met her eventually, she came on the chat show. She, you licked her and she did run. She, <laughs> well, <laughs> For two weeks, I drove a car that could only turn left. <laughs> when you say you drove for two weeks, you mean you, you couldn't stop? It just went on and on, <laughs> turning left? Uh, no. Why, um, why could it only turn left? It was hit. Uh, my yeah. wife had an accident in it, so you couldn't turn the wheel right. You had to only go left. Why right. couldn't you turn the wheel right? Because the, the, the metal of the car... Hey, hang on, it's Michael, Michael. Don't get so technical with me. <laughs> the metal of the car, yeah? Can you be more specific? What bit of the metal of the car? The metal bit. <laughs> so at no point in the two weeks you were driving and there was only one way to go, which was a sharp right. I wouldn't have been there because I've pre-planned my journey. <laughs> it's very frustrating when you've got to be there and you realise the only way to get there is to go Left, left, <laughs> left, left, and left again. We all think as a team that not only is it a lie, Ooh. it's a pretty bad lie, <laughs> but a lie that you should be ashamed of and you should leave the show immediately. <laughs> it's just over there on your right. You might have to go through there, through there, through there. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm really upset! I told you that! Well, how do you like this? It's true! Get over yourself! <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> no way in the 
that world you've had a car for two weeks that can't turn right? Listen. Do I look like a simpleton? Don't okay. answer that. <laughs> you cannot drive a car. You've been going around the one-way system forever, you lunatic. <laughs> you've, so, got, you've got to understand the very truths they pick are the unlikely ones. <laughs> right, it's my go. I used to live on the moon. <laughs> Do you but consider true. that to be equally unlikely? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, you're an idiot. No. Because no one have... has ever lived on the moon. No one has ever lived on the have been damaged. It's so He's good, lying. they put it on television. I don't believe it. <laughs> there we are. It is true, uh, Michael did drive a car that could only turn left for a whole two weeks. Uh, it would have been less, but unfortunately the AA sent out a van that could only turn right. <laughs> When it was eventually diagnosed, it turned out the problem was caused by the nut holding the steering wheel. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> Which infuriating buzzing means at the end of tonight's programme, a glance at the scores reveals that there is no scoring, as this is a compilation show. <laughs> so instead, I'll leave you with the results of a recent study that all of us lie at least twice a day, although the frequency apparently increases if you're a man on a speed date who's just noticed he's still wearing his wedding ring. Good night. <laughs>